choices in sentencing. It is difficult, if not impossible, for each of us to put ourselves in your place when you are facing all the totality of facts concerning a certain defendant, then looking at your requirements under the law as enacted by Congress and trying to do the right thing to keep America safe but to meet justice. You are in the same place as 80 percent of federal judges when it comes to sentencing <clears throat> on child pornography cases, 80 percent. And of course, Congress is not without fault. We have failed to pick up the responsibility that was assigned to us some 17 years ago when the Supreme Court decided that the uh, basic guidelines would not be mandatory on judges. We should have stepped in at that point. But it's a tough, hard, controversial subject, and we've stayed away from it. And what has happened is the judges have tried to make do with a fractured situation where they have guidelines that are advisory, they have opinions coming to them about sentencing from the government, as well as uh, from probation office and others. So I would say that the bottom line is this. Uh, you have done what 80% of the judges have done. You're in the mainstream of sentencing when it comes to child pornography cases. I also think it's ironic that the senator from Missouri, who unleashed this uh, discredited attack, refuses to acknowledge that his own choice for federal judge in the Eastern District of Missouri has done exactly what you did. You also have been criti criticized as having been wrong to be a public defender or even to be in a law firm representing a Guantanamo detainee. It's interesting that Republican judges, very conservative ones, don't see this as a blemish on your character. They understand, as we do, that the Sixth Amendment creates a responsibility that the people have a right to counsel. You have exercised that responsibility in your professional life. This, incidentally, yesterday, turned, your nomination turned out to be a testing ground for conspiracy theories and culture war theories. Uh, the more bizarre the charges against you and your family, the more I understand the social media scoreboard lit up yesterday. Uh, I'm sorry that we have to go through this. These are not theories that are in the mainstream of America, but they have been presented here as such. Finally, you are a respected, successful woman of color. You've been approved three times by this committee for increasingly significant judicial assignments. Now the President of the United States has chosen you to serve on the highest court of the land. America is ready for this Supreme Court glass ceiling to finally shatter. And you, Judge Catania Brown Jackson, are the person to do it. Senator Grasso. Mr. Chairman? Yes. Mr. Chairman, um, I think you've, um, in the main, provided both sides an opportunity to be heard and ask their questions. But unfortunately, I noticed that after every series of questioning on this side of the aisle, you choose to editorialize and contradict the points being made by this side of the aisle. I don't know whether we will have an equal an opportunity to editorialize about the advocacy uh, that you and your colleagues, the points that you're trying to make. I especially was um, concerned that after my questioning yesterday, I left the hearing room and you chose to come back after a break and raise with the judge a point that I had asked her about, and um, which I frankly think was misrepresenting uh, my position and what the facts are with regard to whether the judge has accused President George W. Bush and Donald Rumsfeld of, of war crimes. Uh, my, my language was, I asked her whether she would called them a war criminal, and she said under oath to you, no, I did not, although the record is plain as it can be that she accused them of war crimes. Now, I don't understand the difference between calling somebody a war criminal and accusing them of war crimes, maybe in some um, some other uh, foreign language that I don't frankly understand, maybe that would make sense, but not in accordance with a common understanding of the English language. So I just don't, I, I just want to lodge a protest and say that I don't think it's appropriate for the chairman after every time somebody on this side of the aisle asks questions of the judge, you come back and you denigrate and you attack and you criticize the line of questioning. I think the judge is doing a pretty good job of defending her own position and answering questions. So 
Um, thank you for giving me a chance to express my objection to uh, the way that you've been uh, editorializing after each time this side of the aisle ask questions. Thanks, Senator Mr. Cor Chairman. Th excuse Mr. me. Chairman. Excuse me. Thanks, Senator Cornyn. Could it's known could, as could, Chairman's could time. I, could I make my statement first? You want to make your statement? Yeah. Well, I, can, may I respond to what Senator Cornyn said? Well, uh, you, if you want to speak before you're a may I? member. Thank you. Totally, you're right. Uh, m m Mr. Chairman, I, I, I agree with Senator Cornyn. You and I have talked about this before. Um, I have great respect for you. You know that. But I've had the same issue in normal hearings, non-Supreme Court hearings, where you make editorial comments after I question. I appreciate your input, but they're not offered in an even-handed way. And I just don't think it's productive. I mean, you just referred by name to uh, Senator Hawley. Um, I think he should have a chance to respond. You know, this is America. We have the right to express ourselves. Um, you know, you're not free if you can't say what you think. And, and I just, I, I want to join my colleague, Senator Cornyn. I just don't think it's appropriate, Mr. Chairman. It's called chairman's time. It is a tradition in this committee exercised by Senator Lindsey Graham as chairman and Senator Grassley in previous Supreme but, Court. But they didn't do it the way you do it. I'm going to allow you to be heard, but I want to be heard in, of course. without interruption. Of course. And so in the minority, we waited through chairman's time when we had Republican chairs. There will not be a separate set of rules for Democrats in control of this committee. Uh, that was used as a response time and again by the, both of those senators, and it was accepted. Uh, if what I said uh, was somehow problematic or painful yesterday, I'm sorry, but the Democrats are going to use the same mechanisms that the Republicans have used in this committee. And, and, I, and I appreciate that, Mr. Chairman. But I think if you're going to personalize it as to as to senators by name, you ought to give them a chance to respond. Well, they will have a chance. Mr. Mr. Senator, Chairman? Each and every senator has 20 minutes today to respond if they wish. Mr. Chairman? Who's seeking Senator Ross? Could, could we hear from Ranking Member Grassley, and then I'd like the opportunity to ask questions on behalf of the state of Georgia. I think the American public is now tuning into these proceedings expecting a, a substantive discussion of matters of grave importance to the country with a nominee for the Supreme Court before us. I don't think we've set an appropriate tone by bickering over time and process at the outset of our proceedings. Every senator deserves to be heard. I would like to humbly request that Ranking Member Grassley make a statement that I and Senator Tillis have our opportunity to question the nominee and that then we can litigate uh, balls and strikes from yesterday's hearing. That Senator also, my uh, statement doesn't quite fit in with what you asked, but I, I feel like I have to say it anyway because of the conflict that happened late last night. But before I do, I want to somewhat tongue-in-cheek, but with some seriousness as well, when the chairman quoted Biden as saying that Justice Jackson, or Judge Jackson handled herself with grace and dignity, I want to compliment the Democrats on this committee for using grace and dignity, unlike uh, it was during the Kavanaugh hearings. Thank you all very much for making this. I've heard a lot of compliments about how this is a way a hearing ought to be held. So I want to address that issue that was raised yesterday about records. Senator Cruz raised a very legitimate question about data related to U.S. probation officer uh, recommendations. Uh, the White House and members of this committee use that information to attempt to discredit information raised by Senator Hawley and others about the nominee's sentencing record as a district judge. No one on our side of the aisle had access to this information. In fact, before this past week, I'm not sure anyone but the probation office and the court had access to this information. My understanding is that the probation office recommendations aren't part of any public record. The specific sentencing recommendations aren't always shared with prosecutors or defendants. Somehow it appears that the White House obtained this information. It was leaked in pieces to media outlets in order to cast doubt on legitimate members' questions, and then it was provided to only Democratic members of this committee without any of the underlying documentation. 
I'd like to add my name to the letters that are requesting at least, uh, well, this is Senator Lee's letter, request uh, for at least the probation office recommendations so that we can be sure of the data handed out by Democratic staff last night. I'd also like to add my name and have added my name to Senator Cruz's follow-up request for access to any other data that might be shared with our colleagues on the other side. One last thing to suggest that all that we have to do is ask for information uh, doesn't pass muster. You can't ask for information you don't know if it exists. I've asked for non-public records related to the judge's tenure on the Sentencing Commission. Uh, those have not been produced, just like 48,000 pages of records withheld by the White House. How is the United States Senate supposed to review a record that we don't have? This, price, this process might be timely, but it's neither thorough nor fair to the American public, and I hope we can rectify that. I yield. Thank you, Senator Grassley. Senator Ossoff. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Grassley, and Judge, good morning. Good morning, Senator. Welcome back. Thank you. We had a late night doing our job as senators and you as a nominee, and we're off to a morning start. I was considering asking you if you were a coffee or a tea drinker, but I thought that might be too personal <laughs> and immaterial to the question of your nomination. I, uh, I want to begin inspired by the presence of my brother, Senator Reverend Warnock, who's joined us this morning, in a spirit of national unity offering thanks for these proceedings, for our Constitution, for this opportunity to air in public before the American people a vital grappling with ideas core to our republic, questions of the role of branches of government, questions of the proper role of judges in our society, questions that keep the peace and, and ensure that this remains a nation of laws. As I noted in my opening statement a couple of days ago, democracy is the exception and not the norm in history or around the world. And this public exercise is a vital one. And so I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful that the American people have the opportunity to observe it. And I'm thankful for your presence, Judge, for your service to the country throughout your life, as a district judge, as an appellate judge, as a member of the U.S. Sentencing Commission, as a nominee for the court. So thank you for being here. Thank you for subjecting yourself and your family to uh, an intrusive, at times cruel and unfair, but on the whole necessary and proper process of scrutiny as you are considered for this appointment. The American people who are now tuning in for the second day of these proceedings are hearing about your approach to the law, to your role as a judge and as a potential Supreme Court justice, and they're also getting to know you personally. And we've had the opportunity to hear a bit about your family, your background. I think it's also appropriate that the American public hear a bit more about your brother's story. As I understand it, served the Baltimore Police Department, served in the U.S. Army. Before we turn to matters of law, will you please help introduce yourself and your family to the American public as you seek this lifetime appointment? Tell us a bit about him and his story. Thank you, Senator. Um, my brother followed in a long tradition in my family of public service. It was uh, a core family value. Um, my parents were both public servants, and um, my mother's, two of my mother's brothers were career law enforcement. And my brother and I are almost a decade apart in age, and um, he, I think, looked up to my uncles, uh, who um, were often around in their uniforms, um, keeping their weapons away from the kids by putting them up on high shelves. And we, um, we looked up to them, and we understood 
through their service uh, what it meant to give back to your community. My brother went to college, a uh, historically black college, Howard University here in Washington, D.C., um, after growing up in Miami, and uh, decided to follow, my un follow in my un uncle's footsteps. Um, he could have done uh, many things coming out of college with a college degree, but decided he wanted to be a police officer and went uh, to Baltimore, um, which, as many of you know, struggles, like many cities, with, um, with areas that are, have a lot of crime. And it was, a very, um, it was a very stressful period for us as a family, because as proud as we are of his service, as much as we know it's important, law enforcement is a dangerous profession. And as family members, you worry um, when you don't get the phone call, when you haven't heard for a couple of days, when you hear about things in the news, uh, in the community, you worry. And so I grew up um, with family members who put their lives on the line. I understand the need for law enforcement, the importance of uh, having people who are willing to do that important work, the importance of holding people accountable for their criminal behavior. Um, I also, as a, a lawyer and a citizen, uh, believe very strongly in our Constitution and the rights that make us free. And what that means to me is an understanding that although we need accountability, although there is crime, we also have a society that ensures that people who have been accused of criminal behavior are treated fairly. That is what our Constitution requires. That is what makes our system so exceptional. My brother understood that as part of his work, and he also served in the military. He also decided, as many people did, to defend our country after 9-11, that he would go into the Army. And I remember when he made that decision, um, he had a college degree. He could have been an officer right away. He could have been a type of military officer that didn't have to actually be on the battlefield. And I remember saying, are you going to do something with you know, radio signals? Are you going to be behind the scenes? And he said, no, no, I'm going to be infantry, boots on the ground. He said, I believe strongly in the protection of our country. And if I'm going to be leading, I'm going to be out front. That's the kind of person my brother is. It's the kind of service that our family provides. And for me, what that meant was an understanding that to defend our country and its values, we also needed to make sure that when we responded as a country to the terrible attacks on 9-11, we were upholding our constitutional values, that we weren't allowing the terrorists to win by changing who we are. And so I joined with many lawyers during that time who were helping the courts figure out the limits of executive authority, consistent with what the framers have told us is important, the limitations on government. I worked to protect our country. My brother worked on the front lines, and it was all because public service is important to us. Thank you, Judge Jackson. And let's talk a bit about limitations on power. Our Constitution is a document that renounces monarchism and instead establishes a republic. Uh, you, in uh, opinion that has been widely cited, made the observation that presidents are not kings. What does that mean? And what are some of the most important bulwarks in our constitutional system against the abuse of executive power, against tyranny? Thank you, Senator. Our constitutional 
scheme, the design of our government is erected to prevent tyranny. The framers decided after experiencing monarchy, tyranny, and the like, that they were going to create a government that would split the powers of a monarch in several different ways. One was federalism. It was vertical. They would split the powers between the federal government and states. Another was to prevent the federal government from itself becoming too powerful, from having all of uh, the authorities, from having legislative, executive, and judicial authority concentrated in one place. So the Constitution, in its design, puts the legislative authority in Article I and gives it to the Congress, the power to make laws. It puts the executive authority in Article II and gives it to the president, the power to execute the laws. And it puts the judicial authority, the power to interpret the laws in Article III and gives it to the court. The separation of powers is crucial to liberty. It is what our country is founded on. And it's important, as consistent with my judicial methodology, for each branch to operate within their own sphere. That means for me that judges can't make law. Judges shouldn't be policy makers. That's a part of our constitutional design, and it prevents our government from being too powerful and encroaching on individual liberty. Thank you, Judge. I, I mentioned in my opening remarks that the court has played a vital role, constrained within its proper constitutional boundaries in the national process of making America in real life what America is in text. And reflecting on your experience as a public defender, a vital role in our justice system. Let's talk a little bit about the Sixth Amendment and the role that the court played in ensuring that the Sixth Amendment is real in practice in the Gideon v. Wainwright decision. Can you uh, help all those who are tuned in right now to reflect upon that decision, what it means, what it says about the role of the court? Yes. Senator, um, prior to Gideon versus Wainwright, people who could not afford lawyers were not entitled to lawyers under our system. So a person could be accused by the government of criminal behavior and would have to fend for themselves in court. They would have to make their own arguments. Someone who is not a lawyer would still be responsible for defending him or herself in front of a judge if the government brought charges. Earl Gideon was a criminal defendant from Florida, my home state, who had a handwritten petition. He complained that it wasn't fair under our constitutional scheme that protects and requires people to be tried he said, I need help. I'm not a lawyer. I can't make these arguments. I think it's important for uh, uh, the protection of liberty to ensure that people are able to have counsel. And that handwritten petition made its way to the Supreme Court. And the justices read it and they determined to take his case and in the end decided that the protections of the Sixth Amendment, the right to trial, includes the right to appointed counsel. So that everybody who is uh, accused of criminal behavior now has the right to an attorney. And that's very important. I mean, one of the things that I see or saw as a trial judge is that it was crucial for our justice system to have representation from both sides. It was the only way that a judge, it is the only way that a judge can really make 
fair determinations. And in cases, in, you know, we've heard a lot about my criminal cases. In every case, I'm getting, as a judge, arguments from the prosecution. I'm getting arguments from the defense counsel. I'm getting arguments or statements from probation in these criminal cases. And the work of a judge is to look at the facts and circumstances, hear the arguments of the parties, apply the law, and make a fair determination. And so having lawyers for criminal defendants aids in that process and benefits us all in our criminal justice system. I would just take the opportunity to note at this time, Judge Jackson, that it, it so happens that the Southern District of Georgia is one of just three federal districts without a federal defender's office, and I've offered legislation to establish one, and I'll be seeking support from my Republican colleagues to try to make that bipartisan to ensure there is access to counsel for defendants in my state. Let's talk a bit about the First Amendment, freedoms of speech, publication, assembly. There's a well-known Supreme Court case, Brandenburg v. Ohio, which establishes a certain test to ensure that the government is constrained in any effort that may be made to punish speech. And the impulse to censorship is something that can emerge from time to time across the ideological and political spectrum, particularly in times of great controversy or in times of uh, national security crisis. Can you please walk the committee and the broader public watching now from all across the country through that decision and how you will approach these vital protections for speech, publication, and assembly, should you be confirmed? Thank you, Senator. Um, freedom of speech, publication, assembly uh, is in the First Amendment of the Constitution. It is um, a core foundational protection against censorship. It is important in our constitutional scheme that people be allowed to express themselves, that ideas be exchanged. That is the groundwork for uh, a, a vigorous and vital democracy. There are um, many tests, many cases in the Supreme Court's uh, jurisprudence that discuss various um, disputes about um, circumstances in which the government can re restrain or regulate speech and that decision um, establishes to a certain extent that uh, if there is speech that is an incitement to violence, that's one circumstance in which the government might be able to prevent it. But other than that, short of that, um, free speech is supposed to be allowed to happen. And there are, again, various tests and circumstances that um, the court has applied in deciding whether the government can, can regulate the content, place, and manner of speech. But the general principle is that our democracy is, um, thrives because the government is restrained and cannot censor uh, its citizens. I think in the, in the same spirit of banks, uh, with which I open these questions. I also want to just take a moment and recognize the members of the press who are here, uh, the reporters and photographers who ensure that these proceedings are truly accessible to the public, um, and uh, ask you to describe your approach to press freedom. Um, the question of prior, cons uh, prior restraint uh, has been litigated, um, a famous case in the context of the Pentagon Papers. Uh, in the latter years of the Vietnam War. I know, I believe for all of us on this committee, we recognize the vital role of press freedom in ensuring the free exchange of ideas, access to truth and debate in our democracy. How will you approach cases that implicate press freedom? Thank you, Senator. Um, this is another area in which there is uh, well-established case law. Um, 
that supports the freedom of the press to be able to uh, write and report. Um, there, there is a general obligation of, of truth in terms of the press, but also a recognition that sometimes, um, sometimes there may be things that get published that aren't exactly accurate. And so the court in um, New York Times versus Sullivan um, determined a, a higher standard of liability for press um, Things that are put out in the press have to be knowingly uh, false. There's an actual malice test um, because the court was balancing uh, concerns about libel, people uh, claiming that they have been misrepresented in the press with the need to allow the press to do their job. The, the overall um, understanding is that press freedom, uh, again, is, is one of the First Amendment freedoms that are undergird our democracy. Something I just want to take a moment and, and observe, Judge Jackson, uh, is, you know, and, and uh, this is my first such proceeding. So I'm grateful to the chairman for opening today's ceremonies at the end of the dais. But um, something that I've studied and am aware of is that there's been a, a range uh, over time um, of how willing nominees are uh, to candidly and openly and forthrightly discuss these core matters of constitutional principle in proceedings like this one and a tendency over time um, to allow less and discuss less uh, a um, uh, more restrictive approach. Uh, and I want to thank you because um, while you have prudently and disciplined in a disciplined way uh, refrain from commenting inappropriately on potential pending case law. You have been willing to engage in a forthright and expansive discussion of these vital principles um, in a way that I think stands out among some recent nominees. That's not a criticism of any recent nominees. It's an observation about your performance. And I think that having an open and honest uh, and forthright dialogue about these matters of national significance is part of the vital role that these proceedings serve. I want to turn now to uh, the Fourth Amendment want to discuss with you the protections against unreasonable search and seizure. We discussed how the Constitution was a renunciation of monarchism and tyranny. It establishes core civil liberties, uh, one of which is the protection against unreasonable search and seizure. How will you approach Fourth Amendment case law, and can you uh, help those tuned in across the country uh, re remind them of what, for example, the principle of a reasonable expectation of privacy means in the context of Supreme Court jurisprudence. Thank you, Senator. The Fourth Amendment is one of the amendments in the Constitution that protects individual liberty by limiting what the government can do with respect to criminal processes. It uh, restrains the government from engaging in unreasonable searches and seizures. And the Supreme Court has developed uh, a series of tests and uh, ways of evaluating whether any particular act by an officer in a case qualifies as an unreasonable search or seizure. Let me just say that um, this is the kind of area of uh, Supreme Court and uh, judicial review that is very fact specific because courts, in order to stay in our appropriate role, can't make policy about police behavior writ large can't just sort of look out into the universe and say, we have a constitution that says unreasonable searches and seizures, so let us tell you all what that means. That's not the way that courts operate. Under Article Three, courts can only hear individual cases and controversies and decide them. So every court, including the Supreme Court, is looking at unreasonable search and seizures in the context of a particular dispute where someone has had something 
searched by an officer in their house. They've been seized uh, under a particular set of facts, and they claim in the context of a lawsuit um, or in the context of defending themselves that there has been an unreasonable search or seizure. And so the court, case by case by case, looks at the facts and circumstances and decides. And I would say that this is, this is the kind of analysis that takes into account uh, a number of things, but one of the things, um, in addition to understanding the facts and circumstances, is understanding what is meant in the Constitution by unreasonable search and seizure. There is case law that uh, the Supreme Court has developed that looks at whether or not something is an unreasonable search and seizure in part by analyzing whether there was a reasonable expectation of privacy uh, in that item, um, in that area. Is there a reasonable expectation of privacy in your house, for example? If a police officer were to come into your house, you, you would not be able to claim Fourth Amendment protection unless says the Supreme Court, there was a reasonable expectation of privacy in your house. And the Supreme Court has determined whether there's a reasonable expectation of privacy, for example, in your house, by looking at what areas were protected at the time of the founding when uh, the words unreasonable searches and seizures were written into the Constitution. Lo and behold, something like your house the court has determined there is a reasonable expectation of privacy because that's what those terms meant back then. And so if a police officer were to come without a warrant, the court has said, in areas where there is a reasonable expectation of privacy, um, that would be an unlawful search. This is an area where the emergence of new technologies uh, makes it likely, I believe, that should you be confirmed, you will have to consider Fourth Amendment claims in light of circumstances that couldn't have been anticipated uh, at the time of the drafting of the Constitution. And indeed, constitutional interpretation has already evolved over time to adapt to the reality of new technologies. Uh, from phone booths, uh, a classic case in the late 1960s about whether a closed phone booth door demonstrates an expectation of privacy to more recent case law involving geolocation data from cell phones. Uh, and I want to urge you, should you be confirmed, um, to remain vigilant about how the emergence of new technologies, the way that they become ubiquitous in our lives, the way that virtual spaces are increasingly akin to physical spaces, will require the court to consider very complex questions and to seek technical advice, because these are technologically complex questions. What is your view on how the court should seek such technical expertise, which may be, with all due respect, uh, beyond the training or experience of a justice or their clerk? Uh, and if, for example, one such method of seeking advice is through amici, What's the importance of understanding the provenance and origin and funding source of such briefs submitted to the court? So this is a two-part question. I want to restate it. The first is, um, again, I want to urge you, should you be confirmed, uh, as I'm confident you will, to vigorously defend the constitutional rights of American citizens against unreasonable search and seizure in the context of new technologies. I'd like to hear how you'll approach seeking technical expertise to inform that decision making. And then a question about the transparency of briefs filed before the court, something that Justice Scalia noted in some campaign finance case laws, that it's important for the public to know who's funding electioneering communications in the context of political campaigns. I think it's important for the court to know who's briefing them what the motive and funding source of such briefs might be. Could you please, with my remaining time, and then I'll yield and we'll have some more time later to discuss war powers, uh, could you please comment on those matters? Those will be my final questions for this round. Thank you, uh, Senator. One of the ways in which the court receives information, other than directly from the parties in a case, 
is through uh, a practice, an established practice of receiving uh, amicus briefs. Amicus is uh, a, a term for friend, friend of the court briefs. These are people who are not um, parties to the case, who don't have that kind of interest in the case, but may have expertise or information or arguments that they wish the court to hear. Um, and I think that that would be the primary mechanism by which if the court were to um, uh, decide to hear a case concerning uh, a matter that involves some technical expertise, um, I, I would think that there might be amicus briefs uh, related to the technology, for example. Um, I have not looked at the court's rules. I would certainly want to discuss with, with um, the courts, uh, other justices, um, the ways in which determinations are made about which amicus briefs uh, are received and what disclosures are related to them. But the court does receive amicus briefs uh, in cases in order to inform itself uh, so that um, it can make uh, a, a decision related to the issues in a case. Thank you, Judge Jackson. Thank you for your courage and your grace, your forthrightness in answering my questions. I look forward to the opportunity to ask a few more later, and I yield, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Senator Ossoff. Senator Tillis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge Jackson, thank you for being here. I hope you got some rest last night, and congratulations. Very little, Senator, but that's all right. Me too. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, but thank you for being here, and congratulations to your family and your uh, husband, who has an impressive medical uh, uh, list of accomplishments that he should be proud of. I'm sure that you are, too. And thank you to your family, the public servants, serving in the military, uh, serving in law enforcement, educating our children. Um, you're a role model family. Uh, I, I do want to go back. This morning, I ended up turning to a channel that I never watch just to see uh, what uh, what was being said about the proceedings. Um, I thought it was interesting that they were ridiculing some of my colleagues on this side of the aisle for bringing up the behavior of past um, Supreme Court hearings. This is really the appropriate venue to do it. I guess we could talk about it when we're reviewing intellectual property or something else, but contextually, this is the time to do that. And I think we all have to agree that the behavior uh, in the Kavanaugh hearing was inappropriate. I hope we never get back to it. And I hope we can all agree that many of the behavior or the positions that some of my colleagues took on the other side of the aisle with Justice Barrett was abhorrent, and we should never do it again. That's why I'm so glad that, for the most part, we behaved in an appropriate manner here. Um, I'm going to get to some questions, if time allows, that, that relate to some other questions that my colleagues have asked. But... Um, Judge Barrett, uh, did I understand correctly that uh, at a young age you won a debate competition or was it oratory competition? We were, I was in speech and debate. It was one team, and I did original oratory as my primary event. And uh, did you continue your debate competition? Uh, uh, did you continue to do that? First question. Mm. Did you continue to do debate competition? Continue into college. Yeah, I mean, were college. you doing that in school and college? As you I did doing? not do it in college. No, I did it. I did it from middle school through high school, okay. um, and stopped when I graduated high school. I did too, and and I recall with that that we would get assigned a topic that wouldn't necessarily be one that we agreed with, but we had to argue it. Were, were you ever in a situation, or did you get to pick a topic and only argue the side that? that so I for? I didn't do. What it sounds like you're re referencing is um, extemporaneous speaking. Yeah. Um, I think I did that once in one competition. I did original oratory, which is okay. where I wrote my own speech. Okay. You, you've had an opportunity to debate a lot as a defense uh, counsel, I would assume, in, in the court of law when you're debating a position. And I, the reason I ask that question is that yesterday when Senator Kennedy was asking you about <clears throat> the uh, expanding the court, or what we call court packing. You said, I haven't really thought about it, but I hear the arguments on both sides. And I understand, uh, and uh, uh, hear the argument on both sides. So could you briefly describe to me your perception of the arguments on both sides? 
My understanding um, of the argument is about whether or not to expand uh, the court beyond the nine uh, justices that are on the court right now, the, the nine seats that are there. Um, and if you, if you were to view, I mean, right now it's nine is fine, four or more. I mean, that's really the, the two arguments. So do you understand or have you heard any of the arguments for or against either side? I was, I'm not even sure about the four. I've just heard people talking about okay. putting more justices on, putting more justices on the court, um, expressing concerns that the court has become politicized, that uh, the court has become unbalanced in terms of uh, what people perceive to be views of the majority of the justices. And so I've heard arguments about rebalancing uh, the court on that side. And then there's the argument that many uh, on, on the dais uh, have uh, stated about the inappropriateness of doing so, the concern that it might uh, lead to um, some kind of a, a war of <laughs> every time uh, there's a new president adding justices to the court. They, um, actually, yesterday when uh, Senator Whitehouse, I think it was Senator Booker, who observed Senator Whitehouse's uh, presentation, made a comment about how Rhode Island uh, New Jersey being a bit bigger would have a bigger graphic to display. I went back, I think that New Jersey is six times the size of Rhode Island by square miles. North Carolina is 36 times the size of Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And before my friends from out, Texas Senator. chime in, I would, I would let them know that if uh, Alaska were two states, they'd be the third largest state. So I'm a decided to use the White House format <laughs> for dark money so that we have a balanced understanding of the fact that our proceedings here, uh, the aspirations for the court, uh, there is an ecosystem out there on both sides. As a matter of fact, we had a judicial nominee who actually participated in this ecosystem. I think you could reasonably assume if they participated in that ecosystem that they probably would have been an activist judge. Uh, the, the point that I make here is that we've seen this ecosystem mobilized to support you, and, and, and I think, uh, Judge Jackson, you said you haven't had any um, encounter with demand justice. I don't know if you've had any encounter with some of these that are abbreviated, or I'm sorry, uh, either acronyms or abbreviated, so I wouldn't expect you to. It would be interesting if, if we could, for the record, determine if you have had any interactions, but with respect. I have not, Senator. I've okay. never seen most of those. That's good enough for I me. Mean, I wouldn't expect you to, to be honest, uh, uh, sitting on the bench. But, um, but they are out there, and they have a specific plan. And their specific plan, as a matter of fact, I was inspired by uh, Senator Whitehouse's seat, so I went out to uh, demand justice. Uh, they have a specific plan. Step one. Four seats on the Supreme Court. We must add four seats on the Supreme Court to restore balance, which by their opinion is a majority with their view and their judicial philosophy. Um, they're thrilled that President Biden has promised to appoint a commission. In fact, they're so thrilled that they want to make sure that they can influence the outside of the, co the, uh, the commission uh, by uh, endorsing their four-seat strategy. They want to recruit 25,000 volunteers. This is on their website, their strategy, um, to influence the commission's recommendation. And then they want to nuke the filibuster, 51 votes to make a decision that could ultimately be to pack the courts. This is their stated goal. They're proud of it. Um, Senator Whitehouse was talking about how the prior president was influenced by an organization. I would, I would say that Senator Jackson, and almost everybody that the president vetted before, I'm sorry, Judge Jackson, are on this list. So I think it's intellectually dishonest to say that the administration, that my colleagues on the other side of the aisle, are not influenced by this organization. We've tracked some of the fundraising and support in re-elections. They're engaged. 
and they're influenced by it. But let me tell you what I'm really worried about with the court packing um, risk that we have today. Uh, we're, we're talking about the ultimate destruction of two institutions. Back in January, Senator Schumer laid a vote down on the floor that ultimately would have reduced the majority of 60, the, the filibuster limit of 60, to 51. Um, he was doing it as a, as a way to pass a single bill, but we all know what happened when Senator Reid nuked the executive calendar for circuit court judges. It led to you only being subject to 51 votes to be confirmed. That nuked the executive calendar. In January, Senator Schumer was laying the groundwork for the same thing. Now, I worry that that's the destruction of the Senate institution as far as I'm concerned. I think we have to be a consensus-based organization. We don't need to be a 100-member House of Representatives. And that vote happened. What disappointed me most about that vote is back when President Trump was calling on us and pressuring us to nuke the filibuster when we had control of Congress. I signed on to a letter with more than 60 members to say that I would never do that in the face of, our pre in, in the face of a Republican president whose policies I supported. I did that to send a very clear message. I respect this institution, and I respect the court, which almost certainly would have been, uh, we would have had pressure <clears throat> from our side of the aisle to pack the court a little bit more. Now, every member who was here back when we signed that letter, who's on this committee, changed their position and voted <clears throat> to potentially nuke the filibuster just two months ago. So I hope you can understand my concern about the political wins and the potential damage that it could do to the Senate and do to the Supreme Court. I think it was Federalist Paper 78 where Hamilton talked about the vulnerability, or I think uh, the feebleness. Now, he was arguing, <clears throat> I think, the case for lifetime appointments. But I do think that the Supreme Court is a fragile institution. And I do believe that if we think it's politicized now, think about how it would be if we destroy the institution of the Senate so that a, a strict party line partisan vote we expand the court. That's why court packing is important, and that's why we ask a question that I know you're not going to answer, but I know that Justice Breyer and Justice Ginsburg did. And if there's any Supreme Court justice listening right now, I wish that they would speak up, because I think your institution is in peril, and accelerating it to a truly political body is only one successful nuking of the filibuster vote away in the U.S. Senate. This is serious stuff. I was at uh, Price Waterhouse. I was a partner at Price Waterhouse back during the Arthur Anderson Enron scandal. Um, I saw about a hundred year old top tier big five consulting firm cease to exist because their reputation suffered. If we pack the court, the only thing that you all have that, that the Supreme Court has is its integrity and the esteem that the American people and the trust they put into it. Packing the court could cause the Supreme Court to lose the trust of the American people. And I think if we want to expand the court, let's do it for the only valid reasons. Maybe the justices come to us and the chief justice come to us and say, the workload too, is too great. The times have changed. And then convince 60 members of this body to consider it. But when you've got a partisan organization here that's putting a pipeline of people in there that they think think like them and have a judicial philosophy like them, how can any reasonable person think that this is just kind of fixing the mechanics? It's a partisan decision that even some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle have taken the bait. So much so that they would reverse a commitment that they made with me when they signed that letter to say they would never nuke the filibuster and then nuke it. President Biden's on that list, too. Back in 1983, he gave a rousing speech in a Judiciary Committee hearing saying, don't pack the court. He gave a rousing speech on the Senate floor saying, don't nuke the filibuster. 
But now we're in this posture to where we could destroy two institutions if we're not careful. So I actually hope that you can at some point study the issue thoroughly and understand the risk to this institution that you're likely to be confirmed to. It's serious. And you could end up being there. You'll have a lifetime appointment. You could actually be there and witness its demise real time if we're allowing, if we allow it, uh, the court to be packed. Now, I want to talk uh, a little bit about um, the, you, I think you were, you were a part of a, uh, of a case in Massachusetts that some people are casting as a pro-life versus pro-choice issue. Now, to be clear, I am Catholic and I am pro-life. And I'm proud to have signed and ratified pro-life bills in North Carolina when I was Speaker of the House uh, that have withstood judicial scrutiny. Uh, but I don't really think that case was about pro-life. I think it was about free speech. So I want to ask you a few questions about it. Um, and, and maybe you could describe it to me if, if your memory serves you. But it, it seems to me that the argument that you, you were a part of, uh, I think that you, uh, you joined uh, with a couple of others, um, it seemed as if the argument was because the pro-life protesters were um, threatening, to danger, uh, threatening and dangerous to women, attempting to enter the clinic. I'm not necessarily saying you put those words in the brief, but uh, they were in there, and they were hostile, noisy crowd in the face of protesters. Now, it, 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 am I correct that a part of the argument was because they were noisy, in-your-face protesters, they needed to be a little bit further away than people who were pro-choice uh, advocates? Because as I understand it, I think the underlying law in Massachusetts was ultimately struck down unanimously by the Supreme Court. Is that correct? Thank you, Senator. The brief that you... Oh, by the way, I didn't, I didn't expect you to respond to my riff on packing the court. Yes. Just to net it out, it's a bad, bad, bad idea. But back I, on this... I one. understand. Um, the brief that you are referencing was a brief that I worked on um, right after finishing my Supreme Court clerkship when I joined a big law firm in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. This is 19, maybe 2000 um, at the end of my clerkship. Um, and it is a First Amendment free speech set of arguments that the lawyers at my firm, um, I was a part of a team representing clients who wanted to make an argument about buffer zones, which at that time had not yet been litigated all, all the way up to the but, Supreme but Court. Was it, was it a buffer zone that put pro-life and pro-choice people in the same buffer or one that argued that pro-life people were in your face and perhaps needed a bit better, bigger buffer than the pro-choice? I was just trying yes, to understand no, the facts I, of the case. I, I'm, I believe that it was viewpoint neutral, meaning it wasn't about what the people were saying. It was about clearing a path. Yeah to allow people to enter the clinic. Mm -hmm. The laws at the time were about how far yeah. did people have to be kept back, whether they were pro-life or pro-choice, because if they were blocking the entrance. Do you, do you understand why the, uh, uh, the underlying uh, law was ultimately deemed unconstitutional by the Supreme Court? <laughs> I didn't follow the jurisprudence. At that time, it had not been. And the First Circuit, I, this was a First Circuit brief. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember what happened in the district court, but my clients wanted to argue in the First Circuit that the laws that allowed for the clearing of the path so that people could enter the clinic and have people stand back uh, were constitutional and important, and the First Circuit agreed. I think ultimately, um, I'm, I don't know exactly, but I think ultimately... As you say, there was some litigation that went all the way to the Supreme Court, and um, the court had other jurisprudence about the extent to which buffer zones are constitutional. Yeah. Well, it, 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 it looked at – I'm not an attorney, 
I watch Law and Order from time to time, mm. and I'm uh, uh, I'm not going to get into a debate. But uh, but uh, uh, on its face, it almost looked as if there was this notion that there was uh, bad speech and good speech. That 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 somehow. Um, and look, I'm somebody who's had uh, protesters come to my house, get in my face, and and be very nasty four times by land and two times by sea. I live on a lake. Um, okay with them doing it as long as they stay off my lawn. In the last case, they didn't. But um, it, it almost felt like to me that those protesters who didn't like me um, needed to be a little bit further away than the protesters that maybe I would allow to be a little bit closer. It may not be right, but I'll make sure that I get my facts right before this afternoon in the second round. I want to go to <clears throat> sentencing. Um, I'm not going to cover any of the ground that my uh, colleagues have. I'm sympathetic to some of it, not necessarily all of it, because I think the details are something that we don't have possession of. I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit more about that. But um, I, I want to talk more about a, a, a pattern. I know, uh, and I was really um, impacted by your description of family dinners and your, your uncles uh, coming in in uniforms and putting their guns up on the cupboard and, and having a sense of pride that that you uh, you had family that served in law enforcement. Um, there are a couple of cases. Uh, I, I'm very focused on uh, law enforcement and backing the blue. I think that police, law enforcement, I talk with a lot of them, their morale is low. They feel like uh, defund the police and some of these other efforts uh, are already making a very difficult and dangerous job more difficult and more dangerous. Um, there have been a few cases where you have uh, recommended uh, lower sentences that even I think the uh, defense attorneys have. Um, but I'm sure that uh, if I were you and observing you yesterday, you would probably point to some mitigating circumstances or factors that are not necessarily available to the committee as a basis for doing that. I think in one case, uh, the government recommended a 30-month sentence and the defense recommended 21 months and you gave them 18 months and this was a third conviction for assaulting an officer. There was another one um, that uh, was a lower sentence for uh, uh, there, were, there were officer assaults, and it just seemed like it went lower. But I don't want to get into those because you may have factors that uh, that you would point to that would justify the decision. I, I've got a, a question about now, see that's at an atomic level. I mean, you're looking at the the facts of the case, you're looking at the defendant, and as you've described in some of the other cases here, you made a judgment that you thought was fair and that was in bounds with uh, your peer group, but. Back uh, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, uh, I believe you made this statement, and I'll give you time to provide context if it's out of context, uh, but in the interest of time, I'm only going to read the most striking. Um, you said, the obvious increased risk of harm that the COVID-19 pandemic poses to individuals who have been detained in the districts, that's the District of Columbia's correctional facilities, reasonably suggests that each and every, and I think that means everyone, every defendant who is currently in the D.C. De uh, Department of Corrections custody and who thus cannot take independent measures to control their own hygiene and distance themselves from others should be released. I checked in April of 2020, I think that's when you made the statement, that there were 12 or 1,600, let's call 1,200, I'll be conservative, people in the Department of Corrections. Do I read that statement to say that you felt, given the circumstances of the time, they should all be released? Because that's broad. That's not looking at their individual cases. No, Senator, you don't read it correctly. Okay. Um, it was not a statement. It was a line in an opinion. Um, and the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic um, was a really obviously was horrible there. and difficult time for all of us. Yep. Um, and what was happening at the beginning in the prisons, which was part of the criminal justice system that as judges we uh, were involved in. I tracked it quick. Let me, I want, yeah. because I, I do not want to go over. I don't go Can over. I just, but, but let me, yeah. let me just give you a, a little bit more uh, context. Uh, 
I've actually written letters to uh, uh, to the Department of Justice uh, encouraging the release of nonviolent offenders uh, in North Carolina at a federal correctional facility. Um, I've also supported uh, early release programs. I voted and, and supported the uh, First Step Act. Um, I, as Speaker of the House, was the first speaker in probably uh, two decades that actually did uh, the Justice Reinvestment Act early release of nonviolent uh, prisoners. But how can I not read this to say that perhaps they should be released irrespective of the, the crime for which they've been charged? Senator, if you read two more sentences down, that is precisely what I focus on. This is a case, United States versus Wiggins, where I was uh, setting up my analysis as to why I would not be releasing Mr. Wiggins in this case. He was arguing uh, essentially what I said in that statement. He was arguing that the circumstances of COVID-19, which at that point was rampant, in the prisons. We had not had a vaccine. There were uh, very difficult circumstances for prisoners who could not be separated from each other in the context of our jails. And as I say at the beginning of that opinion, um, at that point, COVID was ravaging the jail. And the question for courts under the statute that Congress has enacted for compassionate release was whether COVID-19, a pandemic in the jail, was an extraordinary and exceptional circumstance or extraordinary and compelling circumstance that should warrant release. What I said in that statement that you read was it would seem as though something like a deadly pandemic rampant in the jails would justify releasing everyone. But I go on to say in that very opinion, Congress has indicated that we have to take each case individually. We have to look at the harm to the community that might be caused by the release of individual people. We can't just release everybody, I said in that okay. opinion. And so I, I wanted to give you uh, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I'm on, that's all right. on four minutes. But um, I, I, I feel like uh, I also got, uh, had my staff uh, provided me this morning in very, very small type recidivism and federal uh, sentencing outcomes. Um, you know, I, I've said, I'm on record as saying that I want people out. I want them to uh, have them an opportunity to reenter society, become productive members, and I've got a track record for ratifying bills to that effect and supporting similar measures since I've been here in the Senate. I'm going to continue to work on it. But... Uh, Tell me why uh, the, uh, the numbers that I'm looking here, uh, we have a uh, recidivism rate, the most recent one that I have before me, and I'd be happy to share, share it. I'll, I'll uh, ask with, uh, uh, to have this submitted to the record. But I think an eight-year look back says that 49% of the people incarcerated are rearrested within eight years. Um, if you take a look at the types that are, are most likely to be reoffending, it's firearms offenders, uh, robbery offenders, violent offenders reoffended at a higher rate than nonviolent offenders. And so if I look at this and I, I look at, it, at your philosophy with respect, and, and it's admirable. I said that the content of your character would be demonstrated this week in my opening statement, and it has been. And, and one of the things that are first among them are your compassion and your belief that people can redeem themselves. But if you look at some of the cases that our, my colleagues have brought up, um, and if you look at even even with the context that you provided on the last statement about the uh, the Department of Corrections um, statement in Wiggins, um, can you understand how some of us may think that your 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 compassion could lead to bad results based on the numbers that we have here with recidivism? That Congress may need to work more on that to make sure that we get it right. Um, uh, can, can you understand how somebody uh, who, uh, from our side of the aisle, could see that maybe um, there is some pattern 
to give the benefit of the doubt to someone who has been incarcerated in some cases with very serious crimes? Thank you, Senator. Um, I don't recall saying anything about compassion in the way that you're describing it. No, no, but no. I, I'm I, just saying that if I, if I take a look at uh, your, your responses to uh, some of my colleagues' questions um, and your statements to some of the um, uh, to some of the defendants, it seems as though you're a very kind person and that there's at least a level of empathy that enters into your treatment of a defendant that some could view as a uh, uh, maybe beyond what some of us would be comfortable with with respect to administering justice. Thank you for letting me clarify. Um, the statements that I made about my practices as a trial judge, which I'm no longer a trial judge, but um, were intended to explain how trial judges operate and how they impose sentences within the framework that Congress has provided. Uh, the statute that applies to us tells us to look at all of the various factors that Congress has set forward, including the nature and circumstances of the offense, the history of the and characteristics of the defendant, and it tells us that we should be imposing a sentence sufficient but not greater than necessary to promote the purposes of punishment. Congress also tells us that one of the purposes of punishment is rehabilitation. My um, attempts to communicate directly with defendants is about public safety because most of the people who are incarcerated uh, via the federal system and even via the state system will come out, will be a part of our communities again. And so it is to our entire benefit as Congress has recognized to ensure that people who come out stop committing crimes. And so what I convey or did when I was a trial judge as I sentenced people to very lengthy periods of incarceration was you are getting your day in court, you are able to say what you want to say, but you have to sit here and listen to my reading into the record, the victim statements in this case. You have to go away understanding that I am imposing consequences for your decision, your decision to engage in criminal behavior. And the reason why I did that, I've said, is because I recognized as a defender that there were lots of people in our system who instead of taking responsibility for what they had done and then ultimately understanding the harm and potentially not doing it again, instead of that, those people were bitter, they were angry, they were feeling victimized because they didn't get a chance to say what they wanted to say because nobody explained to them that drug crimes are really serious crimes. Nobody said to them, do you understand that there are children who will never have normal lives because you sold crack to their parents and now they're in a vortex of addiction? Do you understand that, Mr. Defendant? It's I was the one in my sentencing practices who explained those things in an interest of furthering Congress's direction that we're supposed to be sentencing people so that they can ultimately be rehabilitated to the benefit of society as a whole. I, I appreciate that, Judge Jackson. I, I, I just still note that virtually half of those people, statistically speaking, that you gave that speech to within eight years were back in prison and in some, t in some cases for more serious offenses than the first incarceration. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Senator, for that line of questioning. And I noted that you joined a letter uh, with Senator Grassley and myself in March of uh, 2020 at the earliest stages of this, uh, talking about release under these similar circumstances. And of course, we all said at the same time, low risk uh, inmates would be considered, but only low risk inmates. Yes, yep. and uh, I wanted to make that note for the record. 
We're going to start the second round of questions, 20 minutes each, and I'll, I'll kick it off. Um, this is an unusual document, <clears throat> this Constitution of ours, <clears throat> which has taken up so much time in the hearing, the conversation about it. And it is really at the core of public service. I don't know that there's a place that you can take a job at, at the federal level uh, in any branch of government without taking an oath to defend this document. Uh, I don't know about other countries and the oaths that might be required, but we even within the Constitution spell out the oath uh, to be taken by the President of the United States and it's to uphold and defend this document. And there's great debate about just what this document means in today's context. We understand the wisdom, the inherent wisdom of the document and the fact that we're still here some 230 years later uh, with the design of a government that has endured longer than virtually any other democracy, which of course speaks to the wisdom of the Founding Fathers and their plan for this nation. But we also understand, taking an honest, honest look at it, that you barely get into this document, Article 1, Section 2, then you run into a problem. Because in Article 1, Section 2, the article that relates to Congress, they talk about uh, who will be counted for apportionment among the states, and there is that awful reference to three-fifths of all other persons, which, though the document never mentions the word slavery or slaves, what was being spelled out here by the Founding Fathers was, how are we going to count these slaves? And for apportionment purposes, they were to be counted as three-fifths of a person, which is a horrible notion by any standard, but the wise Founding Fathers included it, trying to deal with the reality of their day. I hear debates back and forth of originalist, textualist, and others, and you've been asked as often as any nominee what your thought is. You've talked about stay in your own lane, judiciary, and methodology, and the like. But I'd like to explore for just a moment, without asking you to get in any particular fact pattern, the reality of a couple things. First, when the Bill of Rights was written, the First Amendment to it made certain to guarantee freedom of press. Freedom of the press in 1790 was, of course, referring to a piece of paper, a newspaper, uh, and saying that there would be freedom to engage in that process in this de democracy of America. Now that freedom of press is referring to this, and things have changed an awful lot. We have a circumstance now where uh, people no longer have just a handful of television networks or known publications, Washington Post, New York Times and such, but turn for their sources of information to places like Facebook and Twitter and beyond. And we have a real serious question about what is a publication in America? What does it take to be a publication and be press? Is my blog that I publish tomorrow the press, guaranteed it with a constitutional right, that I have a right to publish it as I wish, say what I want to say with certain boundaries? And I guess my question to you as we look at this is, how do you move from the language of 1789-1790 to the reality of 21st century and make sure it's relevant? If more people are relying on Facebook and Twitter, for example, for information than they are common sources of television and newspapers, how do we rationalize that they can say, Facebook and Twitter, to a former president of the United States, you can't publish here. You're not going to be allowed to do it, and they've done that. So how do you reconcile that conflict of the changing times, the dramatic changes in technology, what the Founding Fathers envisioned and what we face today. Thank you, uh, Senator. The challenges that you identify are the types of things that the Supreme Court um, is now dealing with. Um, we have uh, a, a foundational document that has text and it has principles it establishes freedoms and foundational important um, concepts 
that are intended to govern us and that we are bound by as, uh, as a society. There's modern technologies, as you say, that have not, um, that, that the framers, the founders could not have imagined the cell phone um, and all the other things that we uh, now um, rely upon. And as I mentioned earlier, the Supreme Court and every court deals with individual cases, disputes about issues, and when the court gets an issue um, that requires constitutional interpretation, it looks at the facts and circumstances of the particular case and the text and principles of the Constitution in light of the times in which they were written and analogizes to present day. So the Supreme Court, for example, has um, considered the cell phone issue with respect to uh, the constitutional principle of unreasonable searches and seizures, which is a protection from uh, government intrusion uh, that the framers called an unreasonable search. The text unreasonable search um, is not, does not have an inherent definition. What the Supreme Court has done is looked back at the time of the founding to determine what kinds of intrusion would have been covered when those words were written into the Constitution. And to the extent that the, at the time of the founding, those words covered things like police officer intruding into your home and looking into your papers and affairs, then the Supreme Court analogizes that circumstance to the modern day circumstance of a cell phone, which now is in all respects, says the court, like rifling through your purple, uh, papers and affairs. So it's a process of uh, understanding what the core foundational principles are in the Constitution as captured by the text, um, as originally intended, and then applying those principles to modern day. I'll just give you two th illustrations of uh, my thinking on this and my frustration, or at least I understanding of the challenge, let's say, let's put it that way. Senator Feinstein and I joined in legislation uh, several years ago to talk about confidenti confidentiality of sources for news entities and whether or not a person could, a reporter could be compelled to disclose those sources. Uh, the effort really drew some of the uh, best and brightest in the news business to come testify for the committee. The effort failed and faltered over what is a publication? Who is a publisher? Who is in the business of dispensing news? Does it involve uh, money has to pass between them for this to be an official publication? Or can I just put up on my blog what I wish and, and resist any efforts to, dis to discover my sources? That was one of the serious issues that we faced. We uh, also took a look, uh, I take a look at uh, where this is going in, in terms of uh, the future and our entities that we rely on for news so often. Uh, and I'm going to leave it at that because I think you've addressed the general and don't want to get into more specifics, uh, nor should you. But um, when people pledge that, you know, they are originalists, we're sticking with the original words, you better have your mind open to the reality that this world is changing and changed, and many of those principles are sound today. But the challenges of interpreting them with the reality of today's technology uh, is, is a challenge, a very difficult one, which you would face in the court. I'm going to try to set an example here. We have 20 minutes, and I'm going to try to yield back some part of it. I see that Senator Cornyn is here, and I'm glad he is because I'm going to address an issue which he raised yesterday and again this morning. And I wanted, wanted to do it while he was physically present so that when he gets his turn, he can address it, I'm sure, sure he will. Uh, yesterday, Senator Graham uh, said that uh, you had gone too far in calling the government, quote, a war criminal in pursuing charges against a terrorist. 
Later, Senator Cornyn asked Judge Jackson, and I quote, you referred to the Secretary of Defense and President of the United States as war criminals. Why would you do something like that? Uh, as I noted yesterday and, and repeat this morning, these charges don't hold up. Uh, CNN fact check said, quote, both Graham and Cornyn left out important context. Specifically, neither mentioned that Jackson's allegation of war crimes was about torture. Also, Jackson didn't explicitly use the phrase war criminal. The New York Times noted that the allegation, quote, is a distortion and lacks context. The New York Times went on to say, Judge Jackson did not specifically call the former president and defense secretary war criminals. She was one of several lawyers in 2005, signing four essentially boilerplate habeas corpus petitions on behalf of detainees at Guantanamo that claimed the U.S. government had tortured the men and that such acts constitute war crimes, that's in quotes, the petitions each named Mr. Bush and Mr. Rumsfeld, along with two senior military officers who oversaw the Guantanamo detention operation in their official capacities as respondents. Washington Post noted, and I quote, one key thing to note, as law professor Stephen Vladek does, is that Bush and Rumsfeld are named in petitions because they have to be, to clear procedural hurdles. Indeed, those petitions later named Barack Obama after the administration changed. Another is that they are named in their official capacities, not because of actions they ter personally took as individuals. They continued, but the larger point is that Jackson, Jackson was acting as a detainee's lawyer in a role as public defender, and one of the underpinnings of the American justice system that is even the most reviled alleged criminals have the right to a vigorous defense. Would you like to comment on that uh, uh, statement that I just made? Well, Senator, um I would just say that um, public defenders don't choose their clients, and yet they have to provide vigorous advocacy. That's the duty of a lawyer. And as a judge now, um, I see the importance of having lawyers who make arguments, who um, make allegations in the context of a habeas petition, especially early in um, the process of the response to the horrible ta attacks of 9-11, lawyers were helping the courts to assess the permissible extent of executive authority um, by making arguments. and. We were assigned as public defenders. We had very little information uh, because of the confidentiality or classified nature of a lot of the record. And as um, an appellate lawyer, um, it was my obligation to file habeas petitions on behalf of my clients. Thank you, Judge. I'm going to try to set an example by yielding back about seven minutes of my time. I invite my colleagues uh, to follow that example if they wish. Senator Grassley, you're next. Yeah. Uh, before I start, I'd like to make a brief point. Yesterday, Senator Durbin referenced Congress's effort to stop child pornography and the exploitation of minors. I've worked on this issue for decades. In 1983, I supported the Protection of Children Against Sexual Exploitation Act. In 2012, I sent a letter to the Sentencing Commission while Judge Jackson was vice chair. In the letter, I encouraged the Sentencing Commission not to lower sentences for child pornography. I said that, quote, it would be a, a disservice to the American people to have the commission issue a report that advocates for the reduction in sentencing for a class of criminals who caused profound and lasting damage to their victims, end of quote. I'd like to have that uh, put in the record. Without objection. Uh, yesterday, you referred to your record of decisions as the best thing to look at when explaining and evaluating your nomination. But you also said that you haven't had enough cases involving constitutional law to develop a judicial philosophy. If you haven't had uh, to develop a philosophy 
for deciding cases yet, what else do you think would be helpful for us to look at? So respectfully, Senator, I do have a philosophy. The philosophy is my methodology. It is a philosophy that um, I have developed from practice. Um, unlike some judges who come to appellate work from academia and who have some overarching theory of the law, I approach cases from experience, from practice, and consistent with my constitutional obligations. So my philosophy is one in which I look at cases impartially consistent with my independence as a judicial officer. I understand my limited role in the constitutional scheme and therefore take very seriously all of the constraints on the exercise of my authority that exist uh, in our uh, system. What that means is that at the beginning of every case, I am setting aside my personal views. I'm That's the three steps you gave us? Yes, sir. That, yes. Uh, so you don't have to go into that. Let me go on then. Should the Supreme Court overrule a precedent when it is clear to the justices that the precedent was wrongly decided. Thank you, Senator. Stare decisis, which is the principle uh, that um, the Supreme Court uses at the outset. It's the sort of background rule of uh, judicial um, maintenance of precedence in order to have predictability, stability, uh, in the law is the kind of principle that the court begins with when it is asked to overrule or uh, revisit a precedent. And the court has developed certain factors that it looks at before it actually undertakes to reverse a precedent. One of those factors is the view that the precedent it's reconsidering is wrong, but that's not the only factor. The court also uh, determines, in addition to whether or not the, pre the prior precedent was egregiously wrong, the court has said, um, the court looks at whether there's been reliance on that prior precedent, whether the precedent is workable or has proven workable over time, whether the cases in the area uh, of the precedent have shifted such that the precedent itself is no longer on firm foundation, and whether there have been either new facts or a new understanding of the facts um, that give rise to a need to revisit the precedent. So it's not just um, a, a look at whether or not it's wrong, and it's important that the court take into account all of those factors because stare decisis, meaning uh, letting the precedent stand, is a very important pillar of the rule of law. When is it appropriate for a judge to impose a sentence enhancement under the guidelines? Thank you, Senator. The federal sentencing guidelines um, are crafted to assist courts in making sentencing determinations within the broad range that Congress prescribes for cases, for, for crimes. So in the typical case, a defendant is convicted of some crime um, in the federal system. They're usually very serious crimes and Congress will say, judge, you can give that person a sentence anywhere between zero and 20 years, for example. The sentencing guidelines are designed to set out a series of factors that judges should be looking at when they decide what they're going to sentence that particular person to. And those 
factors will be things like if this is a violent crime, does the person have a weapon? If this is a violent crime, was there any injury? And so the judge is looking at these facts, in many cases horrible facts, and calculating the guidelines based on what we call enhancements. Each one of those different characteristics or conditions is an enhancement. So you ask, when is it important to, um, to for, when it's appropriate? Well, the judge, judge has to calculate the guidelines in every case. That's how we start the process. But under the statutes, in addition to calculating the guidelines with all of those enhancements, the way our system now works is you determine what the guideline range of punishment is going to be, and then Congress says you look at a series of other factors in addition to the guideline range. And at the end of the day, the judges in the system now are choosing sentences based on both the consideration of the guidelines and also the consideration of the statutory factors that Congress has put forward. Have you ever declined to impose an enhanced sentence on a defendant because you disagreed with the enhancement as a policy matter? Thank you, Senator. Um, yes, and the reason is because of Supreme Court case law concerning um, the way in which the guideline system operates. The Supreme Court has um, determined in a case we discussed yesterday that the guidelines are no longer binding on judges, meaning um, the guidelines you calculate, but you don't have to stay in the guideline range anymore. That was um, the Supreme Court's Booker case. In, and I can't remember if it's in that case or in subsequent case law, but the Supreme Court has also made clear that when you are calculating the guideline range in the new system that we're in right now, judges are free, they, the Supreme Court has said, to decide in particular cases whether as a quote unquote policy matter, they disagree with a particular enhancement. That is the state of the law. That is what the Supreme Court has said judges are permitted to do in cases. And so I have, in certain cases, given the way in which the guidelines are operating, the disparities that are created in cases, I have at times identified various enhancements that I have disagreed with as a policy matter because the Supreme Court has said that that's the authority of a sentencing judge in our system. Are nationwide injunctions constitutional? Well, Senator... Um, you, you, you've issued them. Thank you for letting me address um, that circumstance. The reason why I paused is because um, the, what, what I have issued is not technically a nationwide injunction. People call... Um, call it that, but in a particular set of cases, administrative agency cases that are brought under the Administrative Procedure Act, these are challenges to agency actions, like agency rules that they have promulgated, and if the challenge is to the procedures that the agency undertook to create the rule, the statute that applies, the Administrative Procedure Act, tells the court that if you agree with the plaintiff that the agency rule is faulty procedurally, the remedy in the statute is to invalidate the rule. That's what Congress tells judges to do. Now, technically, that's not a nationwide injunction. That is <coughs> invalidating a rule
case in which something has happened between the plan. Plaintiff and the defendant. And the court says, based on what happened in this case, I'm going to tell everybody in the country that you can't, the defendant, you can't operate in this way anymore. I'm going to find on the basis of this particular case, and I'm going to enjoin everyone in the country not to do that anymore. That's a nationwide injunction, which is not what I've done in, I think, the cases that you're talking about. How can the judiciary address concerns about foreign shop, forum shopping given the rise of nationwide injunctions? Well, um, forum shopping is, um, is a concern that arises when litigants seek to um, go to different places in the country where they think that they may get a better result. And it's something that Congress can address because Congress has the power to uh, determine uh, various aspects of judicial process. Uh, explain the political question doctrine and then what standards would you apply to determine whether a claim before you uh, implicates a political question? So the political question doctrine um, is a doctrine that relates to uh, the jurisdiction of the court. As I mentioned, um, the courts are in um, a particular branch of government, the judicial branch that is limited in its power. The courts can't um, make policy. They can't reach out into the world and decide that certain things are good or bad and then address them. They have to wait for cases to come um, and decide them. And when a case comes, it has to be presenting a question of law for the court to answer it. If a person comes to the court and they ask the court to answer something that is properly in the province of Congress, if they ask a political question, then the court has to say, I'm sorry, that's not my role. So I had, for example, a case that involved um, uh, Yemeni citizens who um, I'm trying to get the facts exactly right, but they um, had relatives. They were, I think they were resident in the United States and they had relatives in Yemen, a war-torn area. This is um, a few, few years ago. And they came to the court, me, asking if I could direct the administration to extract their relatives from Yemen that they wanted me to order um, the executive branch to send in troops and get their relatives out because it was um, obviously dangerous for their relatives to be in that country. And what I said in that circumstance is essentially, I don't have jurisdiction to do that because what you're asking me to do is a political question that the question of when and where troops can be sent and who um, can be extracted from foreign governments belongs with the executive branch. And so you have to ask them. Um, and so I said, I have no jurisdiction. That's a political question doctrine. Um, and it's well established in, in our law. Yesterday, in response to a question from Senator Durbin, you said that a judge, as a judge, you are, quote, trying in every case to stay in your lane, and end of quote. That's the same time you gave us the three steps you go through as you work yourself through a case. You also described the text of uh, law as a constraint on your authority. But in several cases, uh, I'll list, make the road New York, AFL, CI versus Trump, Watervale, 
Marine companies and others, the D.C. Circuit reversed your decision or criticized your reasoning for failing to follow a clear and unambiguous text. Why didn't the clear text of the law constrain your authority in these cases? Um, thank you, Senator. You mentioned three cases. Um, certainly with respect to the second one, um, the D.C. Circuit didn't say that the text was clear, and in fact, that's um, what happens in cases, that judges at the trial level do their best to make interpretations. In that case, um, it involved a channeling provision. This is um, AFG versus Trump. Um, it involved a, a provision, a statute that was designed to channel um, the um, judicial authority into an agency. Um, and I interpreted the statute and I thought that the arguments that were being made, um, the claims that were being made were not ones that Congress had intended to channel. And I went through the analysis and I explained my reasoning as to why I thought I still had jurisdiction, and I went on to address uh, the merits, which is the duty of the judge if they determine they do have jurisdiction. The D.C. Circuit disagreed. They wrote an opinion that interpreted the statute differently with respect to those claims, but it was a case of first impression as to what those claims meant and whether they were supposed to be channeled or not. And that happens. Um, the district judges do their best, and sometimes the Court of Appeals and the Supreme Court haven't spoken to the issue, and the parties disagree. In Make the Road, um, I explained that uh, what I was attempting to do in light of Congress's enactments, not only the particular immigration uh, provision, but also the uh, Administrative Procedure Act, was reconcile the statutes of Congress, which is something that um, the courts also are supposed to do, that there are statutory interpretation canons that make clear that courts are supposed to understand that Congress intends for its statutes to work together, and to the extent that you are interpreting and the claim is made that allows you to do that, that's the sort of way in which interpretation is done. I can go through my actual analysis. I did it yesterday as we talked, but um, there was a, a good faith disagreement between me and the Court of Appeals, which gets to decide um, as to what the language meant and whether or not um, Congress actually intended to exclude the APA um, using that language under those circumstances. Thank you very much. Senator Leahy. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair, and welcome back, Judge Jackson. I uh, I know yesterday was a grueling day of questions, and I commend you for your poise, your endurance, your thoughtful answers. Uh, I felt um, privileged to be here for hours of that, <laughs> and you had even more hours. <laughs> but I want you to know the reaction in my own state of Vermont. I've gotten all kinds of emails and calls and from friends uh, across the political spectrum. They're all been praising you. And they said they realized that a lot of the questions that were lobbed at you had nothing at all to do with your qualities as being, being on the Supreme Court, but were some members, unfortunately, aiming for what uh, a sound bite that they may be able to put on a political uh, website where it now is. For example, we heard some overheated claims yesterday that your representation of Guantanamo detainees somehow signaled your policy preference with how the United States has uh, dealt with those detainees. <clears throat> Every single member of this committee, especially those of us who have been a, assigned as counsel in cases, should know better than to conflate a nominee's past representation or their policy positions, or to argue that a nominee espoused their client's viewpoint simply by choosing to represent them. 
So your policy views aside, can you reiterate why it's so important for our courts to have the benefit of the best possible legal representation on both sides of any case, and especially in cases where we are in uncharted legal and constitutional uh, waters? Yes, thank you, Senator. Um, so I, I've been a judge for a, almost a decade, and what I've learned is that as part of my duty to render decisions consistent with my judicial oath in support of our Constitution and the rule of law, I need to consider all of the arguments related to the dispute that is being brought in my courtroom. I need to hear from not only the parties who are prosecuting a case, for example, a crime, um, but also from the defense. And some of these crimes are terrible crimes. Our Constitution is designed to ensure that the government affords due process to people who are being accused of crimes. And one might think even, it's, it's even more important in, in a way, in a case in which someone is so reviled. It's kind of like the First Amendment. It, it, it's a protection for, um, for unpopular views. Um, it's, it's needed when there's a chance that the government will uh, suppress or, uh, you know, uh, uh, do something that's untoward. And so in the criminal justice system, we have many, many amendments that are designed to make sure that unpopular people, people who are accused of doing terrible things, are still treated fairly by the government. And that's a limitation on government power, which is, the, um, which is the framework of our Constitution. It is about limiting um, government overreach. And so in the criminal justice system, you can imagine, and the framers imagined, a world in which the government would use its authority to deprive people of their liberty. To, to throw people in jail, to lock, lock them up and throw away the key, to not give people the opportunity to make arguments about their freedom. That would be a, a real exercise of government power, government overreach. And so the framers said, what we're gonna do is we are going to put in our foundational documents a protection for people that the government is accusing of crime. And that's not to say that the people are innocent. That's not to say that they haven't done terrible things. What it's about is ensuring that the government does what is required in order to ensure all of our liberty. It protects all of us because there might be someone who, who is innocent and the gov if the government is able to just do whatever it wants in criminal process, we are all at risk. Well, and I think we've all seen cases where that happened. Uh, I, I mentioned to you yesterday that I spent nearly a decade as a prosecutor, especially when I had serious cases, I wanted the best defense attorney possible on the other side. I wanted a case that um, if, if I won, it usually went up on appeal automatically if it carried a heavy penalty. I wanted to be the court, the appellate court, to look at it and say, okay, there were not errors of counsel on either side. And, but I also, as a strong uh, proponent of our Constitution, I think what you're saying is something I totally agree with. We have to have, uh, we have to have the individual's rights protected. It doesn't mean the defense counsel is in favor of of murder or rape or what, uh, armed robbery, but the rights have to be protected. And let me tell you about another area. I've authored and I've long championed the bipartisan John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. I think it would help curtail the uh, 
growing wave of voter suppression sweeping across our country. Again, something we don't have to worry about in Vermont, but unfortunately do in other states. I'm passionate about this legislation. I've always believed that our democracy is stronger when we expand, not shrink, the ranks of our citizens who have fully participated. I believe our democracy goes stronger with your historic nomination and your presence before us today. And I've told you privately how my family members feel about that. Why is it important for our democracy's institutions, courts and all others, to reflect the rich diversity of our nation's citizenry? Thank you, Senator. Um, one of the things we've been talking about is the difference between the judicial branch and the other branches of government. Um, we have three branches in our uh, federal system, and the legislative branch has certain powers, and it can do certain things uh, to ensure that its prerogatives are achieved. And the executive branch has the power of might. They, the, the president controls the military. The judicial branch, its force in our system is the protection of the rule of law, which can only be done by essentially the consent of the governed. It can only be done if people in our society believe, decide, and agree that they're going to follow what it is that courts decide. And so one of the reasons why um, having a diverse judicial branch is important is because it lends and bolsters public confidence in our system. We have a diverse society in the United States. There are people from all over who come to this great nation and make their lives. Um, and when people see that the judicial branch is comprised of a variety of people who are have taken the oath to protect the Constitution and who are doing their best to interpret the laws consistent with that oath, it lends confidence that the rulings that the judge that that the court is uh, handing down are fair and just. That everything has been considered. That no one is being excluded because of a characteristic like race or gender or anything else, and that's that's important. I would also say that um, that it's important from the standpoint of role modeling um, that I have been so touched by the numbers of people who've reached out to me in this period of time to say how much it is meant to their daughters, to their sons, um, to the next generation that I've been appointed um, to nominate it and, and hopefully confirmed. Well, I, I agree with you. I've certainly seen that within my own family. You know, we, we do have areas where we agree on things on this uh, committee. Uh, Judge uh, Senators Grassley and Senator Cornyn, myself and others, believe in uh, transparency as part of our democracy. We've done this with the Freedom of Information Act when we've updated it a number of years. Uh, Senator Cornyn and I have been the key sponsors of, of legislation joined by Senator Grassley and Senator Durbin and others to uh, uh, improve the Freedom Information Act. You've talked about the detailed opinions you've written to try to do the same thing. Uh, I think it's safe to say you believe transparency is central to the duties of a judge. Do you intend to carry that attitude when, and you will, and you will become a member of the U.S. Supreme Court? 
Thank you, Senator. The value of public confidence, um, which I was just discussing, I think is enhanced when the public understands the reasons that a judge renders his or her ruling. One of my mentors used to say, people think the judicial branch is so secretive, but in fact, the judicial branch is the only branch that actually has to tell everyone, <laughs> that actually has to write their opinions and explain why it is that they did what they did. And so I tried, um, I've tried in the nearly 10 years that I've been on, on the bench to make my rulings um, transparent, to explain all of the inputs that I have considered with respect to the case, to lay out the law as I see it in interpreting what, what Congress, for example, has done in a, in, in, with respect to a particular uh, case and what legal provisions that I think are relevant to the dispute, and then to explain my analysis. Why am I granting uh, this motion or denying this claim? And my hope is that it will um, help people to be confident in my reasoning, and even if they disagree with it, they will understand what it is that I think, and I think that's important for uh, public confidence in, in promoting the rule of law. Well, you know, you had talked about your clerking for justice prior and how it opened up doors of opportunity. I remember so well our conversation in my office in the President Pro Tem's office, uh, talking before you these hearings began. Uh, you told me what you thought it meant to your parents and your family, uh, your husband, your daughters, uh, your parents who have been here throughout this, and what it would have meant to your grandparents. You said you were the lucky first inheritor of Dr. King's civil rights legacy. Uh, I keep a daily journal. I wrote that down. Uh, I just... Uh, it means a lot. So <clears throat> let me do this sort of an open-ended question. You patiently answered our questions this week. I told you the reaction in Vermont was disappointment in some that were obviously political. Uh, I heard that from both Republicans and Democrats because they think it should be your legal uh, thoughts in the Supreme Court. So I'd like to give you a, an opportunity to speak directly to the American people, including our little state of Vermont. Is there anything you want to convey to them about what kind of Supreme Court justice you would be if and when you're confirmed? It's all, it's all yours, Your Honor. Thank you, Senator. Um, well, first, let me just address my comments to you in your office, um, which is something that I've said um, in speeches because it speaks to um, who I am and what I value. Um, my parents grew up in Florida under lawful segregation. And what that means is that when they were coming through middle school and high school, um, they were not allowed to go to school with white students. This is um, in the era before uh, and right after the Brown versus the Board decision, there was lawful segregation in places in this country. And it was after that time that Dr. King made his famous comments that people uh, mention uh, about having a dream uh, where people can be judged by the, not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And I then was born in 1970. And the contrast between my reality growing up in Florida 
and my parents' reality growing up in Florida, like night and day in terms of the opportunities that were available to me that weren't available to um, Judge Motley, who is one of my um, role models in, in the law. And so what my being here, I think, is about at some level um, is about the, the progress that we've made in this country in a very short period of time, I would say. It seems like a long time, but one generation, we've gone from, from the reality of my parents' upbringing to the reality of mine. And I do consider myself, having been born in 1970, to be the first generation to benefit from the civil rights movement, from the legacy of all of the work of so many people that went into changing the laws in this country so that people like me could have an opportunity to be sitting here before you today. What I would hope to bring to the Supreme Court um, is very similar to what uh, 115 other justices have brought, which is their life experiences their perspectives, and mine include being a trial judge, being an appellate judge, being a public defender, being a member of the Sentencing Commission, um, in addition to my being a black woman, uh, lucky inheritor of the civil rights dream. And in my capacity as a justice, I would do what I've done for the past decade, which is to rule from a position of neutrality, to look carefully at the facts and the circumstances of every case without any agendas, without any uh, uh, attempt to push the law in one direction or the other, to look only at the facts and the circumstances, interpreting the law consistent with the Constitution and precedents, and to render rulings that I believe and that I hope that people would have confidence in. Thank you. And Chair Durbin, I've had the opportunity to be here. The first justice I got to uh, vote on was John Paul Stevens, nominated by President Gerald Ford proud to vote for him. And uh, it's a long arc, uh, Judge Jackson, but I am so proud of your answers and I appreciate it. Yield back. Thank you, Senator Leahy. Let's take a break for about 15 minutes. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Judge.
questioning will resume. Senator Graham. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good morning, Judge. Sorry. Good morning, good Senator. Morning. I want to comment on the, the last exchange, and Judge, this is not of your making, so it's really not about, about you, but Representative Green, who's a <clears throat> fine man, came up and said that he thought the exchange between you and Senator Leahy at the end about the arc of time and how far we've come as a nation was powerful. I agree. It was powerful. And I guess here's my point I'm trying to make to the American people and to my Democratic colleagues. I wish you had that same attitude when an African-American conservative is appointed to high office in the judiciary. So what happened with Janice Rogers Brown? In 2003, she was an African-American nominee for the D.C. District Court, uh, 54 years old, a little bit older than you, but pretty close. She was the daughter and granddaughter of sharecroppers, a childhood in Alabama under Jim Crow. She was a uh, single mother, a member of the California Supreme Court. Instead of celebrating how far we've come, my Democratic colleagues filibustered her ascension to the D.C. Circuit Court. Because it's well known on our side that we were very much considering her to be the first African-American woman on the Supreme Court. So rather than this wonderful exchange, which was wonderful, Representative Green, where were you and others when there was a wholesale assault on her nomination? Nowhere to be found. The filibuster was used for two years to stop her nomination, and we eventually did the Gang of 14, of which I was a part, so that she could make it through after two years of waiting. This is what the current president said when he was in the Senate, Joe Biden, asking about her, Janice Rogers Brown, being on the Supreme Court. I can assure you that would be a very, very, very difficult fight, and she probably would be filibustered. That's what he said about an African-American conservative nominee by President Bush who had served five years on the California Supreme Court. We're not going to live in America like that any longer. To my Democratic colleagues, if you're a person of color, a woman, supported by liberals is pretty easy sailing. But if you're Miguel Estrada, Janice Rogers Brown, Amy Coma Barrett, on and on and on, your life gets turned upside down. You had nothing to do with that. I just make this observation that when you come up to me and talk about how moving the exchange was, I agree, and I just want to remind you there was somebody else of color, a woman of color, that was picked for the D.C. Circuit, one of the highest courts in the land, that did not meet the same fate. And those days should be over. Uh, do you believe illegal immigrants should be allowed to vote, Judge Jackson? Thank you, Senator. Under our laws, you have to be a citizen of the United States in order to vote. So the answer would be no. It's not consistent with our laws, so the answer is no. Okay, why do they do that in New York? Senator, I'm not aware of the circumstances. Okay, all right, well, that's a good answer. The answer is no. Can an unborn child feel pain at 20 weeks in the birthing process? Senator, I don't know. Are you aware of the fact that anesthesia is provided to the unborn child at that time period if there's an operation to save the baby's life because they can, in fact, feel pain? Are you I, aware of that? I am not aware of that. Well, that may come before you one day, so just keep an open mind. That's the only thing I ask you to do. You said uh, just a bit ago <clears throat> that you apply the law and the facts and call them as you see them. Is that right? That is correct, Senator. Okay, and you look at the statute as the way it's written, and you try to apply it in its plain meaning. Is that correct? That is correct, Senator. Have you heard of a case called uh, Make the Road versus McAleen? Make the Road New York? Yes. Yeah, okay. Make the Road in New York, who are they? Um, Make the Road New York is a nonprofit that 
uh, represents um, various individuals in the sort of immigration law right. field. They're a nonprofit advocacy group for Im immigration issues. <clears throat> Did you know they received large donations from the Arabella Network and from George Source's Open Society Foundation Network? No. Okay. Well, they did. Uh, now, in that case, what was the issue? The issue in that case was a challenge to a change in administration policy concerning um, expedited removal which is a uh, policy that Congress enacted mm -hmm. in order to um, expedite certain removals in the immigration system. Ordinarily, um, before expedited removal. Asylum cases do not fall in this category, right? Well. Trust me on that, because the statute says it doesn't. If a person who could otherwise be subject to expedited removal makes and has a credible fear of torture in their mm -hmm. country, they can be and can they make that determined. Claim? They right. can be determined right. uh, to qualify for regular removal yeah. rather than right. expedited removal. So expedited removal is a creature of Congress, folks. And if you've been here two years or less. The statute, the, the, the statute, I'm sorry, the statute. The statute would allow the administration and office to have expedited removal, avoiding a lot of the, the hurdles that would exist otherwise for people here two years or less. So in the Obama, uh, even Bush years, they did not look at it in terms of applying it to everybody. Some people coming by air got expedited removal, others didn't. The Trump administration decided to use the authority given to it by Congress to remove all eligible cases two years or less under the expedited removal statute. Is that a fair summary? Well, Senator, I would um, say, say it differently. We'll say it differently. All right. Um, the statute that you've put up indicates that Congress is giving the department, it, it says the attorney general, but now it's the department, right. Right. the ability to determine what category of aliens. If you have two years or less. Yeah, but, but, but importantly, um, the authority was it was not Congress saying two years or less. What Congress said is you agency have the authority to determine what category of persons between who, who have been here between zero and 24 months. Which is two be. years. Yeah. No, but what, <laughs> forgive so, me, Senator. I'm just, what I'm trying to explain is that the authority given to the agency was to determine what length they of had time. discretion to make that what, what length of time. It was not the authority to deport everyone who's been here for 24 months. It was the authority to determine what length of time a person has to be here in order to be subjected to expedited removal. Here's what the statute said. The Attorney General, which is actually the DHS Secretary, may apply clauses one and two of this subparagraph to any and all aliens described in subclass two as designated by the Attorney General, actually DHS. Such designation shall be in the sole and unrevealable discretion of the Attorney General and may be modified at any time. Now, I've been in this business for quite a while. What the Trump administration did was to use the discretion given to it by statute in a way different than prior administrations. This advocacy group, the Arabella supported advocacy group, tried to strike it down. You rule for them. Here's what the DC Circuit Court said about your ruling. 
there could hardly be a more definitive expression of congressional intent to leave the decision about the scope of expanded removal within statutory bounds to the Secretary's independent judge, judgment. The forceful phrase, sole and unreviewable discretion, by its exceptional terms. Such designation shall be in the sole and unreviewable discretion of the Attorney General and may be modified at any time. To those of us in the law writing business, I don't know how you could tell a judge more clearly that the administration, the agency in question, has discretion to do certain things within the statute. So this is an example to me, and you may not agree, where the plain language of the statute was completely wiped out by you. You reached a conclusion because you disagreed with the Trump administration, and the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals said, as I've quoted just a minute ago, there could hardly be a more definitive expression of congressional intent to leave the decision about the scope of expedited removal within the statutory bounds to the Secretary's independent judgment. That, to me, is Exhibit A of activism. Let's go back to the child pornography cases. Senator, would you allow me to? Yes, please. Thank you. The statute and the circumstances that you reference are accurate insofar as that is what the statute says. It's not all of it. It doesn't describe the designation process that I was trying to articulate. And uh, it doesn't address the fact that Congress has another statute that is presumptively applied in agency cases to tell agencies how to exercise discretion. There's also DC Circuit case law that says that in addition to having that procedural statute be presumptive, even very clear uh, designations of authority to an agency may still be subject to Congress's Judge, other directions regarding Judge, how to exercise right. the discretion. That argument so, fell on deaf ears. Understood. That's, well, but, that's well, wait, our appellate wait, 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 process. I've got other things I want to talk about. You've given an explanation, but it didn't work. The D.C. Circuit of Court said there could hardly be a more definitive expression of congressional intent. This is good as it gets. There's no way to write a statute saying discretion lies in an agency. It's sole. It's non-reviewable. So you're not convincing me that With this respect, was anything Senator. other than act activism, and we can talk about it all day long, but I, DC, I agree with the D.C. court. This, to me, is an example, Exhibit A, of a judge ignoring limitations placed in the law by Congress to get a result they wanted. Child pornography. Uh, I have no doubt that you find child pornography disgusting as the rest of America. You're a mother. You seem to be a very nice person. Are you aware of how many images are out there on the internet involving children and sexually compromising situations? Senator, I'm not aware of the numbers, but I've seen the images in and, my And there are disgusting, role right? Well, let me tell you the judge. numbers. In 2021, the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children Cyber Tip Line received 29.3 million reports of apparent child sexual exploitation containing 85 million images, videos, and other files. That's in 2021. It's up. In 2019, it was less. So there's an epidemic of this on the internet, that if you go out on the internet, there are millions of pictures of kids being abused. When it comes to sentencing child pornography possession cases, do you routine, routinely discount the fact that a computer was used? Thank you, Senator, for allowing me to address um, this concern. The guidelines related to child pornography mm -hmm. were drafted at a time in which a computer was not used for the majority, if not almost all, of these kinds of horrible crimes. The guidelines have enhancements in them. In two areas that you said you disagree, what are those two areas? 
at the time that the guidelines were drafted, it was a, an aggravating factor, a substantial aggravating factor to use a computer in order to distribute and disseminate the images because the ordinary crime was not committed by computer. So the Would you now agree with me that computers are sort of the venue of choice for child pornographer people? Yes, Senator. Okay, so here's my point. If you believe, as I do, the computer has uh, created a bigger demand, there are more photos out there because of the Internet, more websites uh, exposing this garbage, wouldn't you want to deter people from going down that road? Senator, this crime is among the most difficult. No, answer most my question. Wouldn't you want to deter people from going down the road of using the computer that allows these people to have access to millions of photos because of the technology? I want those people deterred. Senator, so if you're listening to my voice today and you're on a computer looking at child pornography and you get caught, I hope you're in, your sentence is enhanced because the, the computer and the Internet is feeding the beast here, that all these images out there are going to be more over time because people use computers. Now, didn't you also say that the number of images should not be considered as a sentence enhancement? Senator, with respect to the computer, one of the most effective deterrents is one that I imposed in every case and that judges across the country impose in every case, which is substantial, substantial supervision. Any of these wait, wait, wait a minute, Judge. You think it is a bigger deterrent to take somebody who's on a computer looking at sexual images of children in the most disgusting way is to supervise their computer habits versus putting them in jail? No, Senator, I didn't say versus. Well, that's exactly what you said. I think the best way to deter people from getting on a computer and viewing thousands and hundreds and over time maybe millions, the population as a whole, of children being exploited and abused every time somebody clicks on is to put their ass in jail, not supervise their computer usage. Senator, I wasn't talking about um, verses. You just said you thought it was a deterrent to supervise them. I don't think it's a deterrent. I think the deterrent is putting them in jail. Senator, the sentencing have respond? a deterrent component. Senator, would you let her respond? Yes. Does sentencing have a deterrent component? Yes, Senator. Deterrence is one of the purposes of punishment, and uh, Congress has directed courts to consider various means of achieving deterrence. One of them, as you've said, is incarceration. Another, as I tried to mention, was substantial periods of supervision once the person... So if I could, may ask you, in your view, it's more of a deterrent to have somebody substantially supervised in terms of their computer use who's looking at child pornography than it is to put them in jail? Senator, I'm not saying it's more or That's less. That's exactly what you're saying. What, what, I'd, what I'd like to point out is that if we're going to... If... Let me say it this way. Congress has authorized courts to use a number of different means to achieve the purposes of punishment. And one of and them the, is an enhanced punishment by using a computer. The enhancement with respect to using a computer relates to the penalty in terms of Incarceration. And you, and you would choose not to apply that in these cases. You've said that. I'll read you the quote. But you've decided not to apply the use of a computer as an enhancement. You've also said you're not going to hold the number of images that the person has looked at as a sentencing enhancement factor. Is that true? No, Senator. It's not the number of images that the person has looked at because we don't have that information. Well, it is, it is the, the number of images that they've either received or distributed well, that are... Well, that, you don't know, we don't know if they looked at them, but you're not going to hold it against them that they received 10,000 images versus 100. That's not what I've said, Senator. Well, here's what you said. I've decided 
to apply my general policy disagreement respect to those enhancements, at least that is the computers and the number of images. Folks, what she is saying, the reason she's always below the recommendation, I think, uh, is because she doesn't use the enhancements available to her. She takes them off the table. And I think that's a big mistake, Judge. I think that every federal judge out there should make it harder for somebody to go on a computer and view this filth, that if you use that venue, which is the venue of choice for all these child pornography cases, that you use it against them. I think the more you download, like drugs, the more you have, the more you should go to jail. You've made a conscious decision to disregard those two enhancement sentencing factors, and I think that is a wrong way to go in terms of deterrent. To me, putting somebody in jail for using a computer is more of a deterrent to, than supervising their activity of watching the computer. That's just a difference that we have. I know I'm out of time, and uh, listen, I, you've lived an incredible life, but here's one thing that won't happen to you as we wrap this up. How would you feel that if I'd had a letter from somebody accusing you of something, a crime or misconduct for weeks, and I give it to Senator Durbin just before this hearing's over and not allow you to comment on the accusation. How would you feel about that? Senator, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't understand the context of the question. Well, let me, did you watch the Kavanaugh hearings? No, sir. Are you familiar with what happened in the Kavanaugh hearings? Sen Generally. <clears throat> Senator, your time is... Well, please, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so, to be honest, it's a minute and 47 seconds. She filibustered every question I had, and she has a right to give an answer. But I'm trying to make a point in 20 minutes. You were here for Kavanaugh. If she's confused about what happened, some people on the other side had an accusation against Judge Kavanaugh that during high school, uh, he sexually assaulted somebody. And the rest is history. That was known to the people on the other side and never revealed during the meetings they had with Judge Kavanaugh. It was literally ambushed. He was ambushed. How would you feel if we did that to you? Senator, I've appreciated the kindness that each of you has shown me to see me in your offices, to talk with me about but, my approach. But, but my question is, what if it, during our 15-minute exchange, it was very pleasant. You're a very nice person. You have a lot to be proud of. I would never do that to you. If I had some information that's sketchy at best, that somehow you've done something wrong, I promise you, just from human decency, I would share it with you. I would not disclose it at the last minute of the last day of the hearing, and I've already given it to a newspaper so the whole country can read about it before you ever said a word. Senator, she's had nothing to do with the cause. No, but I'm hearing. asking her you about won't, you won't even how, her how she response. may feel about what y'all uh, did. Could we have Senator, order your show? time has expired, and I'm going to give her an opportunity to finally complete an answer. So, can, if I could just address, answer the question. It, 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 Senator, I don't have any comment on what procedures took place in this body regarding What would you think Justice about the Kavanaugh here? Kavanaugh. What I'd like to finish? answer is your points about my sentencings in child pornography cases. The point of the guidelines is to assist judges in determining what punishment to provide in cases. And there are horrible cases but the idea is that between the range of punishment that Congress has prescribed, judges are supposed to be providing proportional punishment based on what a person has done. The, the, the sentencing scheme doesn't place everybody at the same level. The, the point of judging and the guidelines is to look at what has happened in a case compare defendants to each other in terms of what they've done and give proportional pen penalties based... Mr. Chairman, this but, is but, non... Re she, she has said, Mr. Chairman, she does not use sentence enhancements in the area of somebody using a computer for everybody. Can, can I explain why, sir? I'm, I'm going to give her, the witness an opportunity to respond to you, Senator. Finally. At why? the time that the guidelines were created for child pornography. 
this crime was primarily being committed by people who were literally mailing one, two, five, ten, a hundred photos at a time. How's it being committed Could, now? Let, would she please Go let ahead. her complete her answer? Go ahead. As a result, the commission determined in the guidelines that it was a substantial aggravating factor if the facts of the case demonstrated that someone had been distributing hundreds of images. Because what that meant was over this long, maybe it was a long period of time, they had collected one photo at a time, they had amassed it, they had potentially mailed one at a time, and that showed really aggravated, terrible conduct. I'm not saying as a baseline it's not terrible, it's all terrible. But what we're doing is we're differentiating among defendants. So in a world in which the mail is used for the purpose of distribution, it really matters whether the person has distributed one or five or a thousand. And so the guideline says, you know what? We are going to treat a person who's distributed a thousand a lot worse because that shows that this person is really engaged in this really horrible behavior. In comes the internet. On the internet, with one click, you can receive, you can distribute tens of thousands. You can be doing this for 15 minutes and all of a sudden, you are looking at 30, 40, 50 years in prison. Good. Cut. Good. I understand. Absolutely Senator, good. I hope you are. To do good. Allow her to finish, please. I hope you go to jail for 50 years. If you're on the internet trolling for images please. of children and sexual exploitation. So, so you don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a that horrible thing. That's not what the witness said, and she should be allowed to answer this question once and for all. Senator. Senator, all I'm trying to explain is that our sentencing system, the, the system that Congress has created, the system that the Sentencing Commission is the steward of, is a rational one. It's a system that is designed to help judges do justice in these terrible circumstances by eliminating unwarranted disparities, by ensuring that the most serious defendants get the longest periods of time. And when modes of commission of the crime change, such that in two seconds, someone can receive or distribute thousands of images, that's no longer a, and this is what the commission found in their studies, an indicator of a person who, relative to other people, has committed this crime in a more aggravated way. Well, and so I... what we're trying to do is be rational in our dealing with some of the most horrible kinds of behavior. This is what our justice system is about. It's about judges making determinations in meting out penalties to people who have done terrible things. It is not rational to take the venue of choice of child pornographers, the computer that have 85 million images on it and not consider that feeding the beast. We're trying to get people to stop this crap. So when you troll on the internet and you pull down thousands of images of children from the internet, I want you to stop that. I want people to go to jail who do that because you're feeding the beast. We have a bill here, the Earn It Act, that would allow the victims who are on the internet over and over again to sue the, the media companies that provide these images. We have a fundamental dif differences of how you deter crime. I think the best way you deter crime when it comes to child pornography is you lure the bloom on anybody who goes onto the internet and pulls out these images for their pleasure. Senator, every person in all of these uh, charts and documents I sent to jail because I know how serious this crime is. Every person I discussed the harm of these terrible, terrible images to the victims who are portrayed in them. I talked about what this crime does 
to the children who are being abused in these photos and on the other side of their terms of imprisonment, I ensured that they were facing lengthy periods of supervision and restrictions on their computer use so they could not do this sort of thing again. That's what Congress has required of judges, and that's what I did in every case. Uh, you always were under the recommendation of the prosecutor, many times the parole people. And to be honest with you, Judge, a uh, 32-year-old man who sent an image of his own 10-year-old daughter, <clears throat> you substantially reduced the guide, uh, not only the guidelines, but the recommendation. And all I can say is that your view of how to deter child pornography is not my view. I think you're doing it wrong, and every judge who does what you're doing is making it easier for the children to be exploited. If you're on a computer right now looking at a kid in a sexually compromising situation and you get caught, I hope nobody gives you a break because you use the computer. The conduct that's been described is reprehensible, and I think everyone in this room agrees. And the fact of the matter is that I'm co-sponsor of your bill, the Earned Act, and I believe that we should be doing our job here. But part of our job, we have failed in responding to the changing circumstances that face this crime. What has it been, 15 or 16 years? She is currently not an outlier in sentencing. 70% of the federal judges face the same dilemma and wonder why Congress has failed to act and when it will act. This is our fault? Part of, partially it is, Senator. To be honest with you, it is. We have to upgrade these guidelines and decide whether we're going to stick with the Supreme Court decision that they're not mandatory. Senator Feinstein. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman. Um, I would like to compliment the witness. Uh, you've been answering, I think, close to 15 hours worth of questions. And I know how difficult this is and hard it is. But I just want you to say in this senator, know that in this senator's eyes, um, you've handled it very, very well. So thank, thank you, you. And I'll move on uh, to my questions. Congress has recognized how important it is for crime victims to participate in the legal process. And one example is the Crime Victims Rights Act, which I authored with Senator John Kyle in 2004. That law provides certain rights for victims at critical stages of the legal process, the right to be notified, to be present, to be heard, among others. And I understand that in your eight years as a district court judge, you would carefully consider victim impact statements when imposing criminal sentences. Could you tell us a little bit about this and how you considered crime victims in making your sentencing decisions as a judge? Thank you, Senator. Um, as you say, the law provides for victims to have an opportunity to address the judge, to address the court, to explain the harms that happen as a result of criminal behavior. And in the time that I was um, a trial judge, I found it to be a very important part of our criminal justice process because my sentencings um, were about handing down consequences for the behavior that defendants had engaged in and making sure that the defendants who received those consequences understood that they were getting those consequences because of the harm that they had caused. And so what I felt was important for promoting the purposes of punishment, which is what Congress has required of judges to do, is to ensure that the harms were made clear to the defendant in every case. So I had, for example, a case, um, a case involving robbery. There were two, uh, uh, it was a, a single defendant who committed two robberies, one in April and one in September of the same small pharmacy um, in DuPont Circle, which is not, not far from here. It's a small independent pharmacy selling um, uh, pharmaceuticals, and this person 
decided that he was going to rob the pharmacy of their um, uh, oxycodone and other kinds of prescription drugs for sale. That's a sort of standard scenario that we see in the federal system. But what was so um, particularly egregious in this case is that this defendant was so bold in his robberies, he came in in April with a gun. He held the employees hostage, essentially, forcing them to open the safe with the drugs in it at gunpoint, stole the drugs, not masked, not hiding his identity. And this is pre-COVID, so we're not talking about having to have a mask. He was a robber, plain and simple, with no fear of people identifying him. And then in the period between April and September, he would come back to the pharmacy. He would loiter outside on the street. This is according to the victims. They would see him looking in the window. Once or twice, he came inside looking like he was going to buy something and staring them down. And they knew who he was and they called the police and they weren't able to uh, you know, apprehend him because he hadn't really done anything at that point. Um, and the people who worked in the pharmacy were terrified and they were terrified by that behavior, uh, the menacing nature of it. By the time we get to September, he actually comes in and they think maybe this is another time when he's just loitering, but no, he pulls out a gun. He hops over the counter. He assaults one of the, uh, uh, people who are working there and steals the drugs again. And that time they were able to call the police in enough time for them to come and apprehend him. So at his trial, uh, excuse me, he did not try. He, he, he didn't go you're to trial. The, you're the judge. I'm the judge. He pled guilty to this behavior, which was well documented. There was no uh, defense that it wasn't him. But the guidelines in the case and the statutes that applied, um, said because he used the gun, he was supposed to get something like seven years. And I used the victim's statements to first of all, explain to him how he had terrorized the people. Their statements said, thing. One, one woman said, I can't work at the pharmacy anymore because I am so fearful that this guy will come back. It's changed my whole life. It was a whole set of really horrible circumstances that I read to him at his sentencing so that he could understand what he'd actually done. And then I sentenced him above the requirement uh, of the law because I thought it was warranted to make clear to him that this was a terrible, terrible thing that he had done to these people. So the victim's statements were really important because they explained to me and to him the consequences of his behavior, but beyond just how many drugs he stole or the fact that he used a, gun, used a gun. They were the real life circumstances that resulted from his behavior and it was important for him to understand that. I, I've listened to most all of this testimony, which I think now you've gone on for over 15 hours. And I just want to say that um, I, I think you have a stamina <laughs> and a very good brain and a real sense of empathy has been communicated to me in these 15 hours. And I want you to know that. Um, one of the things that I'm concerned about is that the public perception of the Supreme Court has turned increasingly negative over the last few years. A recent Pew Research Survey found that 44% of adults have an unfavorable view of the Supreme Court. Less than three years ago, that number was 30% of adult, adults that held that view. And I understand that as a judge on the DC bench, you have frequently accepted invitations to speak at public events in the hopes of giving the public more information about the judicial process and more conf confidence in the outcome. So here's the question. Why do you think there's been a decline in the public's perception of the court? And if you are confirmed, how would you strive to improve the public's confidence in the court 
and its decisions. Thank you, Senator. I, I think that public confidence in the court is very important. It is, um, it's crucial to the rule of law that the public believe in the judicial process um, and therefore choose to accept the rulings of the courts, not just the Supreme Court, but all, all of the courts. It's part of the way our process works. And I think that um, I have taken that to mean in terms of my role as a judge, um, that uh, outreach to the public to explain what it is that we do, um, to inspire, uh, hopefully, law school students and high school students, um, young lawyers in, in law firms and elsewhere, um, to think about careers in the judicial branch or think about careers in law um, as one of the ways that I have attempted to try to uh, shore up uh, public confidence. And if I'm confirmed, I would um, plan to continue uh, as best as I can um, to, to, to do that kind of thing, because as you say, it, it's very important for the public to understand the work of the court and to follow um, follow its pronouncements concerning the law. Earlier, you, when you and I spoke in my office, we discussed some of the people who have mentored you throughout your career. And one of those was Judge Patty Saris. You served as a law clerk for her on the Massachusetts District Court, I believe, early in, in your career and you've spoken publicly about the role she has played as a mentor in your legal career. You have described her as, quote, a consensus builder, a good listener, a careful speaker, the essence of judicial temperament, end quote. So would you share with all of the members here more about how Judge Saris's approach to judging and her mentorship have shaped you and your career? If you give some of the specifics, yes. I think everybody would be interested. Thank you, Senator. As I reflect on um, her mentorship and also the mentorship of my other two judges, it's very interesting because I think I learned um, maybe different things from each of them. Uh, Judge Saris, who was my first um, clerkship, you're, you're correct. It, she uh, serves on the District Court of Massachusetts, which is the trial level court, um, I learned how to look at the facts in a case from Judge Saris. Um, that's part of what the trial court level does. We, uh, as trial judges, um, develop the record in a case, take testimony, have trials, and she is extraordinary at um, developing a record and making sure that all of the relevant facts are um, adduced from the witnesses and considered in the context of her trial uh, and, and record responsibilities. And so that, I, I think, is something that I learned from her in terms of the law and her warmth and uh, care for her law clerks meant that she has been a lifelong mentor to me. Um, and ironically, she became the chair of the Sentencing Commission um, after I had been on the Sentencing Commission. So we worked together um, later in, in my career. Um, so I often use that story to tell young people, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Um, someone who you worked for at some point might be your colleague down the line. Well. Let me just one more. Uh, you've handled a large number of cases during your career, both as an advocate and a judge. As an advocate, you've worked on a very wide variety of cases, uh, from work for corporate clients during your time in private practice to your work for low-income clients during your service as a federal public defender. And during your nine years as a federal judge, you've written nearly 600 opinions. 
I think that's really quite a sterling record. And I imagine that some of the cases have really stuck with you. And so I would like you, uh, if you can, uh, to talk a little bit about some of the cases, maybe one or two, that you've had that have made a deep impression and have really uh, enabled you to progress as you have. Thank you, Senator. Um, well, as you say, I have handled a lot of cases uh, in my time, nearly decade on the bench, and, and you learn something in almost every case in some respect. Um, if you're doing your job right and you're looking into all of the issues, um, I think there might be, I, I'd mention one uh, from sort of a few years into my service as a trial judge. I handled a case, um, Yakai versus Napper. Um, and the case involved trademark infringement. And you would ordinarily think that trademark infringement uh, charges are dry and technical. Um, and, and what I learned from this case is that even, um, even areas of the law that you might think apply only to businesses um, and impact real people uh, at times. So this case involved a, a small community, a cultural community um, of people who believe in uh, vegan lifestyles. Um, they call themselves the African Hebrew Israelites, but it's not a religious community. It's a cultural community around um, a healthy living. And they have created a restaurant and a series of restaurants here in the Washington, D.C. area um, uh, with menus involving really, um, I'm told, terrific uh, vegan foods. And in this community, there was a, a member who was the one who created the recipes and who was responsible for the restaurant. The whole community had other aspects to it. He ended up um, falling out with the community and the dispute involved his actions essentially taking over the restaurant and reopening it by himself using the same name. The restaurant was called Everlasting Life, which was a um, important phrase for this community. And he essentially ejected the other members because he was the leaseholder or he had signed the lease on behalf of the community. And he kicked them out for a day and then he reopened the restaurant using the same name. And so the question was under the Lanham Act, which is the statute for trademark violations, the question is whether there is a potential for confusion um, in, in that sort of uh, circumstance. But ordinarily, um, I see Senator Coons <laughs> nodding. Ordinarily, um, when you have a trademark infringement, you're talking about two different businesses who have very similar products. And the question is, you know, are they similar enough to um, cause confusion? Because the idea of the law is that people should be able to um, have products that are identified with them and, the, and you shouldn't be confused. And in this case, we had a bench trial about it, but it was pretty clear. Um, I was the fact finder as the judge. It was pretty clear that when you um, open the same business with the same name, using the same uh, recipes and food, that you have created this kind of problem that is a trademark violation. Um, but what was so interesting to me about the case, in addition to the fact that I got to be the fact finder, it was a bench trial, was that we had witnesses come in who testified about their, the circumstances. This was a very small community, and they all knew each other. And the testimony about what it meant to them to have one of their members ejected in this way and then have him turn on them was very, very moving in the courtroom. So even though we were talking about this kind of arcane area of the law, it was real circumstances that were happening. Well, stop for a minute. Because yes. I, I think you're a very important addition to the court. And what I'm trying to fathom out from the hearing 
is what kind of judge will she be? How will we look at her in five or six years? And so what I really want to ascertain is what kind of a judge you will be. What will be the principles you hold dear and how will you function in this capacity? If you could just answer that one question, I've been waiting for it yes. for about 15 hours, so <laughs> I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Well, I, I would hope to be the kind of judge that I have been um, during this last decade. I have been the kind of judge who understands that it's my responsibility to rule neutrally, to not um, have any agenda when I'm looking at a case. I've been the kind of judge who understands that facts matter, facts like the ones that I was just describing, and that it's important for a judge to take into account and be able to understand the arguments of all of the different parties and participants. And I've, I've been the kind of judge who takes my responsibility to not be a policymaker, to try to understand and ascertain the will of Congress if it's a statute or um, to, to, to hew to my own, um, I've been saying stay in my lane, um, to not exert my authority beyond uh, the, what the Constitution requires when I'm interpreting and applying the law. I, I think I've been the kind of judge who lives up to the oath in terms of being fair and impartial, um, ruling without fear or favor, and um, ruling consistent with, with Article Three. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Feinstein. Senator Cornyn? Good afternoon, Judge. I understand I'm the last one, maybe before lunch. So if your uh, blood sugar is getting a little <laughs> low, uh, you can think about uh, having a little break. But um, just because um, the chairman keeps bringing this topic up, let me just ask you uh, one question. When you accuse somebody of a crime, are you calling them a criminal? Oh, Senator, I haven't accused anybody of a crime. That's not my question. When, when in common understanding and in plain English, if you accuse someone of a crime, are you accusing them of being a criminal? I, it depends on the context. It depends on what else you say about them. It depends on the circumstances. It depends on the circumstances. Yes. So you put this in the cat same category as defining what a biological woman is? No, I'm You're just... You're really not sure? I, I didn't say I wasn't sure. I said it depends but, on the so circumstances. So you are sure? No, I said it depends on the circumstances that, that you're positing as to whether or not you're calling someone a criminal. I just don't think that's credible, Judge. Let me ask you another question. You, you talk about the... Um, public confidence in the courts, in our institutions, which I agree are very, very important, that the public has confidence in our, in our judiciary. Would you agree with me that to the extent that people perceive that judges, unelected lifetime tenured judges, are making policy pronouncements or political decisions, that it undermines public confidence? I do. Thank you. Yesterday, we talked a little bit about uh, precedent. And uh, I know Senator Feinstein, as she does uh, in these hearings, talked about super precedent, and in particular, uh, Roe versus Wade. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about that. But first, let me just ask you, do you think there's any good reason for the Supreme Court not to overrule a previous decision when they've concluded that that decision was wrong? Thank you, Senator. Um, I, again, it's, it's hard for me to answer that question in the abstract. It, um, w what I'll say is that the Supreme Court has laid out factors beyond just the precedent being wrong as a reason to overturn it. Well, we talked a little bit about this yesterday. The, the Supreme Court 
revisited the issue of separate but equal, which was the law, the constitutional interpretation of the Supreme Court under Plessy versus Ferguson, um, and overruled that precedent because yes. it concluded it was wrong, right? I haven't looked carefully at the whether all of the different factors that the Supreme Court now uses to overturn were discussed in the opinion. But now the, the Supreme Court's precedent is to overturn on the basis of a number of different factors and not just whether or not it's wrong. So are you suggesting that the Supreme Court could not or would not overrule a precedent that it determined was wrongly decided? No, I'm suggesting that the Supreme Court's case law indicates that it looks at multiple factors. No, I understand. You go through the stare decisis analysis, yes. right? Yes. But if it's wrong, that's one of the factors that uh, you consider, right? Yes, but it's not the only one. So are you suggesting that there may be circumstances under which the court determines its previous decision is wrong, but it will not overrule it? The fact that there are multiple factors indicates that the court looks at more than whether or not it's wrong. Okay. So the fact, so you would say, if I'm interpreting you correctly, that if they, the court concludes its previous decision is wrong, it won't necessarily overrule that. It applies a multi-point analysis. I, yes, I think that's okay. accurate. Back when uh, Roe versus Wade was decided in 1973, generally speaking, the the, um, the court said that the states may not limit access to abortion pre-viability, but post-viability, there could be some restriction on the right to abortion. Is that generally the... As a general matter, yes. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, um, and then um, I think it's since uh, 1973, the question of viability has risen again, what that actually means, uh, because now um, viability was around 28 weeks, that is, the fetus could live outside the womb, but today, because of the advances in medical science, the fetus can live outside the womb after about 23 weeks. Is that your understanding? Senator, I haven't studied this, so I, I don't know the, the um, a number of weeks in the way that you're okay. saying. Well, let's, let's talk a little bit about viability. Um, the line that was drawn uh, for pre-viability and post-viability analysis by the courts. Um, what does viability mean when it comes to an unborn child, in your understanding? Senator, I hesitate to speculate. I don't, I know that it is a point in time that the court has identified in terms of uh, when uh, the standards that apply to regulation of the right. Justice Brennan, at a later point in his career on the Supreme Court, admitted that the viability line was an arbitrary line. Do you agree with, agree with him? Senator, I'm not able to comment on um, viability. There is a, a case pending in the Supreme Court right now concerning the issues. Of I'm asking you about previous decisions, but I, I, I hear you. Um, no one suggests that a 20-week-old fetus can live independently outside the mother's womb. Do they? I, I don't know. I mean, you need, the child will need to be fed or sheltered and all the other essentials to sustain human life. Um, so there's no suggestion that after 20 weeks that a child can be, live independently, correct? Senator, I'm, I'm not a biologist. I haven't studied this. I don't know. Um, you don't know what? whether a... An unborn child could live outside the womb at 20 weeks gestation? What I know is that the Supreme Court has um, tests and standards that it's applied when it evaluates regulation of the right 
of a woman to terminate their pregnancy. Um, they have a, uh, the court has announced um, that there is a right to terminate uh, up to the point of viability subject to the framework in Roe and Casey. And there's a pending case right now that right. is addressing these issues. The Constitution doesn't mention the word abortion, correct? That's correct. Just like it doesn't mention the word marriage, correct? That is correct. And um, so as you and I discussed, uh, perhaps ad nauseum yesterday, uh, when we were talking about substantive due process, this is one of those unenumerated rights that the court has created, court made doctrine or law, um, and creating a constitutional right, even though it's not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution itself. Correct? The court has interpreted the due process clause of the 14th Amendment to include... Right. We talked about substantive due process yesterday, um, and that's, that's what this is, right? The Supreme Court cases that deal with the right of abortion is a result of substantive due process analysis like you and I talked about yesterday? Um, yes. Okay. In the, um, you remember when you were confirmed for the uh, Court of Appeals, uh, in that process there was, we had a hearing, mm -hmm. and then we sent you questions for the record, what we call QFRs around here. Yes. And uh, one of those, uh, question number 10, was does the Constitution protect rights that are not expressly enumerated in the Constitution. As part of your answer, you said, you mentioned Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey, and you've said this, and I'll quote, they articulate a limited right to terminate a pregnancy. What is the limitation that you understand that was uh, pronounced in Roe versus Wade and Casey when it comes to a right to terminate an abortion? What are the limitations under current law? Under current law, as I understand it, um, there are uh, um, limitations in so far as um, there can be regulation of that right pre-viability um, unless the regulation imposes an undue burden on the exercise of the right, and there can be regulation after viability um, as, as long as there's exception for the health, um, the health and I think maybe life of the mother. Um, so it's the, the limitations are about whether and to what extent um, the government can regulate the right. Is it your understanding under the current precedent of the Supreme Court that um, there is a right to abortion up to and including the time of uh, delivery of the child? Senator, I don't, um, I don't know, actually. I mean, I, the Supreme Court in every case is looking at individual regulations of the government related to um, related to individual rights. And um, I am not aware of the court having made a pronouncement about whether or not regulation can come up, can, can extend all the way up until birth. I'm just not a, a aware of that. And that it's because the court is looking at individual cases and making its rulings in the context of individual cases and not making um, sort so, of pronouncements in general. So you are suggesting that in some individual case, um, the right to abortion could extend through the entire pregnancy up until the time the child is delivered? No, Senator, I'm suggesting that I'm not aware of any case that's handled the issue.
you uh, you told us that uh, you think that uh, you believe Roe versus Wade and Casey are precedents, and we talked a little bit about some of the questions about whether it's a super precedent and the like. Uh, are you familiar with the um, Supreme Court's decision in the Heller case? I am. And that was a decision by the United States Supreme Court that uh, recognized the individual right to keep and bear arms under the Second Amendment, correct? Yes. Um, is that a precedent of the court? Uh, it is. And um, you would respect that precedent? Yes, Senator. All precedents of the Supreme Court have to be respected. Is it, as, is it, as, uh, is it equivalent in terms of its precedents? to Roe versus Wade, or would you evaluate it differently? I'm not aware of any ranking or grading of precedents. All precedents of the Supreme Court are entitled to respect uh, on an equal basis. I, I agree with you. Um, that's why it kind of blows my mind when people talk about super precedents, as if somehow one precedent was uh, different in terms of its significance or priority in, under the Constitution than others. Um, in the short period of time I have remaining, let me just revisit with you some of the questions we talked about yesterday with, regarding, with regard to uh, free exercise of religion. Um, and of course, that's recognized explicitly under the United States Constitution, the First Amendment, correct? Yes. Okay. Are you familiar with the uh, cases that had been litigated before the Supreme Court of the United States involving the Little Sisters of the Poor with regard to the um, Affordable Care Act mandate on contraception coverage? Yes. Okay. Now, the Little Sisters of the Poor, a benevolent group of nuns, I think there are about 300 of them that take care of elderly and infirm individuals. And of course, as a matter of their religious beliefs as documented in the court's opinions, uh, they don't believe in either uh, contraception or abortion. Do you agree with that? I believe that was described in the case that you're talking about. I think that's right, too. Yes. Yeah. And so when the Affordable Care Act mandated that every health insurance policy contain coverage for contraception, or chemically induced abortions, um, they objected and said that this uh, violated their conscience and their free exercise of religion rights under the First Amendment, right? I believe so, yes. Well, after the, after the Obama administration during the Trump administration, the Trump administration expanded the regulations to allow not only churches, but also religious organizations like the Little Sisters of the Poor, a waiver from that contraception and an abortion-inducing abortion drug mandate. Do you recall that? Yes. Have you, are you familiar with the fact that uh, President Biden, excuse me, yeah, President Biden has said he would restore uh, the previous regulation and uh, that was promulgated under the Obama administration and exclude um, organizations like the Little Sisters of the Poor from that waiver potential for abortion drugs or contraception coverage? I am not aware of that, Senator. Okay. Well, I guess what, what all this boils down to, you know, Congress passed a bill called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which tried to make sure that people's sincerely held religious beliefs could be accommodated under their First Amendment rights, as opposed to Congress mandating things that would violate their conscience and violate their religious beliefs. Uh, do you agree with me that it's important to accommodate uh, the sincerely held religious beliefs of all Americans when it comes to uh, legislation that the Congress may pass? Thank you, Senator. Uh, Religious freedom is a core foundational constitutional right. It's, um, it's in the First Amendment of the Constitution and uh, reflects the Founding Fathers' um, uh, 
um, understanding of uh, this country as being one that is based on, uh, in large part, the idea of pluralism, the idea that people can come and have uh, sincerely held religious beliefs and practice them uh, without persecution. That's part of the foundational um, foundation foundation of our of our government and and the amendment that you're uh, discussing. And as a result, um, there that right is protected in in many ways. You mentioned the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Right. Um, Congress has enacted a statute that when it comes to federal regulation, um, um, if there's a substantial burden placed on religion, um, then the strict scrutiny um, standard applies. I, I agree. I have one minute, so I have one more yes. question. I agree with what you just said. Yes. So since I have... Um, asked this question or made this point of some of your predecessors who sat in the same chair and expressed my concern about some of the court's establishment law, um, establishment jurisprudence. Um, I want to, I don't want to leave you out um, of that concern. When I was uh, attorney general of Texas, I had a chance to argue a case in front of the United States Supreme Court and call it Santa Fe Independent School District versus uh, Doe. Uh, this was a lawsuit brought by the ACLU, which sought to enjoin or prevent a student-led prayer before football games at the Santa Fe Independent School District right outside of Houston. In the end, five judges said that that violated um, the Establishment Clause of the Constitution, causing Chief Justice Rehnquist to write in his dissent that the Constitution mandates neutrality toward religion, not hostility but that the court's decision evidenced hostility towards religious expression, leaving me to conclude that the public square, we can talk about everything from violence to misogyny uh, to sex, you name it, but we can't talk about religious, sincerely held religious beliefs. I would just uh, footnote that for you and uh, plant the seed um, for what it's worth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Cornyn. Welcome to the Majority Leader Schumer. Glad you're with us. Uh, and he would report, if he could, that we have a challenge to finish our hearing today at a time when we can go to the floor for a series of votes, which will end the day. So we want to stick to the schedule as much as we possibly can. Uh, I will just say that um, Senator <coughs> Cornyn's suggestion of lunch was aspirational. Okay. <laughs> it was an unenumerated right. You're in charge of the agenda, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> what we had hoped to do was to take three more senators before we have an actual lunch. Well, but it's up to you. Is that all right? Oh, whatever you want to do. I, I'm, I'm open in here, happy to answer whoever would like to ask me a question. Thank you. I appreciate that. Senator Whitehouse. Thank you, Chairman. Judge Jackson, you can um, relax for a bit. I... <laughs> voted for you for the D.C. Circuit, and when you appeared as a potential nominee, we started doing work, looking at your record and your story. We met with the president to discuss his uh, process and his goals. Um, when your nomination was announced, we obviously brought the work on your record more into focus, and now I've had the chance over, what, 15, 16 hours to see your performance in this hearing, which I think sets the gold standard for patience and courtesy. Um, so I'm prepared to not only support you, but to let you know that I will be very proud <laughs> and very honored and very excited uh, to support you. Um, there are two things that have come up during the course of the hearing, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to take my time to have a chance to respond to. And the first has been a question, you know, I've been through a bunch of these now. I don't think I've ever heard it come up so much. Questions about the nominee's judicial philosophy. I didn't know you needed to have one. 
I actually thought that when you're dealing with the Constitution, your oath of office, the constitutional precedents, and the Constitution itself kind of gave you your guide path. And when you're construing statutes, the law and the conventions of the language and your logic gave you that path. So the fact that Judge Jackson has said, I don't have a judicial philosophy, I've got a judicial methodology, doesn't bother me a bit. In fact, it kind of bothers me the expectation that a nominee to the Supreme Court should have a judicial philosophy. Because a judicial philosophy can be a screen for a predisposition that judges, frankly, should not have, but that folks and powers and interests influential in the process may very well want them to have. So, you know, when I think about judicial philosophy, one of them that's come up a lot has been originalism. And one of the problems with the judicial philosophy is um, occasional adherence, selective adherence, which in my mind makes it less of a judicial philosophy and more of a doctrine of convenience to be trotted out when it helps the people that you want to help. And originalism strikes me as being that kind of a doctrine. And the place where I think we have the biggest gap between philosophy and practice in all of this has been with respect to what I've witnessed <laughs> with respect to corporate power in our democracy in the time that I have been in the Senate. If you go back to the founding days, there was no expectation that corporations would have any role in American democracy, nil. Doesn't turn up in the uh, constitutional debates, doesn't turn up in the arguments leading up to the approval of the Constitution. It's only when corporations became big and powerful many decades later that they began to intrude in our politics and they corrupted our politics in a terrible way, history shows. And that led to the movement by muckrakers, whose probably best leader was Teddy Roosevelt, to knock down the grasping political power of corporations and rein them in. And we had some real victories at that time, but ambitions of those of great wealth and power do not go away, and they have continually crept forward. Um, it's an age-old story. And right now, we have corporate power controlling this Congress in a way that is really remarkable. We have a complete inability to address the climate havoc that fossil fuel emissions are creating because half of Congress has been disarmed and disabled by political influence of the fossil fuel industry. We can't even have a reasonable and sensible discussion on it because the power of that industry is so great. And we've seen that manifested first with Republican justices on the Supreme Court letting corporations into politics. That was an interesting invention. And then once they were in, they let them spend money in politics. And then once they let them spend money in politics, they let them spend unlimited money in politics. And now we are looking at a court whose majority is in the process of building a right for corporations, the biggest and most powerful corporations that we have, to not only get into politics, spend money in politics, and spend unlimited money in politics, but to spend unlimited money in politics anonymously, to hide from the real voters, the we the people, who they actually are when they're intervening in our politics, and to play this game through phony front groups with ridiculous names. Rhode Islanders for peace and puppies and prosperity, you know, sort of the quality of the name that's involved. So let's not get too excited about judicial philosophy if it's nothing more than a screen for a predisposition that will benefit certain players in the arena. And let's certainly not take judicial philosophy too seriously when it evaporates 
in the face of the interests that have pushed the philosophy. And I think originalism qualifies that way, and I just wanted to say that. I don't think you have to have a judicial philosophy. I think you have to have integrity. I think you have to have a judicial temperament. But a philosophy? Where has that come from? The second thing I want to say has to do with the question of court packing and the integrity of the court. And I have a position on this, and I just want to say it. So it's all clear, and nobody's reading things into it that I don't believe, and I've had a chance to make my, my point here. And that is that court packing can be done by adding new seats to the court. I haven't proposed that. I think there's only one member in the Senate that has proposed that. It's gotten a lot of attention here, but I don't think it's been proposed here. But you can also pack a court by picking the justices. And in fact, there is a long, unpleasant American tradition of agencies being taken over by virtue of picking the members. It's called agency capture or regulatory capture. It goes back a long way. There is an abundant literature, both in economics and in administrative law, about capture. And there's nothing that makes a court immune to capture. That is why, when I talked about this in my initial remarks, I said that the folks that have tried to capture the court have treated it no different than a 19th century railroad commission, because they were legendary for having been captured by picking the members who would rule for the railroad. And there are many others. Go back to MMS in the Gulf oil explosion. So that is my concern. My concern is that the picking of the justices has been handed to special interests. And we know that's the case because, as I showed yesterday, everybody involved admitted it. The President of the United States said so. The co-founder of the Federalist Society said so. The former chairman of this committee said so. And the President's legal counsel said so. And what happened in that process by which the justices were picked over at the Federalist Society? We don't know. There wasn't a poll that was taken of Federalist Society members saying, you know, give us your, your recommendations. I don't know that there was any meeting of the board. Let's take this up. Let's go through a proper agenda. What appears to have happened is that people went into a back room and there was wheeling and dealing and millions and millions of dark money dollars flowed into the Federalist Society during this period and what came out were names. And those went straight to the president and straight to here. But the picking appears to have been done in the confines of a private organization by anonymous special interests. There is no country in the world that does that by way of how you pick judges. If we went to some banana republic to try to educate them in democracy, and that was the way they picked their judges, we'd have a lot to say about it. But that is the way that recent justices have been picked. Court packing by court picking. And deputizing this to the Federalist Society is very unusual. Them having no process, no public process for implementing that deputization is very unusual. The provenance of these mysterious lists that were produced and how people got on and off them, that is very unusual, unprecedented in our history. And it's surrounded by lots and lots of dark money. $400 million, I think, is a lot of anonymous money that has been chronicled being spent to control who gets put on the court. And controlling who gets put on a governmental body is how you capture a governmental body. And a captured governmental body is a wrong thing whether it's a railroad commission or the United States Supreme Court. There is, in that method of judicial selection, not just the 
prospect of impropriety, but indeed the likelihood of impropriety. If it's pay to play and checks for millions anonymously delivered will get you into the room to decide who is going to be on the Supreme Court, we got a problem. And that's what happened. And the thing that makes it even worse, in my view, is that as you pursue this and play it out, you see the decisions of the court line up in an astonishingly clear pattern with the interests of big Republican dark money donors. That is my concern. That, I think, is a legitimate concern. If you disagree with me, disagree with me. But that is the concern, and I wanted to lay it out here because it's not about court packing. It's about the integrity of the court, and it's about the unfortunate comparison that can be made now between the captured agencies delivered through picking of their membership and what looks more and more like a captured court delivered by the picking of its membership in secret with a very, very high ticket price to be in the room where the picking took place. So, like I said, colleagues can agree, colleagues can disagree. With We all have our shots to make our cases. Because this has come up tangentially in multiple different ways, I wanted to take this moment and lay out what my case is and explain it as clearly and simply as I can. And I thank uh, the chairman for allowing me that opportunity. And I yield back my uh, remaining seven minutes. And I uh, congratulate your Honor, you for the patience that you've shown with all of us. It's not over, but it's close. Thank you, Senator. Thank you, Senator Whitehouse. And of course, you've joined the Hall of Fame yielding back seven minutes. Senator Lee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Judge. I want to talk next a little bit about uh, a case that you were involved in, a case called Coal River Mountain Watch versus United States Department of the Interior. Uh, it was decided, uh, uh, a, a ruling that you issued in 2015 uh, while in the federal district court. Um, I know you've handled a lot of cases. I have. I, I can't, can't imagine that by merely triggering the, uh, the case name that would necessarily bring it back. But this case involved uh, a, a challenge to an administrative action within the Department of Interior on some issues bearing on coal mining uh, within the state of West Virginia. There were two parallel challenges brought against that administrative action. One in a federal district court in West Virginia, uh, where the land in question was located, and another in the U.S. District Court for the District of Columbia, where you sat. Uh, the, the government defending itself against that action brought by uh, uh, some environmental groups um, asked that you dismiss the, uh, the D.C. case so that the matter could be litigated in West Virginia. D you denied that. Can you, uh, based on my description of the facts, does that ring any bells? And can you tell me why you might have denied it? Thank you, Senator. It actually doesn't. It sounds like, um, you know, dozens of cases that I handled with similar um, issues and requests. Yeah. Something like a motion to dismiss is early in the sure. action. Sure. And so denying a motion to dismiss is pretty routine um, in oh, the I, District of Columbia. I, I understand. And I'm, I'm sure you handled a lot of those, um, uh, a lot of those all the time as a district judge. Uh, the reason I raise it is just because it, it, it relates indirectly to uh, some concerns that I've got uh, that, that are somewhat unique to the Western United States. Um, we have a lot of cases that involve the U.S. Department of the Interior mm -hmm. and agency actions taken relative to the public land that we have. In every state east of Colorado, the federal government owns less than 15 percent of the land. In most of those, it's much less than 15 percent. In the single digits, we're low single digits. In every state, Colorado and west of Colorado, the federal government owns more than 15 percent of the land, and most of the time it's a lot more. In my state, it happens to be about two-thirds of the land that's owned by the federal government. As a result, it complicates our ability to do just about everything we do, whether it's recreation, construction, oil and gas development, whether it's just accessing people's farms and ranches, um, uh, uh, or even something as, as simple as uh, trying to fund local 
uh, fire, police, search and rescue operations. All these things are affected by the excessive ownership of, of federal land by the federal government and the way it's often managed. Sometimes uh, decisions made at the federal level are challenged in parallel actions like these. Uh, one in the, in the forum state, in the host state to where the action is happening, another in D.C. And I'm always concerned about forum shopping. And I'm sure that's something you watched out for uh, as a judge and saw forum shopping from time to time. It's also something that, uh, you know, touches on a, an issue that uh, involves statutory interpretation. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's something called the Antiquities Act, passed uh, 110 years ago or so, designed to give presidents of the United States the authority to designate federal parcels of federal land as national monuments. The text of the statute states that the limits of the parcels in question uh, should be, quote, confined to the smallest area compatible with the proper care and management of the objects to be protected. Now, given that these uh, presidential proclamations um, uh, tend to be broad, um, it's sometimes um, the objects to be protected are also broad. And as a result of that, uh, it's difficult to tell what the limits are. Do you have any reaction as to how we could discern that, how we could define any meaning out of that? It's got to mean something. The text of the statute, you, 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 you try not to leave language uh, simply unaddressed or meaningless in a statute. Do you have any thoughts on how a statute like that, saying that it should be confined to the smallest area compatible with the proper care and management of the objects to be protected? Any thoughts briefly on that? Um, well, Senator, um, if I were presented with a case with that statute in that circumstance, I would proceed as I always have. Um, you would have to understand the party's arguments about uh, the particulars in the case, what, what does the presidential proclamation say, to what does it relate, um, whether there are any precedents in this area that define, further define or further address what Congress intended with respect to the statute at issue. And I would assume that it would also matter if the, if the government's lawyers defending the president's action made an argument that would leave the, uh, the interpretation open-ended and meaningless. Well, as part of your interpretive exercise, um, as you're considering uh, the party's various arguments, one that did not account for all the words in a statute would be one that you would um, Excellent. might Excellent. not it, it, <laughs> might it, not agree with. No, I, I get it. And, and this is one of the things that I've appreciated about what you've told us in these hearings. I, I, I really like uh, the way you've described the fact it's important to construe uh, the text that you're asked to interpret. And in interpreting that, you look at the language and you're, you're endeavoring to figure out the original public meaning. And um, I, I, I think that is a, a very helpful thing. All right, let's uh, move to a different issue uh, a moment ago. Now, you, you clerked on the U.S. Supreme Court for Justice Breyer in October term 1999. Is that right? That is right. That was the, the same, and you clerked for Justice Breyer. I did. Uh, and that was the same year that the Supreme Court issued its decision in a case called Stenberg versus Carhartt. This is the case where the Supreme Court of the United States struck down a Nebraska law prohibiting partial birth abortion. Uh, and uh, in the absence of circumstances uh, uh, where the baby posed a threat to the life of the mother. Uh, now, to be clear, the, the law prohibited a procedure where the uh, abortionist causes an unborn baby to be partially delivered by the mother, and then the abortionist intentionally kills the baby outside the womb by puncturing its skull with scissors and then collapsing the skull. Uh, this is gruesome, and I, I, I don't like having to quote this, but the, it is relevant to the topic we're covering here. Justice Kennedy described it this way in chilling terms when he, in his dissent, when he, he describes the fact that when scissors are inserted into the back of the head, the fetus's body wholly outside the woman's body and alive reacts as though startled and then goes limp. Justice Scalia, in his great eloquence, um, uh, expressed um, 
uh, lamented the ruling, but also expressed optimism for the fact that future courts would get it right, saying, quote, I'm optimistic enough to believe that one day Stenberg versus Carhartt will be assigned to its rightful place in the history of this court's jurisprudence beside Korematsu and Dred Scott. This method of killing a human child, one cannot even accurately say an entirely unborn human child prescribed by this statute is so horrible that the most clinical description of it evokes a shudder of revulsion. <clears throat> we then saw a few years later the Supreme Court of the United States issue a different ruling. The Supreme Court uh, issued a different ruling in a case called Gonzalez v. Carhartt. Gonzalez v. Carhartt upheld a different statute. This one was federal rather than state, but it was a different federal statute, a federal statute that also prohibited uh, partial birth abortion. Uh, Judge Jackson, can you distinguish these cases for me? What was the difference between uh, Gonzalez v. Carhartt, where the partial birth abortion ban in question was upheld, whereas in Stenberg v. Carhartt, it, it was invalidated? Thank you, Senator. I don't have the opinions in front of me. I think um, I think it had to do with uh, the method of extraction, the fact finding related to um, the procedure. I, in one case, the district court um, had made some findings, and and the court felt bound by them. In another, uh, there was considerations beyond those that were previously um, relied upon. Okay. So there were distinctions that the court looked at and considered in the cases, but I'm, yes. Let's talk about court packing for a minute. Yes. One of the reasons court packing concerns me, one of the many reasons, is because it's not prohibited in the first instance. It's not prohibited by the Constitution. There's nothing in the Constitution that says that Congress uh, may not change the size of the Supreme Court. There's no limitation on that. We have, uh, for 152 years, stuck with the number nine. It, it has worked, uh, and in the absence of an argument saying that that number is too, is too uh, uh, low, that the court is too small, uh, from a workforce standpoint, we need to expand it. It's difficult to imagine uh, why it would be a good idea to change it, particularly because if you increase the size of the court in, in one fell swoop, swoop and you, you uh, do that for partisan political purposes, allowing one president, the current president, to have a disproportional Im impact on the court and to change its rulings, the, that portion of the court's docket that tends to be more politically contentious. It can turn the court into a, a political football of sorts. Given the, the fact that our Supreme Court justices uh, uh, serve for life. Uh, the, once you do that, it, it becomes something of a one-way ratchet, always expanding, never contracting. Before long, you could see an increasingly larger court, with the court expanding each time a different party secures the coveted circumstance of a majority in the House, majority in the Senate, and uh, controlled by the same party of the White House. And so this is why it concerns me. I understand that, why it is that uh, the, the canons of judicial ethics don't allow you to comment on matters that might come before you. This is one that could not come before you as a justice. This is a non-justiciable political question. It's committed to the two political branches of government. There's not even a constitutional challenge that could lie to it, even though it's, it would undermine the separation of powers in the Constitution, as I see it. It's, it's not unconstitutional. So it couldn't and it would never come before you. Uh, Last night when you were asked a question by my colleague, uh, uh, Senator Kennedy, on this, you acknowledged that you have an opinion. Did I understand that right? You have an opinion on court packing? Senator, I have a lot of opinions. I have opinions on, on I'm a human being, uh, and I have an opinion on a lot of things. The reason why, um, in my view, it is not appropriate for me to comment is because of my fidelity to the judicial role. I understand that it's a political question, and that is precisely why I think that 
I am uncomfortable speaking to it. No, I, I understand that, and I, and I respect uh, respect the impulse. I, I respect the the overall um, issue, and I think it's it's better for Article Three judges and justices ordinarily to not wade into the political thicket. This one I do think is different because number one, as I say, it can never come before you. Number two, it does have an impact on what you would be doing, and you also as an Article Three judge, someone who served for nearly nine years as a federal judge, you've developed experience and intuition and uh, a thorough understanding of our federal court system, and that's why I think your perspective on it would be valuable. The reason it concerns me so much is that even when court packing doesn't succeed legislatively, it can leave an impact. The last time this was attempted was in 1937. President Franklin D. Roosevelt was upset at the Supreme Court on a number of, of bases. He didn't like uh, the uh, then 32-year-old president of Lochner versus New York, where the, the five conservatives on the Supreme Court engaged in an act of judicial activism, reading something into the Constitution that wasn't really there. Some people disagree with me on this, but I, it wasn't there. And they imposed that. But the bigger reason was he didn't like the court's interpretation of the Commerce Clause. It was that interpretation of the Commerce Clause, the one we discussed yesterday, you know. The, uh, prior to 1937, you, you, you had uh, the Supreme Court ag agreeing as far as the channels and instrumentalities of interstate commerce that we talked about yesterday. You had the court more or less in agreement over time as to the impact of the Dormant Commerce Clause. But as to the substantial effects test, that didn't exist yet. It required something much closer to uh, an interstate commercial transaction uh, in order for commerce, com Congress's Commerce Clause authority to kick in. There were the, uh, the so-called four horsemen of the apocalypse, uh, as FDR affectionately called them, uh, four conservatives who were consistently uh, pushing uh, for limits on Congress's authority. And then you had other justices who would sometimes join with them. Usually that included Justice Owen Roberts, who had stood with them in maintaining narrower authority for Congress under the Commerce Clause. All that change went on April 12, 1937, two weeks to the day when the, the, the case often associated with the so-called switch in time that changed nine, the West Coast Hotel versus Parrish, uh, where they undid the Lochner precedent. April 12, 1937, the Supreme Court decided a case, NLRB versus Jones and Laughlin Steele, that forever changed and magnified, expanded the Commerce Clause in a way that had it been through a constitutional amendment, it would be among the most significant, impactful constitutional amendments ever adopted, and yet it's rarely discussed. This, this case resulted from one vote, one person on the Supreme Court who changed his vote, Associate Justice Owen Roberts. It's widely believed, and I believe it, based on what I've researched on it. He was influenced heavily by FDR's court packing plan. He didn't want to be on a court that was packed. He didn't want, he, he convinced himself that he made that switch in order to save the court as it was. And that has changed everything. It's, it's led to a much bigger, more expensive, more intrusive, intrusive federal government. We can disagree as to the policy merits of that, but it did change the Constitution. That's why I worry about that. So I, I hope, I understand you don't want to answer it. I hope that uh, between now and the end of the day, you'll see fit to, to tell us what your opinion is. I do think it's, it's worth, worth discussing. Let's talk for a minute. Uh, I've got just a moments left. I want to get back to your, your, your sentencing approach. Um, now, When you approach these child pornography cases, what you're describing uh, in many circumstances is an overall concern that you've got with the sentencing guidelines, and particularly that, that portion of the sentencing guidelines uh, that deals with uh, child pornography cases. This showed up in the, uh, in the transcripts of some of your sentencing hearings, including the, the uh, uh, the transcript of your sentencing hearing in the, in the Hawkins case. I turn to that, uh, to page 38, uh, line 17 to 24 of that transcript, and here's something you say in that Hawkins case. Uh, and I believe this was the 18-year-old defendant that you sentenced to, to three months in prison when the lower end of the guidelines range would have been 97. I think the higher end would have been in the 120s or something like that. 
You said, and in your case, this is you speaking to Mr. Hawkins, in your case in particular, I don't feel that it is appropriate necessarily to increase the penalty on the basis of your use of a computer or the number of images or prepubescent victims as the guidelines require because these circumstances exist in many cases, if not most, and don't signal an especially heinous or egregious child pornography offense. I've got a couple of questions about that. Were those, you start out that paragraph sounding like you're, you're making a determination as to him, but then the observations you make in that paragraph seem to apply broadly. Is that, is that right? So it would... Senator, um, I don't have the transcript of Mr. Hawkins' case. I recall that I found that case um, like all child pornography cases, to be difficult, really difficult. Um, and his case, I recall, was in many ways an outlier in terms of the various considerations that Congress required me to take into account. But there were prepubescent victims that were at, at stake. In I don't remember how, how many. I don't remember the circumstances of his actual... Uh, crime. What what I will say is that consistent with Supreme Court case law and Congress's statute in this area, judges have to take into account a number of factors and um, the guidelines, which are no longer, um, I won't say not mandatory, you have to calculate the guidelines, they're no longer binding. And the Supreme Court has said that under the statutory scheme, judges have discretion. But, but okay, but Mike, Mike, I'm almost almost out of time. Yes. Here. I, I want to make the point. Yes. Hawkins, as I recall, and as as Senator Hawley discussed yesterday, he specifically asked for images of 11 to 17 year olds. So I I, I don't understand how that can be a, an instance where that shouldn't matter, and where the the, the fact that he did it with a computer. Hardly atones for what he was doing. Hardly offsets the fact that he was seeking and obtained prepubescent child pornography images. Nor does the fact that the, the images become easier over time to transmit and receive and store because of computers. I actually think it cuts in precisely the opposite direction that you described. It makes it more severe, not less. I see this as an aggravating factor, and that, that is of great concern to me. I see... I've exceeded my time. Thank you. You may respond. Senator, as in every child pornography case that I sentenced, I considered all of the evidence, all of the relevant factors. It is um, not the same exercise to look at a transcript to think about guidelines to um, not have in front of you the individuals, the victims, the pictures, the circumstances that trial judges have to review in these cases or any cases. I understand, Senator, that um, there are some questions about records, et cetera, court, have all of the evidence and courts have all of the recommendations of various parties and courts have under Congress's authority the responsibility of using our judgment to make determinations that are sufficient but not greater than necessary to comply with the purposes or promote the purposes of punishment taking into account things like unwarranted sentencing disparities. And it may seem, it may seem like an easy exercise. It may seem in retrospect, when you look back at a few pieces of data that courts have not done what it is that they are supposed to do. But what I can assure you is that I took every one of these cases seriously in my duty and responsibility as a judge and I made my determinations in light of the seriousness of the offense, 
the nature and circumstances of the offense, the history and characteristics of the defendant, the need for the sentence imposed to promote various purposes of punishment, and all of the other factors that Congress prescribed. Okay, but you, you keep resetting that standard, and, and yet you, you specifically excluded mm -hmm. from consideration the fact that he had requested and obtained images, prepubescent child pornography images. Senator, the, I, didn't, I didn't exclude it. I didn't exclude it. What I did was I looked yeah. at the guidelines, which is what the Supreme Court requires, and I, ma I was making policy determinations, as the Supreme Court yeah. says that judges are to do. L look at in page these 38 of your transcript. It looks to me like you excluded it, and, and uh, your, your action sentencing him to three months for one of the most heinous offenses imaginable. Keep in mind, because these are transmitted Senator, electronically. We they're there for years. They re-victimize these victims Senator, the rest of their lives. We're asking everyone to try to stick with the 20 minutes, please. Next is Senator Klobuchar, but before recognizing her, I'd like to ask consent to enter into the record a support letter for Judge Jackson from 48 former federal prosecutors in South Florida without objection. Senator Klobuchar. Thank you very much, uh, Chairman Durbin. Welcome back, uh, Judge Jackson. Uh, yesterday, you and I discussed the court's increasing reliance on issuing unsigned orders on its shadow docket. And less than an hour ago, um, the court once again used the shadow docket uh, to throw out Wisconsin's redistricting maps. And because this decision just came out, I don't expect you to have immediately reviewed it. Um, but uh, I just want to make this point that in her dissent, uh, Justice Sotomayor, joined, joined by Justice Kagan, called the court's move unprecedented. Uh, she noted that in an emergency posture, the court summarily overturns a Wisconsin Supreme Court decision resolving a conflict over the state's redistricting, a decision that was rendered after a five-month process involving all interested stakeholders based on an obligation that is these are her words, hazy at best, even though summary reversals are generally reserved for decisions in violation of settled law. Um, and again, I don't expect you to be familiar with this case, but I do want to point out uh, that this underscores the point that I made yesterday, that the court's increasing practice of using the shadow docket to decide cases that have grave consequences for our democracy, including the right to vote, uh, that you and many other nominees have said is fundamental is incredibly troubling. You had in the other case I mentioned uh, yesterday where Justice Roberts dissented, uh, the Texas abortion bounty hunter case, um, that that should not have been done on the shadow docket. And while I'm not going to ask you about this because you couldn't possibly have read it, just your record of <clears throat> writing decisions that are thorough and listening to litigants in cases. Could you just generally talk about the importance of having full briefings on the merits as well as public oral arguments uh, if you believe in transparency? Thank you, Senator. As, um, as a judge in my work over the last decade, um, I've seen that it is very important, at least um, to me, in my time as a judge up to date, um, to hear arguments from all sides in a case. Um, the duty of a judge in, in, um, is to make determinations and um, under our system of adversarial uh, proceedings, you make determinations uh, based on arguments, um, and, and it's important to do so. I know that um, with respect to the emergency docket, I, um, you haven't asked me the question about it, um, it because I would say what I said before, which is I would benefit from being able to speak with uh, the justices. I understand that there's a need to balance um, getting full briefing with emergency circumstances, and the court has long had in its um, in its procedures the ability to uh, to rule uh, quickly on various cases. Mm -hmm. um, it's also 
um, my understanding from my time clerking on the court that the court uh, does recognize the value of allowing things to what we call percolate, meaning uh, lower courts to hear issues. And uh, my understanding is that at least in some of the recent cases, the justices have um, have had an oral argument related to some emergency matters. But from my perspective as a, a judge in the work that I've been doing, um, I know that it's important to hear from the parties. Mm -hmm. Another hallmark of your work has been taking complex issues and making them accessible to the public. Uh, so much so that I actually referred to one of your opinions from a debate stage in Los Angeles <laughs> saying, as a wise judge said, those were my words, I guess I was ahead of my time, uh, the president is not king in America, the law is king. I paraphrased it. That was a written opinion that you wrote that was over 65 pages uh, long, uh, relied extensively on Supreme Court and circuit uh, precedent. Uh, it was Committee on the Judiciary v. McGahn. And could you talk about really two things, the importance of having the law written in terms that are easy to understand by people, and then secondly, your opinion was actually a narrow one. Uh, it required Mr. McGahn to appear to testify uh, but th th said he remained free to assert any legally applicable privilege in response to the questions asked. So what you did there uh, was a narrow opinion. What, what role do you think that narrow rulings play in helping to maintain the legitimacy of the court? Why is it important to have plain language in orders? Thank you, Senator. Um, well, I'll start with the second first. Mm -hmm. I think that, um, you know, as, as we've been discussing, we have a rule of law in this country which um, requires a certain amount of predictability and stability in the law. Um, if there are big shifts uh, in terms of legal principles and doctrines and whatnot, um, it could lead to people uh, not understanding that judges are ruling on legal principles. It could lead to undermining public confidence, thinking that judges are uh, injecting their own policy preferences rather than following uh, the law in, in, in terms of their rulings. And so um, to further predictability, stability, there are many uh, doctrines in um, judicial practice. There's stare decisis, which is the principle that if something has already been decided, um, very similarly, you, uh, at least if it, it may be binding on you if you're a lower court, but at least you have to contend with it, um, uh, because that is the law that was, that existed before you got the case and you don't want to make a big shift. Um, and then there's also the principle that, um, you know, the understanding that when you are announcing, uh, a, rulings, you are building on what exists before. And so not, so you don't want to make a big shift if you don't have to, because um, you, if you can find a way to rule incrementally in a more narrow way, it keeps the law uh, stable is, is a part of the proposition that I, that I mentioned before. Um, in McGann in particular, it was, um, it was a case in which there was a precedent directly on point from my district. It was not binding on me, but the exact same set of circumstances and arguments had been presented to another judge in my district. I believe it was something like 10 years prior to my case. And so we had law that governed the circumstance. And I looked at that, determined it was persuasive and that I should continue uh, the principles that had been laid down by, by in the prior case. Um, also, um, in accordance with those principles, um, the prior judge and I made the determination that when the president um, claims absolute immunity, um, the argument was that the person who had been subpoenaed by the legislature, a former employee of the White House, um, could, could say that they had uh, immunity of some 
sort. In other words, it could have uh, invoke executive privilege in response to particular questions, but they couldn't say, I don't have to show up at all. And so the argument that was being made was when the House of Representatives issues a subpoena and says, show up on this day at this time to answer questions, um, does that person, can that person just ignore and, and say, I have immunity, I don't have to follow um, the law, in, in other words, respond to the subpoena, or do I have to show up and sit there and listen to the questions, and if there are things that I believe I can't answer, because they're, they're privileged, then you invoke the privilege. Mm -hmm. And the prior case had said, in this narrow way, you have to show up. You don't necessarily have to give the information. That's uh, determined on a question-by-question -question basis, but you have to show up. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I held in that case as well. And, it, and it's important to be clear in your rulings so that people understand that mm -hmm. judges are, are ruling consistent with the law and not their own personal views. Right. And um, uh, speaking of being clear and being careful in your rulings, um, some of my colleagues have, I think, given um, not a necessarily true view of your whole record, because when it comes to your rulings being upheld, the numbers show that out of over 550 cases, um, your district court cases, you were reversed less than 3% of the time. Uh, and in some of the instances, you were reversed only to have your decision later upheld. Um, I noticed one case, Territory of Guam v. United States, uh, in which you were initially re reversed, but then a unanimous Supreme Court reversed that decision, then siding with you, uh, in an opinion written by Justice Thomas uh, and aligned with your view. Do you want to quickly talk about that case? Um, well, that case is kind of legally complicated. It was a, it was a CERCLA case, which is um, a super fund cleanup kind of case where the uh, country of Guam, which had, um, which has a, a dump site on it um, that was used uh, by both the citizens of Guam and the United States uh, before the 1950s when the United States was stationed there, military operations happened out of Guam, and there was a lot of dumping into this site. And um, over time, the site got contaminated, and um, Guam was charged with uh, having to clean it up, which is millions and millions of dollars. And there are s statutes, very complicated statutes, about the circumstances mm -hmm. under which you can seek contribution um, under which a, a country like that can ask for the United States to pay some of that cost or other countries to pay some of that cost. Um, and that was sort of the nature of the dispute. And I did a, a statutory interpretation about um, whether or not Guam's action could proceed. Uh, the United States filed a motion to dismiss, saying that all of the technical uh, requirements of the law weren't met and that the um, action had to be dismissed. And I denied the motion to dismiss after interpreting the statute saying that the action could continue. Um, the DC Circuit reversed my view, had a different reading of the statute, um, saying that the motion to dismiss should have been granted and dismissed the case. And then it was appealed to the Supreme Court. And as you say, the Supreme Court reinstated the action, saying it could proceed. Very good. Thank you. Um, uh, in 1972, in Brandsburg v. Hayes, a 5-4 court uh, did not recognize the reporter's privilege in the context of criminal grand jury testimony. Um, and uh, I spoke with you earlier at length about Times v. Sullivan and First Amendment issues. So this will be my last question on this. Since the court's decision, uh, my state, like many other states, enacted strong reporters' privilege laws to protect journalists from having to divulge unpublished materials, confidential sources. How would you approach balancing the need to protect journalists and the role they play in informing the public against the need for law enforcement officers uh, to gather information? I would apply um the, the precedence of the Supreme Court in this area, it would depend on the circumstances. Um, as, as I mentioned, um, press freedoms is one of the fundamental First Amendment rights. 
um, the court has uh, a number of precedents in terms of, of ex expressive freedom, press freedom, and um, in every case, um, there will be a specific set of circumstances regarding an alleged violation of the right, and the court would need to look at the facts and circumstances, the prior precedent, uh, in order to determine whether that particular regulation um, uh, could be upheld. Okay, thank you. This is my very last question, Chair, before all of us get to eat lunch, <laughs> including you. Um, and uh, that is really the important role of dissenting opinions. Uh, Justice Ginsburg once said this. She said, dissent speak to a future age. Uh, it's not simply to say my colleagues are wrong and I would do it this way. Uh, but the greatest dissents uh, do become court opinions and gradually over time their views uh, sometimes uh, become the dominant view. Um, when Justice Ginsburg's rabbi uh, gave a eulogy at her memorial service here in the Capitol, um, and some of us were fortunate enough to be there. Uh, they, they said, Justice Ginsburg's dissents were not cries of defeat. They were blueprints for the future. Uh, what do you think is the purpose of a dissent? And um, do you want to talk just a little bit about that, this idea that they can be blueprints for the future? Thank you, Senator. Um, on the Supreme Court, um, there are nine justices, and um, in every case, they're all sitting together to hear uh, the issues in a case. And um, one hopes, and, and it often happens, that the justices um, agree as to issues in cases that I believe that the vast majority of cases that the justices hear are actually not, um, there, there is no dissent, that they, that they agree to the outcome. Uh, but there are cases in which after uh, deliberation and collaboration and uh, consideration, the justices may disagree about how, um, how the case should be resolved, and there's a mechanism for uh, every justice to decide whether they're going to join others, uh, either uh, in the majority, whether they're going to write a separate opinion that might agree with the majority but wants to make a different point, or whether they, they want to dissent. And sometimes more than one justice might uh, dissent or join a dissent. It, it's a way of um, expressing, expressing one's own view that may differ from uh, from your colleagues. And with respect to the, the point um, that you made, um, there are actually many um, justices in history who have used uh, the dissent mechanism to discuss the law in ways that others find uh, over time to be more persuasive. And so I'm thinking of, um, I'm thinking of the first Justice Harlan who dissented famously in Plessy versus Ferguson. He dissented alone. Um, all of the other justices agreed um, with the proposition of, uh, of separate but equal, and he said no in a dissent. And his dissent, um, generations later, became, uh, according to, to Justice Thurgood Marshall, became the blueprint for Justice Marshall to make arguments that led to Brown versus the board. So there is the opportunity um, for justices to describe their views in ways that become persuasive to others in the future. Thank you for um, all you've given us the last few days. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Senator, thanks, Senator Klobuchar. And we're going to break now for a 30-minute lunch. I, I'd say to everyone that when we return, if we stick to 20-minute rounds and don't yield back time, We'll be finishing in something around four and a half hours, which would take us to about seven o'clock. So that doesn't include a break, but we'll consider that later on. Thank you, Thank Judge, you. again.
Welcome back, Judge. As you can see, things uh, get off the rails here when they decide they have a floor vote. We'll do our best to stick with the program and finish this as, uh, in a proper way. Uh, the next up is Senator Cruz of Texas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Senator. Under Article Three of the Constitution, uh, federal courts have jurisdiction over only cases and controversies, uh, which means under the Constitution it has to be an actual dispute, that federal courts cannot simply issue advisory opinions on, on a question they may have a view on. And one component of Article Three jurisdiction is the requirement of standing, that in order for a plaintiff to have standing to bring a case, that that plaintiff, at least generally speaking, must have a real and concrete injury. Is, 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 is that right? That is correct. Um, so, for example, uh, that, that, that means that, that even if I might have a disagreement with some particular policy or some particular law, that, that I can't bring a case unless I am personally aggrieved by that policy or that law. Uh, so, for example, you're in my alma mater, Harvard, uh, is currently being sued for its explicit and, in my view, egregious policy of discriminating against Asian Americans. Uh, even though I think that policy is egregious, I as an individual plaintiff could not bring a lawsuit challenging it uh, because I am not Asian American. Is that right? If you brought a lawsuit, um, the court would have to evaluate whether you had an actual injury in order to be able to determine whether it had subject matter jurisdiction to hear the suit. But, but if I'm not in the class being discriminated <clears throat> against, then I don't have the ability to bring the lawsuit. Is that right? I think I, you'd have to have an actual injury. Certainly people, I think, who are in the class could claim that they had an injury for that purpose. So now you're, you're on the board of overseers of Harvard. If you're confirmed, do you intend to recuse from this lawsuit? That is my plan, Senator. Okay. Um, we discussed yesterday how the standard for race discrimination was strict scrutiny. Uh, the court has laid out a, a different standard for gender discrimination. Um, what is the constitutional standard that applies to, to gender discrimination? Gender discrimination, um, the court has held um, intermediate scrutiny applies, which is um, that the government has to have uh, an important interest and um, it, the tailoring doesn't have to be as narrow. Right. So yesterday, uh, under, under questioning from Senator Blackburn, uh, you told her that, that you couldn't define what a woman is. Uh, that you were not a biologist, which, which I think you're the, the only Supreme Court nominee in history who's been unable to answer the question, what is a woman? Uh, let me ask you as a judge, how would you determine if a plaintiff had Article Three standing uh, to challenge a gender-based rule, regulation, policy uh, without being able to determine what a woman was? So, Senator, I know that I'm a woman. I know that um, Senator Blackburn is a woman, and the woman who I um, admire most in the world is in the room today, my mother. Um, it sounded as though well, but, the but question let me, but, was... But let me ask, un under the modern leftist sensibilities, if, if I decide right now that, that I'm a woman, um, then... Apparently, I'm a woman. Does that mean that I would have Article Three standing to challenge a gender-based restriction? Senator, to the extent that you are asking me about um, who has the ability to bring lawsuits based on gender, those kinds of issues are working their way through the courts, and I'm not able to comment on them. Okay. If, if, if I can change my gender, if I can be a woman, and then an hour later, if I decide I'm not a woman anymore, I guess I would lose Article Three standing. Tell me, does that same principle apply to other protected characteristics? For example, I'm, I'm an Hispanic man. Could, could I decide I was an Asian man? W would I have the ability to be an Asian man and challenge Harvard's discrimination because I made that decision? Senator, I'm not able to answer your question. You're asking me about hypotheticals and um, well, I'm asking you how you would assess standing if I, if I came in and said, I have decided I identify as an Asian man. 
I would assess standing the way I assess other legal issues, which is to listen to the arguments made by the parties, consider the relevant precedents uh, and the constitutional principles involved and make a determination. Okay, let's go back to your favorite topic of this hearing, uh, which is the criminal law cases you had as a district judge, and in particular the cases involving child pornography. Now, your defenders, both on the Democratic side of the dais and also in the press, have suggested that, that the criticism that has been raised uh, has been somehow cherry-picked, that, it, that it's only some specific examples. So, so I'm going to give you an opportunity to discuss each and every case you've had, because looking at your cases, and I've now examined all of the child porn cases you've had as a federal district judge, there is a very consistent pattern. So let's start, and, and by the way, I'm excluding the cases. So Senator Durbin and Senator Coons focused on uh, the Nickerson case, the Fife case, the Nguyen case, and the Hilly case. I'm excluding those because those are not child porn cases. Those are actual sexual assault of a child, which is markedly different. And I will concede when you're dealing with sexual assault, you have been willing to impose stricter penalties. So let's focus on actual child pornography cases. And let's go through each of them, because if it's right that we're cherry-picking, then, then you should be able to, to explain quite powerfully. Now, your justification is that you're following the statute. Mm -hmm. And as you know, 18 U.S.C. Section 3553 lays out the factors that, that, as a district judge, you had to consider in sentencing. And let's start with the Hess case, United States versus Hess. Now, in that case, a man sent six pictures a pre, of a prepubescent girl that he claimed was his daughter to an undercover law enforcement officer. Officers found over 600 images of child pornography, including images of sexual acts being performed on prepubescent children. The defendant pled guilty, and I believe in all of these cases the defendant pled guilty. So There's no question about guilt. They came in and pled guilty in your courtroom. The charge carried a mandatory minimum sentence of five years and a mandatory maximum sentence of 20 years. The sentencing guidelines recommended 151 to 188 months sentence. The government, as part of a plea agree a deal, agreed to argue for 60 months, but didn't agree that that would be the sentence, simply that they would advocate it. And you, in turn, sentenced Hess to 60 months. So. Under the terms of the statute, why did you choose to sentence Hess to the absolute lowest possible sentence you were allowed to sentence under law? Thank you, Senator. I have spoken at length throughout this hearing about these cases. I've said what I'm going to say, which is I've taken every case seriously. These are you very to say about the horrible crimes. I'm asking you specifically about the Hess case. I've taken every case seriously. So you're not going to answer that? These are very horrible crimes, as was that one. And as a mother, having to look at these pictures, having to follow Congress's directive, having to listen to recommendations like the government in that case, which argued for 60 months, I imposed the sentence that I believed was the sentence that was required by law. So I believe you, and, I, and I've actually, I've read your sentencing hearing in each one of these cases for which we have transcripts, and there are several of which we don't have transcripts. So in each of these cases, you read from the same script. So in each of these cases, you say that the distribution of child pornography is an extremely serious federal crime. And you point out that the crime involves people who are taking pictures and videos of real children while the children are being sexually abused. Uh, in Hess, you pointed out that he had hundreds, hundreds of images of children in sexually compromised position. Some of them in engaged in sadomasochistic acts. All of this I'm reading from you at, on the bench. And most importantly, the children in these pictures are not knowing and willing participants in the degrading conduct that was being depicted. They were being forced, forced by someone off screen to commit unspeakable acts of sexual violence for the pleasure of the people filming them and for the gratification of people everywhere. And what concerns me is that many of those people have absolutely no shred of empathy 
for what that conduct does for the children who were being abused in this way. And you read this script in every one of these cases. So you talk about that, that these are terrible, terrible crimes. Um, but you also, and, and in Hess you said, I have to say that what I found particularly disturbing about your offense uh, was that, quote, you apparently concocted a story about having photographed your own daughter who you purportedly were willing to take pictures of to trade with other people. I know from your comments and from those who know you that you are unlikely to ever harm a child, which I find remarkable that you've got a child predator in your court who says, I'm unlikely to harm a child. And you say, well, you told me that, so, so clearly you're unlikely. But you say, but in the context of the crime, you represented that you would. That in and of itself is astonishing. So you talk about it as astonishing. You nonetheless sentenced him to the very lowest possible sentence allowed under law. And what's striking is in these cases, in half of them in five, you sentenced the defendant to the absolute lowest sentence under law. Let's look at another case. Let's look at United States versus Chazen. Now, Chazen is a particularly <laughs> nasty case. In Chazen, the defendant was accused accessed a Dropbox that contained 35 videos and 13 partially downloaded files of prepubescent minor females engaging in sexually explicit conduct. Uh, at least three of the instances of prepubescent female children were engaged in sexual activity with adult men. The images included the sexual abuse of children, including those as young as toddlers. And several of these cases that you had involved the sexual abuse of toddlers, which is truly horrifying. In this instance, Chazen pleaded guilty. The guidelines recommended a sentence of 78 to 97 months. The prosecution argued that should be what the sentence was. And you sentenced Chazen to just 28 months. Why did you sentence someone who had child pornography of toddlers being sexually abused to 28 months, 64% below what the prosecutors asked for? Thank you, Senator. You've picked out, um, I don't know, seven, eight cases. I've sentenced more than 100 people. But not to child pornography. And in every These are your case, child porn cases. in every case, Senator, I look at the evidence. I look at the recommendations of not just the government, because my duty as a, ju a judge is to consider all of the arguments that are made in a case. I look at the evidence. I talk to the defendants about the harms that they have uh, uh, engaged in. Many of these defendants are people who... Um... Okay, okay, Judge, with respect, you're, you're not answering my question. You're right. You talk to them about the harms. Let me read you again from what you said at the bench. You said in this instance with, with, with Mr. Chazen, you said, among the defendants nationwide who received a below-guideline sentence on the basis of a downward variance as opposed to a departure, the average sentences ranged from 84 to 92 months. So that's what you lay out as the average. Our Democratic colleagues say, well... Other federal judges sentenced below the guidelines. That is true. A number of federal judges do. Our Democratic colleagues have not pointed to a single federal judge in the country who 100% of the time sentences child porn defendants to markedly below what the prosecution has recommended, unless you have a mandatory minimum and no ability to do so. In this case, you say comparable defendants are sentenced to 84 to 92 months, Sentencing guidelines by statute require you to have similarly situated defendants sentenced to similar sentences, but you don't sentence Chazen to 84 to 92 months. You sentenced him to 28 months. Why? Senator, I've said what I'm going to say about these cases. No one case can stand in for a judge's entire record. Okay, but I'm discussing and every one I, of the cases. So I if, if you're not going to explain Senator, it... Senator, gonna... would you please let her respond? No, not if she's not going to answer well, my question. Well, if you're just going to give a speech, then uh, and, you and, shouldn't and, engage and, in And you, you are not taking my time. If you want to filibuster, you're, you're welcome to do so, but do I it on your own I would at least time. give you an opportunity to speak, and you should give her an opportunity to respond. If she wants to answer the question, I asked her why please she Please allow sentenced... her to answer the I question. I asked her why she sentenced Chazen to 28 months when comparable defendants, so in her own words, answer. were sentenced 
to substantially higher, and she said she's not going to answer. Did you? Ha I mean, I, I would I, welcome I your I answer, please. Senator, I didn't say I'm not going to answer. Okay, well, I then said my tell answer. Us in this facts, in this case, Chazen, why did you sentence him to just 28 months? Senator, you're looking at the record. I don't have the record here. What I will say is that in every case, I looked at the recommendations of not only the government, but also the probation office, the defendant, the record, the evidence. I took into account the seriousness of the offense. And by, I by the way, you know, ruled. one of the striking things in Chazen, the prosecutor comes in front of you and says, this is the prosecutor's argument at this point. And the prosecutor says, I understand from my experience before your honor, your honor's objection, policy objections, to the, to the 2G2.2 sentencing guidelines. And he goes on to say, however, in this case in particular, the four-point specific offense characteristic is justified because it contains sadomasochistic images of infants and toddlers. I'm trying to understand how you see someone that possesses images of infants and toddlers being sexually violated and you sentence them to 64% below what the prosecutor is asking for. You're, 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 you don't provide a justification other than a generic concern that the guidelines are too high. You don't provide a justification as required by statute. So I'm asking you to take the opportunity to explain to this committee and the American people why in 100% of the cases you have people with vile crimes and, and you have language saying they're vile crimes. But then you sentence them to very, very low sentences. And, and why do you consistently, 100% of the time, choose to do that? Senator, no one case can stand in for a judge's entire sentencing record. I have sentenced more than 100 people. You have eight or nine cases okay. in that chart. Okay, Judge, you said that before. The, these are the eight or nine child porn cases. I will say to correct the record, I, I was just talking say about to the judge. There's no point in responding. He's going to interrupt you. Thank you. Look, I appreciate the chairman trying to filibuster, and if you don't like your witness's answers, you're, you're welcome to provide your own. Uh, sh she is declining to answer the question. And, and Chairman Durbin, if you want to join her on the, on the, on the bench, you can. But I, Chairman Durbin, uh, my job is to make Chairman sure Durbin, I'm not interrupting your questioning. I'm and, asking you to give her a chance to answer. But she has consistently said she's not going to answer. I want to clarify for the record, by the way, the case I was discussing was Cooper and not Chazen. Uh, but Chazen is uh, the case that I was reading from your transcript was Cooper. But Chazen, all right, let's get to Chazen. I pulled the wrong tab. Uh, Chazen is equally horrifying. And, and you say in Chazen, this is something Senator Graham asked you. So the guidelines lay out different enhancements, and, and you say repeatedly, and this is true in all your cases, you say you disagree with the guidelines, you think they're wrong. And the two guidelines you disagree with is, one, there's an enhancement for use of a computer, and you say the world has changed, and now all of these are on a computer. And I understand that. I don't agree with you, but I understand that. That is an understandable thing to say. But the second thing you say over and over again is there's an enhancement for the number of images. And you say repeatedly, for example, in, in Chazen, you say, whatever the state of the law and technology at the time of the guidelines were first adapted, neither the use of the computer nor the number of images are especially aggravating factors today. Now, I find that bizarre. And you say it in, in every case. You say the number of images, it's not an aggravating factor, it doesn't matter, and you won't apply the enhancement. Do you really believe that, that a predator that has hundreds or thousands of images of hundreds or thousands of children being sexually violated has not committed an offense that, that is more serious than someone that has a single picture of a single child? A single picture of a single child is horrifying, but hundreds of children that have been violated, do you really believe that is not a more serious offense? Senator, I did not have any cases involving hundreds of thousands of pictures. No, no I said hundreds and or thousands. You had, you had cases involving hundreds and you had cases involving thousands. You're right, you didn't have hundreds of thousands. And I also applied an enhancement, just not to the degree of the guidelines. You're so right. I, it's a, it's a five-point enhancement under the guidelines. You provide two. Yes, so uh, not we, zero, okay, not, right, not the but, suggestion but, that but I did. are you suggesting the number of images doesn't matter? Because you say it in court over and over again that the number of images doesn't reflect that it's a more serious crime. Do, do you really believe that? Senator, as I said to 
Senator Graham. The court is taking into account a number of circumstances. The commission has done a report about the operation of the guidelines, which enhancements actually reflect uh, different levels of culpability with respect so let me to So let me ask you this, Judge. You said the purpose of sentencing is to distinguish and distinguish between crimes that are not as serious from from truly egregious crimes. Is, is, is that right? No, Senator. So, so what is the purpose of sentencing if it's not to distinguish from less serious crimes from truly egregious crimes? It is to assign proportional punishment. It is to do justice in cases where you have defendants who are convicted of the same conduct but have different differing levels of culpability. Well, I will point out that you have a pattern. It doesn't matter how egregious the case is. Senator Hawley talked about the Hawkins case where you had an 18-year-old with pictures of boys as young as eight being sexually assaulted and raped, and you sentenced him to just three months in jail. And I will point out the Stewart case, the last one on this list, because we, we're running out of time. The Stewart case, you describe that he had over 6,700 images and videos. So that's a lot, 6,700. That's a lot of kids time being sexually charged, assaulted. Senator. You have taken over a minute of my time, Mr. Chairman. I'll give so, you, so You've been given extra time. You usually ask for it. You're given it. OK, I, I know you want to interrupt. I know you don't I like this line of questions. I just want you to play by the rules. I, I know you like to interrupt, but I you've like consumed you a substantial rules, question of my uh, time of my questioning. And I'm, I'm going to ask my questions. And, and you can, if Senator, you want to testify, you're welcome to. Senator, Judge, you play by the same rules in as the every other senator. In the Stewart case, you said from the bench, thus, although this is not necessarily an, an atypical case, your child pornography possession crime was egregious in the court's view. Okay, so this is a bad one. If you're actually sentencing defendants, you said this was egregious. What did you sentence Stewart for? The guidelines said 97, 121 months. Prosecutor said 97 months. You said it's egregious, 6,700 images. You come in with 57 Time months. Time has expired. Why Senator did Hughes, you two minutes him over to just the allotted... 57 months in the Stewart case? Do you want to address that? Because you're claiming it's cherry picking. In fact, you're welcome to explain any of these cases, but let's take the Stewart case. Why Senator Coons, did you sentence him for half the amount? You're not recognized, Senator. Senator if you, Coons. You don't want her to answer that question? You wouldn't allow her anyway. Mr. Chairman, she may answer the question. I've asked her why she sentenced Stewart. You've gone over the time, Senator, by two minutes Why she? And a half. Because you've interrupted me for two minutes, Mr. Chairman. Will you allow her to answer the question, or do you not want the American people to hear <laughs> why, with someone she described as uh, well, an egregious... You know, there comes a point, Senator, where you get a little bit... Chairman Durbin, hand. will you allow her to answer the question? You won't allow her to answer I, the I, question. I will happily allow her to... The question is Senator why you Thank you, sentenced Chairman. Stewart, an egregious child pornography possessor... So, to, to half of the amount Please, Senator. requested by the prosecutor. Please, Senator. Will you allow her to a answer the question, Chairman Durbin? Senator Coons. Thank Why you. are you not allowing her to answer the question? There's You're not another the senator here that you've not allowed her to answer the question. You're I'm not asking another question, but allow her to answer the question, Chairman Durbin. Thank you, Chairman Durbin. Why do you not want the American people to know what happened in the Stewart case or any of these cases? Chairman Durbin, I've never seen the chairman refuse to allow a witness to answer a question. <laughs> You can bang it as loud as you want. Well, I can just tell you, at some point, you have to follow the rules. Okay. Will you let her answer the question? You've, you've been uh, interrupting. We, and by the way, with Senator Graham, it went 10 minutes over. You've sure taken did. a big chunk of the time. Will you allow her to answer the question? You've given her Why no are you afraid of her? She's it. welcome to answer it right now. Will you let her? Senator Coons. Will you let, so no, you don't want her to answer the question? Senator Coons. Will you let her answer okay. the question? Chairman Durbin. Apparently, Judge you were Judge. very afraid of the American people hearing the answer to that question. We here in the Senate, in this committee today, are in the middle of a policy fight. It's my understanding that across this nation, more than 70 percent of district court judges who impose sentences in cases such as the ones that have been so vigorously debated here, depart downwards from the sentencing guidelines, from the request of the prosecutors. And as you've explained repeatedly and in detail, that's because a sentencing judge is required to weigh a whole series of factors. How many opinions have you written as a judge, Your Honor? I've written at least 570 opinions, Senator. And in how many cases have you imposed sentences as a federal judge? More than 100 cases. 
And across all of those, uh, we've just heard very forcefully assertions made about you and your character and your capabilities and your background, narrowing in on just a few. And I would simply put for those who are watching and trying to understand what all of this is about, um, that in an attempt to distract from your broad support, your deep record, your outstanding intellectual and legal credentials, um, that we are taking what is a policy dispute that should be decided by members of the Senate. Uh, if we want to change the sentencing guidelines to make them mandatory rather than advisory, if we want to change the structure within which a federal judge imposes sentences, we could do that. Um, but to demand that you be held accountable for this practice that is nationwide and is years old, um, I view as an unfair misrepresentation uh, of your record. So if I could, let's go to something that you did as the vice chair of the Sentencing Commission, um, an important vote that you took in 2014. Because in my view, it shows how fundamentally misguided are the attacks that try to characterize you as someone who at all costs will do what you can to help criminal defendants. Let me just lay out the context for a moment. In 2010, Congress, enacting a policy choice, unanimously passed the Fair Sentencing Act, a bill that reduced the disparity in sentences between uh, crack cocaine and powdered cocaine from 101 to 18 to 1. And the Sentencing Commission unanimously concluded this law meant those currently in prison on crack offenses could seek to shorten their sentences. Four years later, the Commission further concluded that individuals who provided substantial assistance to the government, people who cooperated, who helped out the prosecution, could use this law to shorten their sentence retroactively beyond any break they might have gotten for their cooperation. But you disagreed. In your public remarks at the time, you explained that although given your prior service as a federal public defender, it might seem logical you'd support this direction, you could not do so because you concluded it was manifestly inconsistent with the law and would create unfair disparities between those previously sentenced cooperators and those sentenced today. Essentially, if I understand your view, it was that the sentence of a cooperator shouldn't be understood to be based on the sentencing ranges modified by the Fair Sentencing Act, but was best understood as a fixed discount of the mandatory minimum that a Fair Sentencing Act had not changed. I know this is technical, um, but I just wanted to make sure I'm characterizing this correctly before reaching a conclusion. Um, do I understand the context correctly in which you made this decision? Yes, Senator, perfectly. It, it was um, debate among the commission, one of the very few in which we couldn't reach agreement uh, about uh, the retroactive application of the Fair Sentencing Act reduction. And so just to finish the framing, um, the Sentencing Commission, which often decides things unanimously, was sharply divided. And here's who was on each side. You voted to deny relief to cooperators, to deny them a pathway towards reducing their prison sentences. And you were joined by two conservatives well known to us, Judge William Pryor uh, and now Judge Dabney Friedrich. Um, and the three of you were outvoted um, by four commissioners, which included Judge Inahosa, an individual nominated by President Reagan and described as a hard-nosed, no-nonsense judicial conservative, who was on the other side of the argument from you. So you've got four commissioners, including an outstanding conservative Reagan nominee, and they thought the law could be interpreted to give a break on sentencing. And you were on the other side of that argument. If as someone has tried to paint you, you simply were determined to give every break you could to criminal defendants. All you had to do was join the majority and this would have passed, but that's not what you did. Um, help me understand why not. Thank you, Senator. Um, as you say, this is a sort of technical kind of in the weeds discussion, but the top line is that when I looked at the issues and I looked at the law, it was my opinion that the law did not provide for uh, the further reduction that was being considered. So across an incredibly broad range of sentences you've had to impose and cases on which you've had to opine, um, I'm picking this one in part because it's not getting any attention in this confirmation process. But for folks who'd like some insight into how you make decisions and how you explain those decisions, 
Um, there's a video, it's publicly available, of your April 2014 of the public meeting of the Sentencing Commission where you laid out uh, your position. So I encourage folks to just watch that. And they'll see a jurist who understands that her commitment above all is to determine what the law requires and then follow it. In my view, that's an individual who belongs on the Supreme Court. By the way, your position that the law required that there not be further breaks given in this context ultimately won the day. Uh, my colleague from New Jersey made a point of mentioning a relevant case, United States versus Booker, yesterday. I have to say that in this case, it was decided in Coons versus United States <laughs> with a K, not a C. <laughs> Look, we all have our judicial record from which we work. Um, but the Supreme Court ruled for exactly the same reasons you did in this argument that was made public. So I, I just think, Your Honor, this is an example of you looking hard at the law, making a tough decision, ultimately being vindicated in that decision, but taking a position that is not the caricature that's been proffered by some of you. Yesterday, I, I ran through a number of the, the letters and statements um, that debunk some of the attacks that have been levied based on a handful of sentencing decisions. There was the National Review piece by a conservative former prosecutor who calls out the smear on your sentencing practices in cases involving child pornography, the statement by the Fraternal Order of Police and the International Association of Chiefs of Police endorsing your even-handed and judicious approach to the law, the glowing letter from 24 prominent conservative attorneys and the resounding recommendation we heard in person from Judge Griffith. Um, there's also been received here a letter from a number of retired federal judges, including two Republican nominees, rejecting this mischaracterization of your sentencing record. As I've said, this is a policy dispute that we should be deciding, not an appropriate basis on which to mischaracterize your record or your character. We have letters from the National Coalition of Domestic Violence in addition to these law enforcement leaders, from survivors, advocates, crime victims. The breadth of your support from the very communities my colleagues have suggested you're making less safe shows just how off base these attacks are, and in my view is a testament to your qualities and qualifications. So we all agree, all of us, that it's critical to protect our children and prevent the kinds of heinous crimes we've heard about in some detail earlier today. It's why I'm introducing a bipartisan reauthorization of the Victims of Child Abuse Act, something that we could act on as a committee to do our job, which is set policy and pass laws. But I also frankly think we need to be mindful um, that we are asking of you to get engaged in that policy dispute in front of this committee, which is not the role of a judge, something you well understand. Let me turn, if I could, to another reason I think you're deeply qualified and that you will bring something important to the Supreme Court. Brian Stevenson, one of America's leading civil rights lawyers and by happy coincidence a Delaware native, um, has spoken about how achieving justice requires being proximate to the people most impacted by the criminal justice system, and you've done that. As a public defender, you've represented individuals in the criminal justice system. As a district court judge, you have looked individuals in the eye and told them that for their crimes against society, they will spend years or decades in prison. You have met with, fought for, and advocated for victims. You've also studied the big picture. As an effective and engaged member of the Sentencing Commission, you've poured over data, reviewed thousands of letters, and thought hard about the appropriate national approach to just punishment in a more policy-oriented role. You've also thought about the big picture as a judge when considering the precedent that your opinions set. I'd be interested briefly in how your experience on the Sentencing Commission shaped your approach as a district court judge and how the interplay of all these factors might shape or contribute to your decisions as a Supreme Court Justice. Thank you, Senator. Um, one of the things district judges, sentencing judges often say when asked about the task is that um, sentencing is the hardest thing that a judge has to do and it's in part for the reasons that you have articulated, that um, it's one thing to understand the law, to read it in a book. It's one thing to look at data and numbers and um, 
and, and make policy based on that. It's quite another to have someone in the courtroom, whether as a victim of crime or a defendant who's perpetrate, perpetrated a crime, and have to decide how to proceed and pronounce a uh, sentence on that individual. The work that I did on the Sentencing Commission, uh, which was prior to my becoming a district judge, I think enabled me to understand um, unwarranted sentencing disparities, to understand some of the policy reasons behind the guidelines, and to um, make the kinds of evaluations that the law now requires since the guidelines are no longer mandatory. And I feel felt um, uh, I felt better in a sense about the task of calculating the guidelines, which is what courts have to do at the beginning of a sentence. They can be a little complex, um, and having been on the Sentencing Commission, I think that helped. And some of these cases do make their way uh, to the Supreme Court. So, um, so I think that I am prepared uh, to handle um, the cases that involve s sentencing um, that, that do go to the court. In preparing for this confirmation, I went back and read a, a lecture you gave, but it was later published in the Harvard Law Review um, about the balance, the challenge of sentencing about that moment. I, I had the um, joy, the blessing of uh, clerking for a judge on the Third Circuit. Um, I, my legal skills and talents did not allow me the opportunity to clerk for the Supreme Court as you did, but, and also the District Court and also the Circuit Court. Uh, but I clerked for a judge who I first met when she was a District Court judge in imposing a sentence. Uh, on, on someone who was a crack dealer. And she did a remarkable job of speaking to the victims, speaking to the community, speaking to the prosecutor and the defense attorney, and then speaking directly to the defendant in imposing a very long sentence. Um, and as I got to know her later, I recognized that, you know, as a member of our community and as someone who saw the importance of that moment, that public moment of helping the defendant understand what they'd done so that they might somehow change, but also helping the victims understand what had happened, that she took that very seriously, incredibly seriously. In the Harvard Law Review publication of your remarks, you said that you're persuaded by the theories of punishment that accept all human beings are responsible moral agents, and you view punishment as a necessary consequence of the defendant's decision to engage in criminal behavior. You also went on to say that the challenge is balancing the acknowledgement all of us are more than just the worst thing we've ever done but there is a need to ensure the defendant is adequately addressed and punished. What I think you say in that lecture, what you've shown across the arc of your public service, um, reveals someone who understands the appropriate need for punishment in our society, but who is also striving to follow the balance of recommendations, guidelines, statute, and the context and facts. And I trust that as members of this committee and the Senate as a whole and the general public, um, take the time, which they should do, to give a fair reading um, to the whole scope and arc and reach of your service, that they'll see you as someone who cares deeply about our Constitution and the rights that make us free, as you said in your opening statement. Um, your career in the law, your service on the bench, your thoughtful responses to questions put to you, the way you've maintained your composure, all impress me. As I mentioned, um, I, I don't think labels um, such as a judicial philosophy are always that meaningful or dispositive. Um, I think in your case, a deep admiration for the Constitution and an understanding that the role of a judge is a limited one um, are critical um, and qualifying. Um, you opened yesterday uh, by referencing how your parents were educated in racially segregated schools in Florida, but how you, just one generation later, were raised in integrated schools and had far greater opportunities to put your evident God-given talents to work in service to our nation. You cited this one generation change as an example of the greatness of America. Of course, the Supreme Court played a central role in more correctly interpreting the Constitution and applying it in a manner that allowed this reversal of unjust law to occur. I think the experiences of your own family and your connection to the experiences of trailblazers who came before you on whose shoulders you stand has meaningfully shaped what kind of a justice you will be. 
I think you know in your bones how important our Constitution and the rule of law is. And I think as someone who served on the Sentencing Commission, a public defender on the trial court, and appellate court judge, you have the ability to see across the whole scope and reach of how the law impacts families, communities, and our nation. Last, in some ways, I think um, most importantly, I've learned that as a person and a judge, you have humility. Judge Griffith, who came before this committee to introduce you, and scores of others we've heard from, I've just referenced, have lauded your practice of judicial restraint. And you've said a core component of your philosophy is your understanding that the judge's role is a limited one. Well, I think restraint is a core part of your approach to decision making, partly because you are a judge who is humble enough to know that the Constitution and the laws passed by Congress say what the law is. The judge has a limited role in deciding questions of law based on facts presented. Penn Law Professor Lisa Fairfax, your other introducer, your dear friend, explained that since college at Harvard and then through law school, you've been a mentor and a role model. She praised your warmth and intelligence, your devotion to friends and family, but she also mentioned your humility. Um, she knew you were honored and humbled by the significance of this moment, not what it means for you, but what it means for our nation. I remember thinking about this on Monday. I, I had a chance to talk to your brother, Kataj, um, and he mentioned that he knew you were destined for this moment your whole life. Um, I am sure he would say you've been exceptional since you were student body president at Palmetto High School. I suspect your wonderful family upbringing is partly responsible for this facet of your character. I suspect your faith has played a role in sustaining you, as mine does, and so does many others in this room. I've often found instruction and comfort in the verse, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Now, I'm not going to ask you to reflect on that verse, Your Honor, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's one of your favorites that sustains you. Um, let me close by returning to what Judge Griffith said uh, when he told us in his heartfelt introduction of you on Monday, and something you've also shown in the uh, hours uh, you've been grilled by this body. Um, he had already written a letter to this uh, committee delivering his endorsement. He took the extra step to then amplify it in person. And he did so because of confidence in you and because he was delivering a message to us as a committee um, that Supreme Court confirmations should be more than just exercises in partisan tribalism. He said there should be nothing unusual about a judge who just happened to be appointed by a Republican president and who holds conservative legal views coming forward to support a nominee with your impeccable qualifications and character, especially a nominee whose legal opinions, whose actions and decisions as a judge, he was in a position to review for years, given that you were a district court judge and he was a circuit court judge. Look, our confirmation hearings for justices have sadly been devolving over many years into longer and longer exercises of partisan politics punctuated by just brief glimpses and occasional thoughtful examinations of a nominee's judicial decision-making and views on the Constitution, which should properly be our main focus. I have to believe this sad state of affairs troubles my colleagues of both sides and all who watch this. But as I reflect on these hearings, I'm hopeful that your um, gracious, thoughtful exchanges with some members will be remembered as just one more service you've rendered to our nation. And I hope some watching these hearings will be reminded um, that even though we disagree with the policy preferences uh, or opinions of a nominee, we should all recognize when a nominee is fundamentally qualified, deeply committed to the Constitution rule, law, rule of law, and a person of great character. Judge Griffith reminded us at the outset of this week, and I quote, as Justice Scalia taught us, for so long, an indispensable feature of the republic the Constitution created is an independent judiciary of judges who have taken an oath not to a president or a party, but to the American people and to God that they will be impartial. I couldn't agree more with Judge Griffith. You've demonstrated your unwavering commitment to that oath and your impartiality and your abundant qualifications. It will be my honor to support your confirmation for associate justice. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield. Thank you, Senator Coons. The senator from Nebraska, Senator Sass. Thanks, Chairman Durbin. Um, Judge, welcome back. Uh, I'd like to associate myself with parts of what Chris said there in his closing. Um, I would differ with him about uh, whether or not getting to precision on judicial philosophy matters, but you know that. You know I've been wrestling about it for a couple of weeks. Um, but I'd like to affirm Chris's point about the beauty of the hymn to America you told and through the eyes of your parents and the 
the changes, um, the, the growth uh, in the country over the course of the last two generations. And the Wall Street Journal had an editorial this morning that said pretty much the same thing as Chris just said, which is that the, the hymn to America that you gave in your opening on Monday afternoon and some of your comments yesterday were inspiring and, and beautiful. So I associate myself with Senator Coons on that. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about your time as a judge and particularly how you see development and, and growth and change over that time. So take us back nine years and then maybe five years ago and then today. How has your approach uh, to being a judge changed from year one to year five to today? Thank you, Senator. Um, I do think there was a little bit of growth. I hope there was a little bit of growth. Um, Certainly in year one and year five, I was still a district judge, and both of those years differed dramatically from my work um, as an appellate judge, which is where I'm currently stationed. Um, in every job, in year one, you're new, you're trying to figure things out. I don't know that I had quite pinned down at the very beginning uh, exactly how I would approach uh, cases, but by the time I got to year five, I think I had a really good sense of this judging thing um, and was able um, to demonstrate in my opinions, the many, many opinions that I've written, um, the way in which I go about making my decisions. I was able to demonstrate uh, clearly, I think, that the particular parties in the case, the issues in the case, what it's about uh, from a standpoint of personal preference is not an issue. I'm setting those things aside. I am ruling from a position of neutrality and trying to determine uh, in every case what the law requires. I am looking at uh, only the facts and the law in the case. I'm evaluating the arguments of the parties and um, if it's statutory interpretation, I'm trying to ascertain what Congress has intended. I am committed, uh, I think my record shows, to the understanding that that is the role and the only appropriate role for a judge. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the troubling pattern we see on law school campuses and across higher education more broadly, uh, especially in the last five years. Um, there's obviously a trend toward shouting down and canceling opinions that are outside the left-leaning mainstream, uh, calls for firing professors, canceling professors, uh, shouting down and sometimes threatening speakers who bring uh, divergent, uh, diverse opinions, um, calls to discipline fellow students. These tactics are increasingly commonplace, um, particularly against conservative speakers and professors and students, but also uh, increasingly against traditional liberals. Um, I'm a former college president, and one of the sort of oddities uh, that doesn't fit inside the tribalism of how a lot of times media covers things uh, in D.C., one of the oddities for me is how often I have liberal professors reaching out to me saying that their experience on campus is becoming much less interesting, um, that the divide on American political campuses is less and less uh, conservative policy leaning versus liberal or progressive policy leaning, um, but more and more liberal versus illiberal. Um, and I think these campaigns are obviously deeply problematic. They shut down debate uh, rather than teaching students how to engage ideas that they might not have encountered before, which is also a pretty decent definition of education. Uh, if you already knew everything before you ever encountered a new idea, you wouldn't need to write checks or take time off of um, productive life. So there's obviously a tendency in response for students to self-censor rather than learn from each other, and this robs students of the chance to engage with ideas um, from across the political spectrum. But in particular, in law schools, um, it robs students of the opportunity to learn how to consider an alternate po position and argue a different uh, point of view than they might have had. So uh, given that you're a debate champion in earlier days as well, I'd, I'd like to ask if you agree that law students uh, should be engaging with ideas from across the political spectrum, even those they disagree with, rather than trying to shun those different ideas. Thank you, Senator. Um, let me just say, uh, in part because these 
issues or things that could implicate matters that come before the courts. I will just say that as a general matter, um, law school, like many schools, is a place where um, ideas and perspectives are considered. And in the law, uh, as I've said, um, it's important for the judge who's making the decision to have different arguments. And so one of the things uh, that traditionally happens in law schools is that um, you are trained in law to um, make arguments that are at times not even the arguments that you personally agree with because the understanding is that in litigation, in disputes that come before the court, the court is going to want to hear from different viewpoints. Uh, so in that sense, the, the essence of legal instruction is to have different arguments being made because that models in great part what happens in a courtroom. I'm, I really am not trying to ask any kind of gotcha question here. I yes. suspect we highly agree, so I don't understand the qualification you put at the beginning. There's no sort of second order fork on my question. It is better to debate ideas that you disagree with than shout them down, isn't it? It is better in law schools to make sure that there are ideas from all perspectives, and in order to have that happen, they can't be suppressed. So you, you don't want students shouting down other students or visiting professors, right? I mean, I, I'm honestly, I didn't think there was any chance we would differ on this, so I'm not... Yes, no, I'm not, okay. I'm not suggesting You're that we do differ. You're against canceling people, I assume. I, I'm, not, I'm not suggesting that we differ. What I'm, what I'm saying is that... Um, these issues about uh, speech on campus and the like are the kinds of things that are issues that are working their way, you know, in different formats and different ways through the courts. And so I'm just being careful in terms gotcha. of my, my answers. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to lead you because I want to because I think American civic health will be better off. You're going to be a hero. You are already a hero to lots and lots of kids. Students, maybe some bound for the law, but more broadly, students across the country. And uh, I think it's in America's public interest for them to hear you as an advocate for the full, vigorous, strong kid debate of different views. And so I, I suspect you are an advocate for vigorous and robust debate. I don't see how you might be constrained against saying that because of future cases, but um, I'm gonna just assume we're mostly aligned on this. I, I think that's a fair assumption. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to make, uh, before I move on, uh, just because we've had um, a number of members of this committee comment on cameras in the court. Um, I've made my position on this clear a lot of times, but if, if I can give a tiny bit of um, friend of the court brief in advance, because I think it, when, when you're on the court and you all continue to debate this issue, um, I think it should be a decision for the Supreme Court to make about whether or not there are cameras in the courtroom, uh, not a decision for the Article I branch to make for Article Three. But I think it's incredibly important for us to recognize, because I, I think I differ from a lot of my colleagues on this who are advocates for cameras in the courtroom, I get their position. Um, that transparency is a virtue. Transparency is a good thing. I also believe that pen and pad uh, can facilitate a whole heck of a lot of transparency just fine, and it's healthy for Americans to recognize the second and third and fourth order effects of cameras. A huge part of why this institution doesn't work well is because we have cameras everywhere. Um, cameras change human behavior. We know this. You don't have the same kinds of conversation over the dinner table uh, with your family when you're wrestling through issues uh, and apologizing for something and saying, I said this before, but maybe I should modify what I said. I was, my tone was jerky. My substance didn't account for your position. Um, th there's a whole bunch of things that humans can do if they're not immediately mindful of some distant camera audience that they might be trying to create a soundbite for. And uh, Instagram can be useful for some small things, but for intellectual discourse, it is not a friend. Um, and I think we should recognize that the, 
jackassery we often see around here um, is partly because of people mugging for short-term uh, camera opportunities. And it is definitely um, a second and third and fourth order effect that the court should think through um, before it has advocates in there who are not only trying to persuade you nine justices, um, but also trying to get on cable that night uh, or create a viral video. So for what it's worth, I hope that the court um, doesn't respond to some well-meaning uh, impulses from the Congress to, to push for cameras in the courtroom, but also some some bullying. And there are there are ways that you can get to a lot of transparency. Uh, audio recordings are increasingly released uh, from from the Supreme Court in timely or fashion over the past few decades. Um, so for what it's worth, I'm glad that you on the court are making that decision, and I hope it isn't made for you by the by the Congress. I want to go back to the legitimacy of the Supreme Court. That term has been uh, used a few times over the last three days. Do you think the Supreme Court is legitimate? I do, Senator. And so some of the ways that the court has been derided and called illegitimate by members of this Senate include, over the course of recent days and weeks, quote, leans into extreme partisanship, uh, leans into extremism, twists the law, threatens basic liberties, has been hijacked by Republicans. These kinds of attacks undermine the public's trust in the court. We need the public uh, to believe in the legitimacy of its government, including all three branches. So I would ask you, um, do you agree with these characterizations of the court that have been levied in this room over the last few days? Senator, I have nothing but respect for um, my former judicial colleagues, my current judicial colleagues in uh, hopefully my future judicial colleagues. Uh, I do believe that we need legitimacy. Um, I've said that that's uh, the currency of the court, and I look forward, uh, if I'm confirmed, to, to joining the institution. So do you think there could be any opinion that would be handed down this term that could undermine the legitimacy of the court? Senator, I think the Supreme Court um, makes its determinations, and... Um, all of them are precedents, and they are entitled to respect. Um, I'd like to come back to our conversation from yesterday. You pointed out a number of times that as both a district and now a circuit court judge, you were constrained and bound by the Supreme Court's holdings. Uh, you mentioned a couple of times that you haven't had a chance to do uh, much constitutional interpretation for yourself. I largely agree uh, with the way you framed most of that for the lower courts, but I think you would also agree with me that the job of a Supreme Court justice is different uh, than a district court judge and in certain ways from a circuit judge as well. Um, when you serve on the Supreme Court, you'll have to interpret what the Constitution means, and based on what you told us about the constrained role on the lower courts, uh, lower court decisions would then not be able to answer how you would approach the new job you would have on that highest court. And so that's why I thought our conversation on uh, judicial philosophy yesterday was somewhat um, helpful. I'm not a lawyer, but I think you took a lot of us to law school yesterday in ways that were helpful. And in particular, um, you walk at, walked us through some different schools of constitutional and statutory interpretation in ways that I think were good for the committee, were good for the court, and were good for the public more broadly. So I guess I would ask you, um, if you could take us to law school uh, one more time and walk us through some of the different approaches to substantive due process and unenumerated rights, what are the different ideas on the Supreme Court and in the broader legal community? Thank you, Senator. I am um, <clears throat> not uh, mostly familiar with the Supreme Court's precedents in this area. Um, it's been a while now that the Supreme Court has determined that um, the 14th Amendment, which um, guarantees due process, includes a substantive component in addition to procedure. The term due process, one would think, is just uh, about the procedures that the government has to afford you before it um, uh, affects your life, liberty, or property. But the Supreme Court has also said that um, that, that protection extends to certain uh, personal, individual rights 
um, that relate to dignity and autonomy um, and uh, that are deeply rooted in our nation's history and traditions or implicit in the concept of ordered liberty and the kinds of things uh, the court has recognized pursuant to that um, uh, line of jurisprudence are things like um, marriage, um, interracial marriage, uh, the access to contraception, um, uh, a woman's right to terminate her pregnancy, abortion, um, pursuant to or subject to the, the framework established in um, Roe and Casey, um, travel, their, oh, uh, the ch child rearing. Um, the ability to uh, direct your tr your children; uh, those are some of the rights that have been uh, recognized pursuant to the Fourteenth uh, Amendment due, cl due process clause. I'm less familiar with the sort of scholarly debate outside of uh, the Supreme Court's rulings. So, will there be new ones in the future, um, Senator? I am not able to forecast. In every case, the Supreme Court is. Um, looking at a particular set of circumstances consistent with the Article Three requirement that the court look only at cases and controversies. So it would depend on what cases came before the court. So I think, I think that gets at the, the challenge here that you and I have been going back and forth on over the course of a couple of weeks because um, I get – the modesty points about being on the district court, but it seems pretty important to understand what the limits might be um, as a justice. And so I think this morning, again, you stated that your, I think the quote was that your judicial philosophy is your methodology, but I think that a judicial philosophy of some kind is necessarily an input uh, into your judicial methodology and into every justice's actual jurisprudence on the court. And that's why I think it's important for us to unpack that because the philosophies that you've outlined for the committee, again, I think yesterday's uh, back and forth that you and I had on uh, Breyer v. Scalia, um, is important. And you wouldn't claim any of those philosophies for yourself and yet I think the philosophies ultimately instruct judges on the sources and the tools they consult, on how they discern intent, on whether the Constitution is protecting specific limited and defined principles or more general values and whether modern values can be used to infuse our understanding of the Constitution. So um, again, when you narrated a bit of the debate between Justice Breyer, I know you've got lots of uh, intellectual inputs in life, but you've credited him as a, as a brilliant jurist and role model before. And the Scalia debates, you, you didn't really tell us who you thought got the better of the argument. And so I think throughout these two days, you've focused a lot on what the Supreme Court has said. And I think that is helpful and important. Um, but I've been also trying to get at what you think the limits might be on what um, Justice Jackson would be constrained by. So I, I, I feel like, I believe we still haven't heard your judicial philosophy, um, and I, I wish I'd made more progress with you on that. Um, but what we do know on a personal note um, is that these committee uh, three days have been very long, and I want to thank you and got to have a nice conversation with your parents earlier, your whole family, uh, for what you've uh, endured and uh, for spending time with us and um, obviously wish best wishes to you and your family. Thank you, Judge. Thank you. One more minute. Thank you, Senator Sass and Senator Blumenthal is next. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Judge Jackson, uh, I know your birthday, <laughs> September 14th. Yes, sir. You have the happy coincidence of a birthday with Constance Baker Motley. Yes, sir. Uh, who just happens to have been born in New Haven, Connecticut. Ah. And <laughs> uh, we're very proud that she is a daughter of New Haven and Connecticut. And uh, she is one of my heroes as well. As you know about her, she was the first black woman appointed to the federal bench. She is the first black woman to have argued before the United States Supreme Court. In fact, her record before the court was 10 wins and zero losses. She was 
very predominantly responsible for Brown versus Board of Education. Thurgood Marshall got most of the credit, but she did a lot of the work. Probably sounds familiar <laughs> to you. Uh, so why don't you tell us and maybe tell those folks, particularly uh, women and girls who are watching or listening, why you said at the outset of the hearings here that she was one of those whose shoulders you stood upon as you came here today. Thank you, Senator. Um, well, in addition uh, to the fact that we share a birthday, which I discovered when I was in law school and thought, what a happy coincidence in terms of someone who I so admired. And um, secretly at that point, I was thinking maybe I might want to be a judge. So it was a wonderful, uh, wonderful coincidence. Um, I so admired the fact that she was the first. Um, it's not it's not necessarily easy to be the first, but it um, it is an opportunity to show other people what is possible. When you're the first, it means no one has ever done it before like you. And there may be um, hundreds, thousands of people who might have wanted that opportunity and thought, I can't do that because there's no one there like me. And so being um, a trailblazer, whether it's um, Judge Motley or uh, uh, Justice Marshall or Justice O'Connor, being a trailblazer um, is, is really inspiring, I think. And, um, and I was always um, moved by Judge Motley's experience and, and think it may even be part of why I moved um, in this direction. Well, it is inspiring, and I hope that your very inspiring story will make it possible for a lot of others to think it not secretly, but <laughs> say it out loud and aspire to it because it's what this country needs. And fortunately, President Biden has recognized it in the nominees that he's put before us. and. Uh, we've tried to work with the great leadership of Senator Durbin to confirm people of real merit, the kind of qualifications in intellect and character and depth and warmth that you bring to us today. I want to talk a little bit about voting rights because part of the reason why those dreams now are realities is that more people have the right to vote at least until recently. Uh, in fact, there has been a lot of backsliding about turning back the clock on voting rights. Uh, the gentleman sitting behind you, uh, Doug Jones, our former colleague, whom we very much respect and admire, wrote a tribute to uh, Vivian Malone Jones who has a rich story as a civil rights warrior and who succeeded John Lewis as head of the Voter Rights Project. And he said in a speech that Doug Jones wrote in tribute to her as she was inducted posthumously into the Alabama Women's Hall of Fame, I'm quoting, we can best honor her by acknowledging that while most doors are unlocked today, they are still heavy and so hard to open for so, so many people in Alabama and the rest of the nation. Let us commit ourselves to do our part to open these doors as wide as possible so that everyone can take the walk that Vivian took. I'm going to ask that former Senator Jones' full speech be entered in the record, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The simple fact of the matter is, uh, Judge Jackson, uh, Congress passed the Voting Rights Act in 1965. It was a source of real power 
to so many people who got the right to vote for the first time in practical terms because it struck down more than 1,000 discriminatory election rules proposed by state and local officials. It opened the ballot box to millions and millions of Americans. And it became regarded as the crown jewel of the civil rights movement. And then, just in the last few years, the Supreme Court has hacked away at it in an exercise of judicial activism that has been historic in magnitude. Judges supplanting their views for the policy preferences and official acts of legislatures in opinions that were written and joined by only conservative justices, these decisions were about as far from judicial restraint as they could possibly be, not, not even close. And they rewrote the rules of our most cherished and most bipartisan civil rights laws. Uh, you know the cases, Shelby County, Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee, in effect, their opinions, including Justice Alito's decision in Brnovich, are completely untethered from the clear statutory text. And they impose a series of so-called so guideposts on Section 2 that create unreasonably high hurdles to the exercise of the Voting Rights Act. I hope that you will bring to the court that deliberate, careful methodology that you described earlier very convincingly. It is part of your judicial philosophy in the sense that it's your approach to cases. And it has been very persuasively and clearly articulated. And I think if that kind of deliberate and careful methodology had prevailed, on the United States Supreme Court, we would still have the Voting Rights Act in full right now. And I hope that we can once again return to bipartisan support of those rights. The most recent exercise of uh, unfortunate decision making in the voting rights area came just hours ago when the Supreme Court struck down the decision of the Wisconsin State Supreme Court in Wisconsin Legislature versus Wisconsin Elections Commission. What is striking is not only the result, but the fact that it was done as part of the shadow docket. We've talked a lot about it here. And what the people of America could, should know is there's no oral argument. There's only minimal briefing. There are no full opinions of the court. In fact, I'm holding up a per curiam opinion that is about 12 pages in length from the court, which means you don't know who wrote it. And there is a powerful dissent. I recommend that everyone read it. Again. Use of the shadow docket has become increasingly prevalent since 2017. And in effect, the United States Supreme Court is shirking its duty. I hope you will bring to the court the kind of responsible and methodical approach to decision making that will lead to an avoidance of the shadow docket, as well as a return to the Voting Rights Act. And if I can just offer one more piece of advice on the court's workload, uh, I have um, a chart. Uh, I know we're not going by the rules of evidence here, but uh, this chart uh, indicates the uh, signed decisions of the United States Supreme Court over a good part of its history. And I think the pattern here is pretty clear.
the court issues fewer sign opinion. In fact, it has declined precipitously since 1972. This little blip at the end here is an increase from 53 to 57. But you can see it's only a fraction of what the court used to do in signed opinions. Even from the time when I was a law clerk, it's diminished profoundly. The Supreme Court needs to do its job. It needs to issue signed opinions, not the shadow docket. It needs to take cases and resolve real, fundamental, important issues. And taking your record, 573 opinions over nine years, I'm not a math major, but that's about 64 opinions a year. That's a lot more than they do, all nine of them. So I hope you will bring the energy that you have demonstrated in this room, the energy and the work ethic to the United States Supreme Court, because clearly you have both. And I think the court is very much in need of it, as it is some of the other great qualities, intellect, character, that you have demonstrated here. Uh, just a couple more points, if I may. Um, you were asked earlier about dissents. Uh, I want to ask you about one in particular, uh, the dissent of your mentor and your predecessor on the court, Justice Breyer. Uh, I am told, I think I've read, that there is one opinion that he is proudest of. Could you tell us what you recall it being, if you know? Senator, I'm not able to answer that question. Well, I think he said that uh, the dissent that he is proudest of was in parents involved in community schools versus Seattle School District. Uh, I think he said it was the opinion that he was proudest of. Uh, and he cited it in a Harvard Law School symposium about his notable opinions. Uh, and he said this dissent was most notable. Uh, I will give you the citation uh, when we're done um, and ask that it be entered into the record, Mr. Chairman. Without objection. Uh, it's 77 pages long, and it's a dissent. Uh, it's a dissent in the parents involved case, which was a five justice plurality invalidating public school integration plans in Seattle and Louisville. The plans had been in place for decades, put in place by two local school boards voluntarily trying to address school segregation in public schools in both of those cities. And the justices, conservative justice, striking down the school integration plans said, in effect, they couldn't move forward with those integration plans. Uh, you may recall it is um, the opinion where uh, Chief Justice Roberts said very famously, the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discrimination, stop discriminating on the basis of race. Justice Breyer, in dissent, which reminded me of a lot of what you've said here this week, wrote, quote, I do not claim to know how best to stop harmful discrimination, how best to create a society 
that includes all Americans, how best to overcome our serious problems of increasing de facto segregation. But as a judge, I do know that the Constitution does not authorize judges to dictate solutions to these problems. Rather, the Constitution creates a democratic political system through which the people themselves, through their legislators, must find, must together find answers. The court should leave them to their work. I think that's the philosophy that you articulated here today, the judicial philosophy of separate branches of government, as you so eloquently dis described our constitutional scheme, our federalism that really should have led the court to respect the Wisconsin Supreme Court's decision and the Wisconsin governor's decision and to stay in its lane, as you have put it so well. The fact is there has been a lot of progress, and we see it in this hearing room. But there is a lot of work still to be done, and there's a lot of reason for folks to feel even some anger at what we've seen on voting rights and on resegregation in some areas. So I am really excited, as I've indicated, and joyful at the great landmark and the historic accomplishment that your nomination represents and reflects. And I hope, as I've said, that not only will you make the court look more like America, but hopefully think more like America. And I want to thank you for your very hard work, all of what you personally have done, because you as a person have done it. And history has given you this opportunity. Your parents have helped to make it possible. Your family story is so powerful. But you've really earned it. And we're grateful to you for providing all of us that role model. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Blumenthal. Senator Holy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Judge, good to see you again. Good to see you, Senator. We don't uh, have a lot of time, so let me just get straight into it. Uh, Senator Cruz was asking you at the end of, of his time and questionings about United States versus Stewart. This is the case where Neil Stewart tried to cross state lines to rape another person's nine-year-old daughter. He had 6,700 images and videos of egregious and brutal child pornography. The government recommended 97 months. The guidelines said 97 to 121 months. You came in at 57 months. Senator Cruz asked you why. The chairman wouldn't let you, let you answer. I thought maybe you'd like to answer now. Thank you, Senator. No one case can stand in for a judge's entire record. I have sentenced more than 100 people in a variety of egregious circumstances in every case, and especially cases that involve the kinds of acts that you're talking about, the kinds of evidence that I had to deal with as a judge. In every case, I am balancing the factors that Congress has determined are appropriate and required for a judge to make a determination. The data points that Senator Cruz pointed to that you may have in front of you don't account for all of the information that was before me as a judge and the authority that you all, Congress, and your prior confirmation when I was a district judge provided for me to exercise my judgment. And I treated those cases and every case very seriously and imposed a sentence that was sufficient but not greater than necessary to promote the purposes of punishment. Would it surprise you to learn that Mr. Stewart is a recidivist? He was warrants issued again for his arrest just three years after you sentenced him? Would it surprise me? Yeah. Would it surprise you? You know, Senator, um, 
there is data in the Sentencing Commission and elsewhere that indicates that there are recidivism, serious recidivism issues. And so uh, among the various people that I've sentenced, I'm not surprised that there are people who reoffend, and it is a terrible thing that happens in our system. Yeah, indeed it is. Let me ask you about the Hawkins case. You and I talked about this yesterday. You've been able to think about it overnight. This is a case where you had an 18-year-old who possessed and distributed hundreds of images of 8-year-olds and 9-year-olds and 10-year-olds, and you gave him, frankly, a slap on the wrist sentence of three months. Senator, Do you I regret it? I don't remember whether it was um, distribution or possession in it the was law. Both. Do you regret it? In, in the law, there are different... Uh, crimes that people commit Judge, in Judge, you gave this him area. three months. My question is, do you regret it or not? Senator, what I regret is that in a hearing about my qualifications to be a justice on the Supreme Court, we've spent a lot of time focusing on this small subset of my sentences, and I've tried to explain You regret that many we're focusing times. on your cases? I don't understand. No, you. no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about the fact that you're talking about Child pornography seven cases? very serious cases. I'm glad we agree on that. Don't you some, think we should be some, some, of which, some of which involve conduct that I sentence people to 25, 30 years. Three months before. in this case, Judge. Do you regret it? You haven't answered my question yet. Senator, Do you regret this sentence? Senator, I would have to look at the circumstances. What I'm telling you... You you know the circumstances. We discussed it for half an hour yesterday. There's a 55-page transcript, which I'm sure you've read. You I lived it. Not, As you've not. emphasized to this committee over and over, you've lived it, right? You said that you've been through all of this. You've looked at all of the images. You're the one who's had to endure all of it. You gave him a three-month sentence. I just wonder if you regret it or if you stand by it. I mean, do you stand by that sentence? Senator, in every case, I followed what Congress authorized me to do in looking to the best of my ability at all of the various factors that apply, that constrain judges, that give us discretion, but also tell us how to sentence. And I ruled in every case based on all of the relevant factors. So you don't regret it? No one case, Senator, can stand in for a judge. I'm not asking you that. I'm record. asking if you regret this sentence in this case. And it sounds like the answer is no. But I want to tell you, I regret it. I regret that you gave him only three months. Let me read to you what you said about these kinds of cases. In fact, to this defendant, you said, make no mistake, Mr. Hawkins, the children you saw in those pictures were not willing participants in the conduct that you witnessed. They were being forced to commit unspeakable acts of sexual violence for the pleasure of the person who was filming, and for the gratification of sick people everywhere, people who apparently have no shred of empathy for what this must be doing to the children who are being abused in this way. You go on. Some of the children you saw in those pictures will never, never have an adult, a normal adult relationship. Some of them will turn to drugs and prostitution and other vices to try to deal emotionally with the pain that results from the torture that they have experienced. And even those who manage to lead a somewhat normal adult life say they live in constant fear of being recognized. Some people are even unable to leave their houses because once those pictures are on the internet, they are there forever. And the victims can't do anything without worrying that every person that they meet has seen them in their most vulnerable state at the most horrible time in their lives. That's your words, pages 34 and 35, the transcript, powerful words, Judge. I just don't understand why after saying this and believing this, you could give this guy three months in prison when the probation office that we've heard so much about recommended 18 months. Even the probation office recommended 18 months. Do you have anything to add? No, Senator. Let me ask you about your policy of not giving enhancements when there are prepubescent children, like there were in the Hawkins case, who are eight, nine, ten years old, when there are prepubescent children involved, I don't. I, I'm just struggling to understand this. You said it in Hawkins. You said that you weren't going to give him an enhancement. You weren't going to give make his sentence any tougher, despite the fact that we had all of these terrible videos that you and I talked about at length 
yesterday. This is page 38 of the transcript, just so that we're all following along. You said, in your case, I don't feel that it is appropriate necessarily to increase the penalty on the basis of your use of a computer, and we've talked about that, or the number of images or prepubescent victims as the guidelines require, because these circumstances exist in many cases, if not most, and they don't signal an especially heinous or egregious child pornography offense. You said the same thing in the Cooper case just last year. This was an individual, Cooper, who was 30 years old at the time of his sentencing. He pleaded guilty to distributing child pornography. He posted between three and four dozen images of child exploitation to Tumblr, where it could be accessed publicly. The government said, and I'll quote from the transcript in that case, page 37, when his devices were found, including the computer, within the computer and on an untitled folder were many, many, many videos. The nature of these videos went well beyond mere child pornography. The government says, I don't mean to make light of the content of any child pornography, but rather to say that the content of those videos is on the more egregious or extreme spectrum of the child pornography videos that are encountered in these cases. And yet when you sentenced him, you said, I'm quoting now from the transcript in Cooper, I'm really reluctant to get into the nature of the porn. And then later, it's very difficult to assess how different Mr. Cooper's images are than those of other similarly situated child pornography dependent, uh, defendants, rather, such that I, without going into looking at them, and I'm not an expert, you say. So you say, while I understand the government's arguments, Mr. Miranda, the government's arguments in that regard, I don't find them persuasive from the standpoint of characterizing this as an especially egregious child pornography offense. Help me understand this, Judge. Why is it that you, what's your policy disagreement with the guidelines treating images, videos, porno, pornographic images that have small children, infants, seven, eight, nine-year-olds, why won't you give an enhancement for those? Help me understand that. Thank you, Senator. I'll make two responses. First, that's not my policy disagreement. I don't know why you've characterized that in that way. Well, wait a minute, I wait a minute. You say, you say right here in the cases, I mean, this is, this is the, what I want to get, I want to make sure that we're talking about the same thing here. This, in the Hawkins case, I don't feel that it's appropriate necessarily to increase the penalty on the basis of your use of a computer or the number of images or prepubescent victims. And you say the same thing in Cooper. Senator, two observations. One, I am sentencing in every case. I have policy disagreements with certain aspects of the operation of the guidelines that I lay out in every case as Congress has required and as the Supreme Court permits in light of my experience, not only as a district judge, but also on the Sentencing Commission, which did a report about the operation of the guidelines. Second, you've read extensively from the government's argument in this case. You have not provided information from the probation office or the defense. And I, when I don't judge, have the probation office report. No, excuse me, Senator. The probation office provides a, a recommendation. There has been information gathered about what a recommendation was given in each one of these cases. I don't have that information here, but what I'm saying is that in every case, the judge is not just hearing from the government. The, the, the judge is not just evaluating what the government says in these cases. In every criminal case, a judge has to take into account all sorts of factors, including arguments being made by the defendant, by the government, by the probation office. So I understand that in certain cases, the government may have made an argument, but there are other people in our criminal justice system who make arguments, and the court evaluates everything as Congress has directed, and no one case can stand in for my entire record of how I deal with criminal cases or did when I was a district judge. I have law enforcement in my family. I am a mother who has daughters who took these cases home with me at night because they are so graphic in terms of the kinds of images that you are describing. They give you not only the actual videos, which you can ask 
to see, but they describe in the briefs in detail what these videos show. So I am fully aware of the seriousness of this offense and also my obligation to take into account all of the various aspects of the crime as Congress has required me to do, and I made a determination seriously in each case. Uh, what I'm trying to understand is why is it that you say multiple times that just because there are prepubescent victims in Cooper, in Hawkins, that that does not signal that this is a heinous or egregious child pornography offense, and you're not going to apply any sentencing enhancements that the government's asking you for. The sentence gets to be less because you say, I'm not going to apply. The government asked for enhancements related to prepubescent children, related to the, the nature of these images. You say, I'm not going to apply it. But I get, what you're telling me is, I guess, that you, you don't have a policy objection? I mean, why, why didn't you apply the enhancements as they were asked for? Senator, I've answered this question many times from many senators who've asked me, so I'll stand on what I've already said. So you have nothing to add about, about why these crimes, why these images, in your view, do not signal an especially heinous or egregious child pornography offense. That's Hawkins, you say in Cooper, I understand the government's argument, but I don't find them persuasive, the fact that there were prepubescent children, from the standpoint of characterizing this as an especially egregious child pornography offense. That's page 58. Let me ask you this. You said, Senator Graham, to Senator Graham earlier today that you were trying to do what's rational, and you didn't in sentencing in these cases, and you didn't think it was rational to sentence people who had thousands of images by using a computer to the sentencing guidelines, to the, man, to the mandatory range. I'm sorry, it's not mandatory, to the no longer mandatory range, the discretionary range. No, Senator, I said the guidelines system is designed to be rational. Okay, so let me ask you this. Why isn't it rational to sentence people who have thousands of images on a computer to more time as opposed to somebody who has one or two pictures in the mail. In other words, the more images there are, why wouldn't you want to sentence that person to more time rather than less? Why isn't that rational? Senator, I've answered this question, and I'll stand on what I already answered. So, but, but your answer is what? I mean, refresh my memory. Senator, I've answered this question. I've explained how the guidelines work, and I'll stand on my answer. But the guidelines are not mandatory. I wish they were, but they're not. The Supreme Court made that determination. I'm trying to understand why you think it's rational not to sentence criminals based on the number of images they have. You say that this is a policy disagreement that you have with the guidelines. This gets to the core of your judicial philosophy. You served on the Sentencing Commission where you recommended changes to the guidelines based in part on this policy disagreement. So I think it's relevant and indeed vital we understand what the policy disagreement is. That's what I'm trying to get at here. Senator, I previously explained what the policy disagreement is, and I will stand on my answer. So you're not going to answer my question? No, I've answered your question and my answer you is You haven't I've answered my question. I'm sitting here asking you, and you're declining to answer. I've explained how uh, the guidelines work. I've explained that... Um, the guidelines were developed at a time in which the commission of this crime was different than it is today. I've explained that Congress has not uh, intervened to uh, revise or direct the commission around how to deal with the changes in the commission of this crime. And so judges all over the country are grappling with uh, how to apply this guideline under these circumstances. And there's ex an extreme amount of disparity. And in each case, a judge has to look at all of the factors, not just the guidelines, not just what the government asks for, but the recommendations of the probation office, the arguments of the government and the defense, the nature and circumstances of the offense, the history and characteristics of the defendant, the need for the sentence imposed to promote the purposes of punishment, which include things like rehabilitation. Also, in every case, Congress has authorized judges to impose not only 
terms of imprisonment, which are a very important part of the consequences for these crimes, but a range of other uh, uh, preventative kinds of measures which courts impose in cases to prevent these defendants from repeating these egregious, uh, uh, this type of egregious conduct. And I talked uh, to each defendant, as you have quoted, explaining to them the harms that their crimes caused. And I imposed not only a term of imprisonment, but also all of the other consequences of the offense to include decades of supervision, restrictions on use of a computer, and the like. That's my answer. I've answered it many times. Do you have other questions for me? Um, yeah, I do. I, I do, because I, I want to I try to understand when you talk about the guidelines being outdated and outmoded, I understand that they were written, the initial guidelines were written at a time when computers were not common, everybody didn't have one, certainly didn't have phones in every pocket like we do now, smartphones. So I understand that. I also understand that the number of images, sexually exploitative images of children on these devices has exploded. And so I'm trying to get at what Senator Coons earlier characterized as a pretty fundamental policy question, which I think is the correct characterization here. I'm trying to understand your view on why it is that while the images, the number of images available on these things has exploded, that sentencing shouldn't track that. You see what I'm saying? I mean, you've made the argument, if I understand you right, and I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, you've made the argument that, well, look, the guidelines were written at a time when this stuff was like, it was, it was an individual picture, it was, you know, magazines, whatever. Now, almost every offender, I, I think, this is the argument, so you correct me, almost every offender, because of the nature of this, they've got tens, hundreds, sometimes thousands. I mean, be, partly because of the nature of this. My question to you is, wouldn't we want to deter that? Isn't that a reason to impose tougher sentences? I mean, Senator, go ahead. The, the Congress has every ability to do that. What's happening now is that you have a guideline that has gradations in it for the number of images that ends up being, when you look at the scale, something like the difference of 10 years. I'm making, I, I don't know exactly what it is, but each each two-level enhancement is like several years. And the gradations are like zero to, and again, I don't have it in front of me, but it's like zero to 50 pictures, 50 to 100 pictures, 100 to 150 pictures, set up at a time in which the male was the primary mode of possession and distribution. And so if somebody had 50 pictures, they, according to Congress and the commission at the time, deserved an extra 10 years in prison. Now, with that scale, everybody's at the top immediately, just because of the nature of the internet. So you're not differentiating using that scale anymore, given the way this crime is committed. And so judges are having to decide how are we going to deal with the penalties and do our jobs to impose sentences that are sufficient but not greater than necessary under these circumstances. Yep. Thank you, Judge. I'll just, I'll just say in closing that I, I appreciate that answer, and I understand that as a policy matter. I just think we disagree. I think that somebody, the more images are there, the more punishment there should be, and I want to see this deterred. Mm -hmm. And I just think we've pretty fundamentally disagreed. I've enjoyed our exchanges. Thank you for your candor, and uh, I appreciate it. I, I just disagree with you on the law. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Senator Hirono. Uh, Mr. Chairman. M Mr. Chairman. Senator Hirono's time. Uh, Mr. Thank Chairman, you, Mr. I'm, Chairman. I'm asking to be recognized to make, make a point to the chairman. No, uh, Mr. Chairman. I believe he recognized uh, me. May I proceed? Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I, I waited my turn on here, and I've been on this committee for 40 seven years. I, I think we ought to follow the regular order. Mr. Mr. Chairman, the witness just said that we cannot understand those I'm cases sorry, without Senator, the pre-sentence report. I don't reports. want to go through this again. I have a letter that I want to enter into the, the record that's the signed by that 10 senators followed. on this committee. Are, do you, do you, are you not even going to allow a letter from 10 senators you on this committee? Send any letter, you can do it the, the, This letter that is signed by 10 senators on the committee addressed to you makes the point that the White House gave you probation information for Democrats that was not provided to the minority on this committee. 
And just now, Judge Jackson told Senator Hawley, you cannot understand these cases without reading the probation reports. Ten senators on this committee are asking the chairman, Mr. chairman to provide those reports so we can do what Judge Jackson Mr. just chairman, said, I, which I, is to I assess the, those reports. And Mr. here is chairman, the I, I know I ask the unanimous know consent the to be admitted senator, to the record. I know the junior senator from Texas likes to get on television. But most of us have been here a long time trying to follow the rules. Uh, and he could very easily hand you a letter to go in the record. He's saying he's doing this to help uh, Senator Hawley. Senator Hawley could have put it in, and he didn't. Yeah. But let's get back to regular Senator order. Senator Hawley didn't sense. write the letter. Mr. Let's Chairman, I ask unanimous order. consent that it be admitted to the record. Senator Reno. Are, Thank you. Are, are you denying consent? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Aloha, Judge Jackson. Aloha. I'm going to try and spread some aloha into this room. <laughs> I'm taking a lead from uh, my friend, Senator, uh, sitting to my left. Well, at least you and I are very color coordinated today. <laughs> so since 2018, I have been asking every nominee that comes before the committees on which I said the two questions that I asked you at the start of my time, namely whether or not they have a history of sexual assault or harassment, this is something I started uh, in 2018 to make sure that harassment and abuse that women mainly have put up with since, uh, as far as I'm concerned, time immemorial, didn't continue to get swept under the rug. I found these questions to be important for nominees to the judiciary. As Chief Justice Roberts stated in his 2017 year-end report on the federal judiciary, Events in recent months have illuminated the depth of the problem of sexual harassment in the workplace, and events in the past few weeks have made clear that the judicial branch is not immune. Here are just a few examples of abusive practices by federal judges. In December 2017, six former law clerks and, and staffers accused Ninth Circuit Judge Alex Kozinski of subjecting them to a range of inappropriate sexual conduct and comments. In September 2019, the 10th Circuit Judicial Council issued an order finding that District Court Judge Carlos Miguel, apologize if I mis mispronounce his last name, had harassed multiple employees over a period of years, including by subjecting them to sexually suggestive comments, inappropriate text messages, and excessive non-work-related conduct. In February 2020, a former law clerk to the late Ninth Circuit Judge Stephen Reinhardt accused the judge of a months-long harassment campaign. And these are a few of the cases that we know about. There are undoubtedly many more we don't know about, both because of the power imbalance between federal judges and their clerks and employees who often rely on connections and recommendations to advance in their careers and because of the lack of legal recourse available to the judicial employees. Many may not realize this, but federal judicial branch employees are not protected by the foundational federal statutes, such as Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that prohibit discrimination and retaliation. And that's why I introduced, along with Chair Durbin and Senators Whitehouse and Murray, the Judicial Accountability Act which would ensure the more than 30,000 employees of the federal judiciary have strong statutory rights and protections against discrimination, sexual harassment, retaliation, and other forms of workplace conduct. I know you can't comment on legislation, so I won't ask you whether you support the Judicial Accountability Act. Instead, I'd like to hear what you do to make sure your chambers is a safe, inclusive place to work. Thank you, Senator. Um, I, as you know, have been a judge now uh, for almost a decade. And um, I take my responsibilities not only um, to hear and decide cases seriously, but also my responsibility as um, an employer that I bring law clerks into my chambers. Um, I was a law clerk to three wonderful federal judges who were role models for me. And um, I try to act as a role model 
to my law clerks. I try to bring in people who, um, who have the respect of others, people who come with strong recommendations, people who I think will get along with one another, um, and certainly people who I think will get along with me. And we create um, a little group, uh, a working group, uh, and I think that it's, it's worked out well. And I would uh, think that you would make sure that there are no instances of inappropriate behavior, sexual harassment from any of your uh, clerks or employees. That's absolutely correct. Uh, during our courtesy meeting, I enjoyed learning more about your background and family. And of the nine sitting justices of the Supreme Court, only three, Justices Alito, Breyer, and Kagan were educated in our public school system. And you would, as far as I'm concerned, make a welcome addition to the court from that standpoint as a public school graduate myself. So public high schools educate people from all backgrounds, and most people go to public schools. Most people don't go or get to go to private schools. So your classmates probably came from different racial and ethnic backgrounds, incomes, social statuses, academic abilities, athletic ab abilities, among others. How, if at all, has your public school experience shaped the person you are and your approach to the law? Thank you, Senator. I was uh, very fortunate to go to uh, public school in Miami, Florida. Um, I had a wide range of uh, classmates and it was a wonderful opportunity to get to know people who were different than me um, and to learn at the end of the day that they were not so different mm. than, than I am um, even if they came from different backgrounds and I've talked a lot about my debate team um, that was one of the activities that I engaged in and spent a lot of time with my uh, colleagues on the debate team and with, with my wonderful uh, coach. And you learn how to support each other, how to speak across difference, how to, um, how to communicate with different kinds of people. And it was, it was a wonderful experience and, and as I've mentioned in, in many ways different than uh, the generation before um, who uh, in Florida uh, were segregated by law. So I take it that uh, not only did you have uh, I, I would say uh, a broad experience of encountering people from uh, all different walks of life and backgrounds but there, there was still uh, commonality that you had. Very much so. And, and that is very much exemplified in your approach to your work. I also talked with you about the importance of uh, the creative part of our lives, <laughs> because I think uh, lawyers tend to be very left brain, and I, I know that you are a very uh, well-rounded person, and so I asked you, what, what do you do to uh, pay attention to the creative side of your, of, of your life? Thank you for the question. Um, I took up, not too long ago, but took up uh, the fiber arts, as they say. Um, my mother is an expert crochet artist. Um, she makes beautiful um, pieces of all kinds, and I always wanted to do that. I always wanted to, and she tried to teach me when I was younger, and it didn't quite turn out. Um, but as I um, have gone along in my career and wanting to have some sort of a creative outlet, and especially in times of, of high stress, mm -hmm. um, I started pining for uh, something to do uh, to express my creative side. And um, I bought a book on crochet. I talked to my mom. I started making hats and scarves, and then I moved to knitting during one of my confirmation um, hearing uh, scenarios because I needed something to to keep my mind off of uh, keep my mind off of the stress. So I, I I have a basement full of yarn. If you if you'd like to come over. <laughs> <laughs> 
I think that's another way that you're connecting to the people who really meant um, mean a lot to you. Um, the creative outlet is really important to me because uh, in a changing world, I think it is our ability to be creative in our approaches uh, and how we think about things that will enable us to deal with the rapid changes that uh, um, happen every day in these days. I uh, view you as a consensus builder. And so I know that in your work with the Sentencing Commission, you uh, really worked hard to come up with uh, some 95% of the time. The, in this very diverse group, there was consensus in your recommendations. How important do you think a consensus is on what I characterized yesterday as a very ideologically split, uh, split Supreme Court? I think consensus is very important. Um, it was one of the things that I um, most admired about having the opportunity to, to work uh, for Justice Breyer as a law clerk, to observe his um, process for reaching out to colleagues and uh, trying to collaborate in his uh, thought process about the outcomes of cases. And it's something that I tried to emulate um, when I was on the Sentencing Commission, which, as you said, is a very diverse body. Um, and um, I saw in that context the importance of uh, trying to reach common ground with respect to your determinations. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, to um, illustrate the kind of uh, broad support that uh, this nominee has, I would like to enter into the record two letters, one signed by 1,000 public defenders from all across the country, and another from, uh, signed by 48 prosecutors from across the country. Judge Jackson, I have very much enjoyed Without the privilege objection. of talking with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, it will be my privilege to support your nomination. Thank Aloha. you, Senator. Thank you very much, Senator. Mr. Chairman. Senator from yeah, Iowa. I have a letter here signed by uh, members on my side of the aisle I'd like to put in record. Without objection. I'd like to comment. I had a chance to review this letter for the first time just a minute ago. Uh, there is a, apparently a concern on your side, Mr. Chairman, about whether you have on your side of the aisle access to all the information that we have on this side of the aisle and all the information that's in the possession of the White House. During a break earlier today, I met with the ranking member, Senator Grassley, his staff, and with White House staff to discuss it. Here's my understanding of what has transpired. Last Wednesday evening, the senator from Missouri selected a handful of Judge Jackson's more than 1,000 district court cases to claim that Judge Jackson, quote, endangers our children, close quote. On Thursday, the next day, the White House contacted Judge Jackson's chambers to request the probation office recommendation in each of the cases. I, I you know, underline probation office. That probation office provided a chart reflecting these recommendations. This is the sum total of what was provided. They shared with the White House from the chambers. When the senator from Missouri continued to raise questions, and request the probation office's recommendation in these cases, the probation office provided this chart reflecting those recommendations which were shared with the White House. When the senator from Missouri continued to raise questions about Judge Jackson's sentencing record, my staff asked the White House for information about the probation office recommendations. These are just numbers for each one of the cases. That's all that is. The White House and my office didn't have this information earlier because we didn't know the senator from Missouri was going to make this claim in the first place. Once the Republican side requested the same information, my staff shared it within minutes. So now your side, Senator, has exactly what the White House and the Democratic side has, the same chart provided by the probation office. Uh, and I might add that some of this had been published in the press in Washington Post and other places, but it consists in each case of the case number, name, uh, the probation office recommendation for custody, the sentence imposed custody, probation office recommended supervision and release, and the supervision and release imposed. All of that information has now been shared equally. Some information on the other side, 
on the Republican side includes frequent reference to transcripts, which we don't have on this side. And the reason being we didn't anticipate this objection from the senator from Missouri and request that information. Now, the letter also goes a step beyond, which I think is a very important decision for this committee to make. This request for pre-sentence reports from each of these cases. Now, these pre-sentence reports are typically filed under seal. They can contain highly sensitive personal information, not just about the defendant, but about innocent third parties and victims. We've spent a lot of time here reflecting on these terrible crimes. Everyone has acknowledged how terrible they are and how damaging they can be to the victims. We have heard story after story, and I don't question a single word that was spoken in sympathy for these same victims. I would not want it weighing on my conscience that we are turning over these pre-sentence reports to this committee for the first time in history and that information out of this or because it was released would somehow compromise or endanger any victim as a result of it. This information was not requested before. It's never been requested by this committee. And I think we ought to think long and hard about whether or not we even consider going into pre-sentence reports. So I'm going to take this matter up with our side, and I'm sure you will with your side. I have your letter requesting it. As far as this information, you have exactly what we have, no more, no less. In terms of pre-sentence reports, this is a critical policy question, which ought to be carefully weighed. It goes way beyond, I'm sorry, Senator uh, Judge Jackson, it goes way beyond your nomination. And I want to make certain that we don't take a step here that endangers the lives or well-being of innocent people. Mr. Chairman, uh, since you did just responded to the letter that I wrote and was submitted on behalf of, of 10 senators, uh, I will point out that in Judge Jack Jackson's answer to Senator Hawley, she said that he and this committee did not have sufficient information to assess her sentencing decisions because we heard the arguments of the prosecutors in the transcript, but we did not have the recommendation from the probation office. And what she testified under oath is you can't understand what, why she I issued her sentences without having those probation reports. You are right that there can be sensitive victim information in those reports, and, and everyone on this side, I'm confident, uh, would agree to redacting out any information that, that would violate the privacy of a victim. But Judge Jackson has told us it is relevant to understanding those cases, and, and that's why 10 of us have requested we have those reports, and there's explicit statutory authority for us to do so that is cited uh, in the letter we just submitted. Senator, I don't know where other members of your caucus stand on the basic question of this nomination. They can decide on their own, and they will, and they should. That is their responsibility. I think I know where you're headed, and I would just suggest that we ought to think long and hard, my friends, about members of the Judiciary Committee endangering the lives of innocent people to pursue this line of questioning. We spent two days, 15, 16, 17, 18 hours, and a large part of it on this issue. I don't believe these pre-sentencing reports are going to change anyone's disposition if they're going to vote on this issue. And I, I do not want it weighing on my conscience that I gave the green light to release this information so that it might endanger the lives of innocent victims. I'm sorry. That's a bridge too far for me. I think the issue before us on sentencing, you each had a chance to hear plenty of testimony on it. And I, I believe this should be taken up with the individual caucuses on both sides, if you wish. But uh, that, to me, is it's gone way too far, way too far. I don't want it on my conscience. Mr. Mr. Chairman, if I might. So when, like, when, when I agree with you, I've prosecuted literally thousands of people. Uh, I would have to go back and see over eight years. I can't, I can't remember the hundreds of sentencings uh, I was at where we had pre-sentence reports over and over again. There were things in there that were sensitive. Sometimes reflecting somebody who were putting their lives on the line to even give a report. Uh, neither the defense counsel nor I as a prosecutor ever thought those would be made public. And we assumed that the judges 
We had judges across the political uh, stripes who read them, kept the confidence of that. As a result, we knew that the reports were, were thorough. Um, and a judge has the final say, but as a prosecutor, I might have a recommendation, but I never question a judge who might give a different um, sentence because my my responsibility as prosecutor, theirs was the sentence. Senator Lee. Yeah, might I just uh, weigh in here? I, I un totally understand the concern that you're describing relative to the confidential nature of pre-sentence reports. As a prosecutor and as a law clerk, I reviewed those with some regularity, and I understand the sensitivity of them. Let me suggest a couple of things. First of all, it's not unusual for us as a committee and as members of the United States Senate to review materials that would be inappropriate for public release. I don't think one of us is suggesting that. Um, uh, there are means by which we can review things in a classified environment and treat them as classified. We've done that with, uh, with, with significant success in this hearing. Secondly, to the extent that wouldn't provide the level of comfort necessary, we'd also be happy to review them on a redacted basis. Um, the, the, these are things that have become relevant in our conversations. We want to make sure that we, we have the facts. But not one of us wants to endanger anyone or to, to uh, render public information uh, that is sensitive in nature. But there, there are abundant ways around that. I would suggest that the information contained in these reports is dangerous, dangerous to the victims and to the innocent people who are mentioned in these reports and unnecessary at this point. It's never been requested by this committee and it's merely a fishing ex expedition in dangerous territory. Classified settings, redacted versions of the reports, this has never happened in the history of this committee. And I would say, Senator, Senator, I, I will just tell you, I am not going to be party to turning over this information and endangering the life of an innocent person for a political quest to find more information. We have exhausted this topic. And we've gone to it over and over again. And I think that this is a bridge too far for this committee. That's my personal feeling. I take it the Senator Leahy may agree with me in that regard. Uh, this uh, nominee has been before this committee for 18 hours. I don't believe that uh, this information is going to change anyone's vote. Uh, you can decide in your caucus what you want to do to go forward. I've told you my position. I want to proceed if I can. I thank the, Senator, the nominee for waiting for this colloquy, and I turn it over to Senator Cotton. Judge, I want to return to the question of crime and specifically sentencing. In any of the cases where you've sentenced an offender below the guidelines, has that offender gone on to commit another crime after getting released from prison? Thank you, Senator. Um, when judges sentence, they um, often impose terms of supervised release. And there are times in which when a person is on supervised release, they reoffend. There are also times when um, when they don't, but even after the period after the period of supervised release, the court doesn't continue to have any way of uh, tracking or knowing what happens um, because if they were to reoffend, it wouldn't necessarily come back to the same court or the same judge. So you, you don't have a factual basis to know whether or not anyone you've sentenced below the guidelines has reoffended in the future. I ha I, do I have a factual basis? I know that there are um, people who have reoffended while on supervised release. I can't uh, remember whether any of them were guideline sentences, below guidelines, or above guideline sentences. Okay. Um, I, I know you've answered a lot of questions the last two days about sentences and sex crimes. I just want to be exact about this. In these cases, have you ever sentenced an offender above the guidelines recommendation? Um, I'd have to take a look at, I know that I have sentenced uh, offenders to the guidelines if in the category of sex crimes in general. I know that I've given 30 year sentences for um, at least one offender, almost 30 years, 29.5. I've given, um, I believe a 12 year sentence for someone at the agreement of all of the parties, um, which was um, a sentence that uh, was uh, 
a part of his plea agreement. Um, I'm not remembering the others. I understand. You've seen it's in a lot of cases. I, I want to return briefly to the Hawkins case. Wesley Hawkins, as a reminder, was convicted of child, a child pornography offense in 2013. The sentencing guidelines for this offense called for a sentence of 97 to 121 months or 8 to 10 years. The prosecutors asked for 24 months. You sentenced him to three months. We've heard a lot about this case and your three-month sentence of Wesley Hawkins, but you got another crack at him in 2019, Judge. In 2019, you sent Wesley Hawkins back under conditions of confinement with the Bureau of Prisons for six months with additional restrictions on his computer usage. That's twice the amount of time in custody that you sentenced him to in 2013. What did Wesley Hawkins do in 2019, Judge? Oh, I don't remember, Senator. I have a lot of defendants who I've sentenced who are on supervision, who violate conditions of supervision. Um, if in our system, um, someone like Mr. Hawkins, especially given the crime, the egregious crime that he committed, was likely on a very long period of supervision. And during that time, he um, would likely be um, under computer restrictions for 10, 20 years or something where he's not allowed to do certain things with a computer. And a s probation officer is monitoring. They put software on the computers of uh, individuals who, are, um, um, who have these kinds of conditions imposed um, and that restricts their ability to access certain information on the internet. And Good. so uh, it's not uncommon for a probation officer to um, report violations of supervised release, not just in this area, but across all crimes. And then the court um, has to determine how to handle that. And you could, in fact, send someone back to jail for violating conditions of supervised release that are not themselves criminal behavior. It's just, you know, the court says in their supervision order, um, I'm imposing a 20 year or whatever it is, a sentence of supervision. And during this time, you're not allowed to access your computer, et cetera, et cetera. So if he were to do that, it wouldn't be additional criminal behavior, but it would be a violation of my order. And when he comes back, to the court on violation, the court has um, factors that we look at to determine whether or not to treat that uh, essentially as uh, the kind of violation that would require him to go back to jail. Okay. Judge, yesterday we had an extended conversation of your sentencing of a man named Keith Hodges, a fentanyl kingpin. That sentencing occurred in 2018. You had very detailed recall of that sentence. To my knowledge, that's the only time anyone's asked you about Mr. Hodges' sentence. You've been asked repeatedly over the last two days about the Hawkins case. It's been in the news, as Senator Durbin decided, for days on end. This sentencing happened in, resentencing happened in 2019, and, and now you're saying you don't have any recollection of it. Let me see if I can refresh your recollection. This is the order you sign, Judge, on April 17th, 2019, in USA v. Hawkins. And it says that you concur with the recommendation of the probation office to return him to residential reentry facility for 180 days and to engage in various kinds of commu computer monitoring and computer, computer monitoring and search. There's your signature over there, Judge. You really, yes. don't, you really don't remember? What? Senator, that is a very, very common thing that judges do. I've sentenced over 100 people, and supervised release, which is the kind of post-incarceration uh, condition that judges ordinarily impose, is something that's done on a standard form, which is what that I, is. I understand you've done a lot, Judge, and but no, none of them have been the centerpiece of your hearing for the last two days. Do you really, do you really expect this committee to believe that you don't remember what happened in this Hawkins case when it came back before you? Yes, As Senator, Senator I, I do expect you to believe that's my testimony. Well, I, I don't find it credible, Judge. It's been in the news for days. Senator Durbin has cited it being in the news for days. You've been asked about it probably more than any other case you've ever had. 
and I, I just don't find it credible that you weren't prepared for that matter in 2019. You know what I think? I, I think he got caught with child pornography again, and he wouldn't have if he had been in prison for the eight to 10 years the guidelines called for in 2013 when you first sentenced him. Let's turn, though, to your work for detainees at Guantanamo Bay. First off, let me just ask, do you think most detainees at Guantanamo Bay were, were mostly terrorists or mostly, I don't know, innocent goat farmers? Senator, it's impossible for me to answer that question. The people at Guantanamo Bay had been um, accused by the government of engaging in terrorist activities and therefore classified um, by the executive branch as um, enemy combatants. Okay. Do you think it would America would be safer or less safe if we released all the detainees at Guantanamo Bay? S Senator, I'm I'm trying to figure out how to answer that question. Um, 9-11 was a terrible attack on our country, and the executive branch, pursuant to authority that the Supreme Court said it had, designated people as enemy combatants and um, sent them to Guantanamo Bay. The Supreme Court also said that anybody who was so detained could seek review of their detention, and as a federal public defender, my uh, role and responsibility um, was to um, make arguments in defense of the Constitution and in service to the court that was trying to assess, based on the authority given to it by the Supreme Court, whether or not people were adequately classified, what the legal circumstances were, how these habeas petitions were going to be processed. This was a, a series of um, a series of legal challenges in a novel environment that federal public defenders and lawyers across the country were engaged in helping the court to evaluate so that we can understand what the Constitution required in this time of emergency. Okay, so, so no opinion on whether America would be safer or less safe if we released all the detainees from Guantanamo Bay? Senator, okay. America would be less safe if we don't have terrorists out running around attacking this country, absolutely. America would also be um, more safe in a situation in which all of our constitutional rights are protected. This is the way our scheme works. This is how the Constitution that we all love um, operates. It's, it's about making sure that the government is doing what it's supposed to do in a time of crisis. As Justice Gorsuch said, the Constitution is not suspended in times of crisis. The government still has to follow the rules, and so Criminal defense lawyers make sure that in times of crisis, the government is following the rules. Okay. Let's turn to the actual cases. Um, how many of these terrorists at Guantanamo Bay did you represent? When I was a defender, um, four cases were assigned to me in our office. I don't know how many cases came into the office in total, but... Um, but you personally had four. I was assigned to them along with another defender who worked on the same cases. She was more senior. She did a lot of, she did all of the sort of fact uh, gathering related to the cases. And as an appellate defender, I worked on the legal arguments. Okay. Did you ever represent uh, any of the detainees at Guantanamo Bay when you were not a public defender? One of the people who I'd represented while I was in uh, a federal defender, his case got spun off and taken up by lo a law firm. Law firms around the country were also engaged in this work. I'm well at aware the time. of what law firms were doing at the time. Yes. And I left the federal public defender's office. I joined a law firm 
And the one of the people that I had represented was now at that law firm. They had him as a client. That's Mr. They, Al Salwam. Al Katani. Al Katani was the one. Was the one who just the, coincidentally, both he and you went to Morrison and Forrester. Yes, Senator. Okay. What about Mr. Al Salwam? I don't know what happened to Mr. Al Salwam. You were listed as counsel for two years during your time at Morrison and Forrester. What happens is when you leave, um, when you leave from any place, firms or government service, um, you have to let the court know or their records, their records reflect where you are in the system and not so much the case in terms of your address. So, in, so to go back to Mr. al yes. you, he so he just coincidentally, it's a small world, went to Morrison and Forrester at the same time you did, and then you represented him, and you did file multiple motions on his behalf. So I don't know if it was at the same time. I'm not sure. But you did file multiple motions for him I in 2008 and 2009. I don't recall whether it was multiple, but he was still at the habeas stage of the process. Um, and I don't know when he came because the partners who picked up the case were in Los Angeles. I was in Washington, D.C. They contacted me to say, oh, we see on the docket that you had previously represented him and now you're with our firm. Will you assist us um, with um, looking at these briefs, working on these briefs? There were many lawyers who were working on uh, the filings that you're talking about. After you left the public defender's office, did, did you continue in your representation of any other client you had had at the public defender's office? Um, I didn't continue my representation of any client. I left the federal public defender's office and then picked up Mr. al um through the circumstances that I talked I, about, and there were no other clients that um, I represented in that way. I, I have to say, that sounds like continuation. You represented him at the public defender's office, and then you represented him in private practice as well. And you're telling us that's the only person you represented at both the public defender's office and in private practice? Um, yes. So you didn't continue to provide any kind of pro bono work for murderers or rapists or anyone else, but you did continue to represent this terrorist at Guantanamo Bay? When I got to the firm and they told me that the case was there and they recognized that I was at the firm and had previously worked on the case, and by they I mean the partners in the firm, they asked me, um, as a member of the Supreme Court and appellate group of the firm, which is where what was my practice, if I would help review and work on some of the briefing that they were submitting um, on his behalf, given my familiarity with the case. Were you representing him pro bono at Morrison and Forrester? The firm represents. The firm takes on pro bono representations, which means. Um, that the person isn't paying and let's turn to your amicus briefs uh, you had two briefs in Guantanamo cases one for a think tank one on behalf of a group of former judges uh, I think as anyone who's done amicus work, work knows sometimes the client seek out the lawyer sometimes the lawyer seek out the client um, for either of those amicus briefs were you involved in any way in seeking or recruiting those clients or suggesting the idea for an amicus brief in the first place no senator were both of those briefs done on a pro bono basis? Um, yes, because the Supreme Court and appellate group in a, a law firm um, has paid clients and also has pro bono clients. And the briefs that I worked on um, were on the one brief was 20 former federal judges who wanted to make an argument in the Boumidian case that was in the Supreme Court. And one of them um, was a partner at my law firm. She was a former federal judge whose idea it was, and she knew the other judges and wanted our group to work on the brief. The other um, was um, not just one think tank. It was the Cato Institute, the Rutherford Institute, and uh, the Constitution Project, an ideologically diverse group of nonprofits who wanted to make uh, arguments in another case that the Supreme Court had taken up related to these issues, because all of this was novel, 
and a lot of issues were being evaluated by the Supreme Court regarding the scope of executive authority during this time of crisis. Okay, so you, you've done pro bono work for, on behalf of detainees at Guantanamo Bay. Have you ever done pro bono work for the victims of terrorism? Senator, I'm not a, aware of any such cases in, um, in my law firm. I was in a group of lawyers um, that was often approached to ask, would you file a brief for some group, and I'm not aware that any victims of terrorism uh, asked our firm to participate. Okay. So we've talked a lot about the people you represent. Let's talk a little bit about the defendants in those cases and how you characterize them. Uh, I'll remind you that those were the president, the secretary of defense, and active duty army officers. Senator Graham and Senator Cornyn said that you called them war criminals. You disputed that, and Senator Durbin has repeatedly denied it as well. Uh, and, and I'll concede you didn't use those exact words. You didn't say war criminals. But you did say in multiple court filings that they committed acts that constitute war crimes. I'm sorry, but I got to confess, I don't un understand the difference between saying someone is a war criminal and saying they've committed acts that constitute war crimes. So can you explain that difference to me? Yes, I will. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, so when you file a habeas petition under our law, um, you can't file it um, against the United States because of, of sovereign immunity, the way our law works, you have to file it against individual officers in their official capacity. That's the way in which you're able to file a habeas petition. So whoever is the executive at the time becomes the named party in the brief. And a habeas petition is like a complaint in a, in a civil case. It's making allegations um, to begin the litigation about the person's detention. But you, you, judge, official capacity, personal capacity, all that is just a bunch of procedural gobbledygook. These are the people that you said committed acts that constitute war crimes. With respect, what is, Senator. I just don't understand the difference between calling someone a war criminal and saying they committed acts that constitute war crimes. With respect, Senator, they were not sued in their individual capacity. We weren't making allegations about those individuals. And in fact, over the course of the case, the names changed. So later on, the habeas petition became against President Obama because he then became the executive for the purpose of the habeas petition. I'm so well aware the name wasn't changed. It probably changed from Bob Gates or from Don Rumsfeld to Bob Gates as well. But they were not the ones in office. They were not the ones who were overseeing the government when you filed these suits and you said they committed acts that constitute war crimes. I just don't, I don't understand how you expect this committee to believe that there's a difference between saying someone's a war criminal and saying they committed war crimes. Thank you for the opportunity to explain, Senator. One of the allegations that um, had been publicly reported with respect to the group of people who were in Guantanamo Bay was an allegation concerning the use of torture. And when you make that allegation, you bring it under laws that themselves constitute um, cr the crimes of war. That's the way in which the law works. So if, you, if, you were in a, if you're writing a habeas petition and you say, um, upon information and belief, Mr. al Qatani was tortured, that allegation is made under a law that says that there was a war crime that occurred as a result of that torture and anyone, and you're making that allegation against the United States, but because you can't sue the United States, the actual petition is named in the name of whoever's leading the United States at the time. So later in this, the course of this, it moved from President Bush, Donald Rumsfeld to President Obama. It didn't, it, it's not about the individual. It's about the allegation that um, that Mr. al Qatani, upon information and belief, had been tortured um, in the lead up to his detention. I don't know, Judge. Sounds like a debate about how many terrorists can dance on the head of a pen to me. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Cotton. Uh, ask unanimous consent to enter a letter in the record from nine former national security officials. Uh, defending Judge Jackson's Guantanamo representation. The signatories include former Attorney General Loretta Lynch, 
Department of Homeland Security Secretary Jay Johnson and the former Judge Advocate General of the United States Navy, Senator Booker. Uh, thank you very much. Judge, after me, only five to go. <laughs> <laughs> but sit back for a second because uh, I don't have questions right away. I actually have a number of things I, I just want to say because this has been uh, not a surprise given the history that we all know, not a surprise, but uh, perhaps a little bit of a disappointment, uh, some of the things that have been said in, in this hearing. Uh, the way you have dealt with some of these things, um, that's why you are a judge and I am a politician, because you have sat with grit and grace and have shown us just extraordinary uh, demeanor uh, during the times where people were saying things to you that are actually out of the norm. I had to go up dais uh, to ask some of my more senior colleagues about the, what I feel like is a dangerous precedent. People are taking a, a thousand cases you've been o over. Is that right? I'm sorry. I said you wouldn't ask you questions, but just give me a... Some, something like that. Something like that. And from what I understand is that these cases are often takes, take days, weeks, sometimes months, right? To, to, to decide to in a case? Yeah, yeah. Yes. There's a trial sometimes. And the, folks are taking any of those cases and just trying to pick pieces out. And so uh, my, my colleague, Senator Hawley, has been doing this all into the lead up and saying things, tweeting things that I think that a lot of us, when I was just trying to get some advice here, is this is what the new standard is going to be. That any judge coming before us that has ever chosen outside of the sentencing guidelines, below the sentencing guidelines, we're creating this environment now where I could make myself the hero of people who have been victims of some horrible crime and suddenly put whatever judge I want on the defensive by trying to drag out little bits when they have no context to the case. None of the facts. They're seeking to exploit the complexities of a criminal justice system, the reason why we have a third branch of government. I, I feel bad that there was a judge mentioned by name in this hearing that's uh, uh, from Senator Hawley's state. What is that judge going to think next time they, they have a complicated sexual abuse case that comes before them and they know that they could possibly be called out if they go below the sentencing guidelines, which I showed you yesterday in my lack of chart. If you remember, I was uncharted. <laughs> um, but that you are deciding completely in the norm. 70 plus percent in many states of people are doing just like you did. But I'm a, I'm a Democratic senator. I, 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 I've never quoted from this very well-respected conservative a periodical. This is the National Review. Very well-respected. They're not, not necessarily something I agree with all the time. But here's what the National uh, Review, this is the title. Senator Hawley's disingenuous attack against Judge Jackson's record on child pornography. I'll just read the first paragraph. I would oppose... Judge Katan uh, Katanji Brown Jackson because of her judicial philosophy for the reasons I outlined last week. I addressed that in a separate post. For now, I want to dis discuss the claim by Senator Josh Hawley that Judge Jackson is appallingly soft on child pornography offenders. This is the kicker here. The allegations appear meritless to the point of demagoguery. I, I got letters from leaders of victims' rights groups, survivors of assault, all saying sort of the same thing with the National Review. Feel proud about yourself. You brought together right and left in this, in this, in this calling out of people that will sit up here and try to pull out from cases and try to put themselves in a position where they're the defenders of our children to a person who has children, to a person whose family goes out in streets and defends children. I, I mean, this is a, a new, new low. And what's especially surprising about this is it didn't happen last year. You were put on a court that I'm told is the, considered like the second most powerful court in our land. And you were passed with bipartisan support. 
Nobody brought it up then. Did they not do their homework? Were they lax? Did they make a mistake? I wonder, as they ask you the question, do you regret? I wonder if they regret that, that they didn't bring that out. No, why? Because it was an allegation that is meritless to the point of demagoguery. You are, I don't mean this in any way, because if anybody called me average, I would, I would be upset, but you are a, a mainstream judge. Your sentencing, I've looked at the data, falls in the mainstream on everything from child sexual assault to all the other issues that people are trying to bring up. Some of these things are being cast at you that you called George Bush a war criminal. Come on, that is painful. Especially because, as you said, the brief change, these are names that you have to put in. And we we're talking about a real issue that goes to the core of our values, torture. Barack Obama was named once, he, once Bush left office. There is an absurdity to this that is, it, it is almost comical if it was not so dangerous. Because the next time a judge comes before us on the right or the left that has a body of work like you do, gosh, one of the, uh, some performance artists on our side could pull out one of the cases where they were below the sentencing guidelines, say for example, it was on something like as horrific as rape that we all agree is horrific, and they can suddenly put themselves as the defense. How dare we put someone who's soft on crime? Well, are you soft on crime? God bless America. I got this great text. I've become really good friends with the, the folks at the FOP for my negotiations. And this was my favorite text. You all got to get this. I think my brother Kennedy might get a kick out of this. He goes, things that are uncountable, stars in the sky, grains of sand on the beach, and the number of times Democrats will mention that the FOP endorsed Judge Jackson in this hearing. <laughs> but let me mention it again. <laughs> Just in case my people say you're rough on crime, folks, really want to try to make that stick. You were endorsed by the largest organization of rank and file belief officers. You were endorsed by the bosses, the largest organization of chiefs of police. And, and you were endorsed by Noble, who I hope people find out more about that organization. You got uncles that are officers. You got a brother, not just an officer, who went to serve after 9-11. Your family's not soft on terrorism. He went out there to capture and kill and defend this country from terrorists. I, I, I actually sit back here and finding this astonishing, but then I, I do my homework. I love that my colleague brought up Constance Baker Motley. You know, when, when, when she was getting to the floor of the Senate, they were trying to stop her with outrageous accusations. You know what the accusation was back then? She was a communist. Dragging up stories, trying to throw anything that they might stick. But this is what you and I know. Any one of us senators could yell as loud as we want that Venus can't return a serve. We could yell as loud as we want that Beyonce can't sing. We could yell as much as we want that astronaut Mae Jamison didn't go all that high. But you know what? <laughs> they got nothing to prove. As it says in the Bible, let the work I've done speak for me. Well, you have spoken. You started speaking as a little girl, watching that man right there try to raise a family and study law while your mama supported everybody. You spoke in high school when you started distinguishing yourself. And you know what you said when they told you you couldn't go to Harvard? Watch me. I went to law school. I didn't serve on the law review. You did. I didn't clerk at every level of the federal court, you clerked for a Supreme Court justice, one widely respected on both sides, which really shaped you. You left there and, and, and you went to private practice and you know what you found? This is what you told me, that you had those tough choices that working moms have to make, the demands of a private law firm, raising your kids, it, it just didn't add up. You went before the Senate three times in a bipartisan manner. God bless America. We don't do that much stuff bipartisan around here. 
You went to became a public defender because you wanted to understand all aspects of the law. Who does that? We live in a society that's very materialistic sometimes, very, very consumeristic. You went into, do people become public defenders for the money? No. Your family and you speak to service, service, service. And I'm telling you right now, I'm not letting anybody in the Senate steal my joy. <laughs> I told you this at the beginning. I, I have, I, I'm embarrassed. It happened earlier today. I just look at you and I, I start getting full of emotion. I'm jogging this morning and I'm at the end of the block I live on. And I get terrible, because I put my music on loud when I'm jogging, <laughs> trying to block out the noise of the, of the heart attack I'm having. <laughs> And this woman comes up on me, Matt practically tackles me, an African-American woman. And the look on her eyes, she just wanted to touch me, because I think because I'm sitting so close to you, <laughs> and tell me what it meant to her to watch you sitting where you're sitting. And you did not get there because of some left-wing agenda. You didn't get here because of some dark money groups. You got here how every black woman in America who's gotten anywhere has done by being <laughs> like Ginger Rogers said, I did everything Fred Astaire did, but backwards in heels. <laughs> and, and so I, I'm just sitting here saying nobody's stealing my joy. Nobody's going to make me angry, especially not people that are called in a conservative magazine demagogic for what they're bringing up that just doesn't hold water. I'm not going to let my joy be stolen because I know you and I, we appreciate something that we get that a lot of my colleagues don't. I know Tim Scott does. When I first came to this place, I was the fourth black person ever popularly elected to the United States Senate. And I still remember a lot of mixed people, white folks, black folks work here, but at night when people are in line to come in to clean this place, the, the, the percentage of minorities shift a lot. And so I'm walking here, first week I'm here, and somebody who's been here for decades doing the urgent work of the Senate, but it's the unglamorous work that goes on no matter who's in offices. The guy comes up to me, all he wants to say, I can tell is, I'm so happy you're here. But he comes up and he can't get the words out. And this man, my elder, starts crying. And I, I just hugged him, and he just kept telling me, it is so good to see you here. It's so good to see you here. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I, I love my brother, Tim Scott. We could write a dissertation on our disagreements. He gave the best speech on race. I wish I could have given as good of a speech. But talking to the challenges and indignities that are still faced. And you're here. I was in the White House with my Democratic colleagues, and... I'm, again, I'm in my joy. I can't help it. <laughs> and, and, and the president's asking our advice, who should we nominate and whatever. And I look at Kamala and we have a knowing glance, which we've had for years when she and I used to sit on this end of this committee at times. And then I try to get out to the president what it means. What it means. And I want to tell you, when I look at you, this is why I get emotional. I'm sorry, you're, you're, you're a person that is so much more than your race and gender. You're a Christian, you're a mom, you're, you're, you're an intellect, you love books. But for me, I'm sorry, I, I, it's hard for me not to look at you and not see my mom, not to see my, my cousins, one of them who had to come here and sit behind you. She had to, be, she had to have your back. I see my ancestors and yours. Nobody's going to steal the joy of that woman in the street or the calls that I'm getting or the texts. Nobody's going to steal that joy. You have earned this spot. You are worthy. You are a great American. Your hero is Constance Baker Motley. Mine, she has sat on my desk for my offices that I've held. She's my icon of America. Her name is Harriet Tubman. There is a love in this country that is extraordinary. You admitted it about your parents. 
They loved this nation, even though there were laws preventing them from getting together. When they were loving, there were laws in this country that would have prevented you from marrying your husband. It wasn't that long ago. It was last generation. But they didn't stop loving this country, even though this country didn't love them back. And what were the words of your heroes in mind? What did Constance Baker Motley do? Did she, this country that she saw insults and injuries, when she came out of law school, law firms wouldn't even hire her because she was a woman. Did she become bitter? Did she try to create a revolution? No, she used the very constitution of this nation. She loved it so much, she wanted America to be America. As Langston Hughes wrote, oh, let America be America again the land that never has been yet, but yet must be the land where everyone is free. Oh, yes, I say it plain, America never was America to me, but I swear this oath, America will be. That is the story of how you got to this desk, you and I and everyone here, generations of folk who came here and said, America, I'm Irish, you may say, no, Irish or dogs need to ply, but I'm going to show this country that I can be free here. I can make this country love me as much as I love it. Chinese Americans first forced into mere slave labor, building our railroads, connecting our country, saw the ugliest of America, but they were going to build their home here and say, America, you may not love me yet, but I'm going to make this nation live up to its promise and hope. LGBTQ Americans from Stonewall women to Seneca. Hidden figures who didn't even get their play until some Hollywood movie finally talked about them and how they were critical for us defying gravity. All of these people loved America. And so you faced insults here that were shocking to me. Well, actually not shocking. But you are here because of that kind of love. And nobody's taken this away from me. So you got five more folk to go through, (laughs) five more of us. And then you can sit back and let us have all the debates. And I'm gonna tell you, it's gonna be a well-charted Senate floor because it's not gonna stop. They're gonna accuse you of this and that. Heck, in honor of your person who shares your birthday, you might be called a communist. But don't worry, my sister, don't worry. God has got you. And how do I know that? Because you're here. And I know what it's taken for you to sit in that seat. Harriet Tubman is one of my heroes because the more I read about this person, the more, I mean, she was viciously beaten. Her whole life, she used to fall into spells, cracked skull. She faced starvation, chased by dogs. And when she got to freedom, what did she do? Did she rest? No, she went back. Again and again and again. The star was, the sky was full of stars. But she found one that was a harbinger of hope. For better days, not just for her and those people that were enslaved, but a a harbinger of hope for this country. And she never gave up on America. She fought in the, led troops in the Civil War. She was involved in the suffrage movement. And as I came back from my run, after being mere assaulted by by someone on the street, I thought about her and how she looked up. She kept looking up. No matter what they did to her, she never stopped looking up. And that star, it was a harbinger of hope. Today, you're my star. You are my harbinger of hope. This country is getting better and better and better. And when that final vote happens, and you ascend onto the, onto the highest court in the land, I'm going to rejoice. And I'm going to tell you right now, the greatest country in the world, the United States of America, 
will be better because of you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Senator Booker. We're going to take a 10-minute break Thank you. and come back and have the last five senators ask their questions. <laughs>